Okay, council, please come to order. Great to see everybody in person. It's been a, a long couple of years, but uh, fantastic to, to see everybody. Before we get going on the agenda, uh, we've got a new face at the table. I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. John Kerland and invite him to say a couple of words. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks to so many of you council members and, and broader council family alike for extending a warm welcome to me in my new role as NIMS Regional Administrator. I very much appreciate that. Um, and, and by virtue of that position, being a member of this council. Um, I, I was thinking about this and I realized that I first addressed this council in 1999 under Chairman Lauber. Um, at the time I was the, the National Essential Fish Habitat Coordinator for the agency and uh, had come out to Anchorage for a meeting. Um, since moving to Alaska in 2002, I've worked with the council in a number of capacities. Uh, was a voting member of the Essential Fish Habitat Committee, a voting member of the Ecosystem Committee for, for quite a while. Um, and I've worked with the council on an agenda dependent basis on a variety of things on uh, EFH protection measures, considering habitat areas of particular concern, stellar sea lion protection measures, and updating the council periodically on, on various uh, habitat and, and marine mammal issues. And I'm looking forward to interacting with you all uh, more regularly on the full range of issues going forward. Um, the day after my appointment was announced publicly, which is 13 days ago, uh, it's, it's been a short period of time, uh, I held an all hands with Alaska region staff. And uh, I noted that the things that attracted me to this opportunity were probably a lot of the same things that attracted them to, to their roles with NIPS Alaska region. Uh, we are fortunate in Alaska, of course, to have a legacy of well-run fisheries and sustainable approaches. Um, we have nationally and globally significant marine mammal populations and habitats, uh, an incredibly smart and engaged group of stakeholders that are involved in our process and, and helping with management, uh, a rich culture of Alaska native traditions and, and subsistence use, and just a vitally important mission to uh, support the sustainability of Alaska's marine resources. Um, and on top of all that, of course, an amazing team of people helping us with it. Um, and that includes people working at the Alaska region, at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, council staff, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and, and many others. Um, so I feel very privileged to be in the role that I'm in and, and be involved in this process. Um, and uh, to share with you all the incredible responsibility of ensuring sustainable fisheries in the North Pacific. Uh, you know, all of that said, um, we are facing um, some real challenges. And uh, foremost is the emerging need to be more adaptive in response to climate change. Um, we're facing shifting distributions of, of target stocks, of course, and uh, fluctuations in abundance. We've seen that with Pacific cod. We see it now with crabs. Uh, changes in other components of the ecosystem, um, and the urgency of being more inclusive and uh, accessible for Alaska Native communities and others who aren't as well represented around the table, and uh, also continuing challenges associated with bycatch. Um, so uh, the council's been a leader in ecosystem approaches and dealing with all these kinds of issues for a long time, and um, we will, of course, continue to, to need to be adapting and, and being creative in uh, finding solutions to those kinds of issues. But um, I believe we're up for it, and, and uh, I look forward to working with you all to try to find workable solutions as we move forward. Um, in closing, I, I just want to say I really look forward to working with everybody in the council process. Uh, I'm fortunate to be backed up by an incredible group of people with the Alaska region and uh, the Science Center, the Office of Law Enforcement, and NOAA General Counsel, and uh, together we're here to help uh, carry out NOAA Fisheries responsibilities under law and help the council uh, carry out your responsibilities under the law. And uh, finally, if I may, on a different subject, I just want to mention briefly that uh, Janet Coit, the Assistant Administrator of NOAA for Fisheries, and Sam Rauch, her deputy for regulatory programs, are both uh, keenly interested in Alaska issues and wanting to visit this June and are hoping to come to the June council meeting in Sitka. 
so we're still trying to work out logistics, of course, and look forward to talking with you, Mr. Chairman and Council staff to work out uh, what works best for the schedule there. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kerlin. Congratulations and welcome to the Council. Thank you. Okay. Um, so that will bring us to uh, approval of the agenda. Is there any uh, objections to the agenda as presented? If not, thank you. That will bring us right into our uh, B reports. Mr. Witherall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's great to be back and see everybody in person. Uh, this is a hybrid meeting. It's our first one. And what that means is we're going to have the ability for uh, our members to participate remotely as well as in person. It means that the people testifying, you'll hear testifiers in person and remotely. And this is also our first entirely paperless in-person meeting where uh, testifiers will be signing up uh, using our e-agenda portal. And we have uh, iPads scattered around the rooms for those people that wanna sign up and don't have uh, a computer with them. So we've got a, we're implementing a new suite of procedures here, uh, including our sound system that we've never had to run before. And so I expect that we will have some glitches and possible delays. And so I'd ask everybody to be a little patient uh, if we need to stand down on at times. We have a few other changes I'd like to review. Uh, obviously we have some COVID precautions for in-person meeting attendees and we're encouraging folks to wear masks and to uh, not come to the meeting and attend remotely uh, if you feel sick. And you'll note that we have uh, quite a bit of space in between all our chairs and in the meeting room as well. I've got a handout on the hybrid, uh, on the protocols uh, for COVID under the agenda A item. And you'll note that uh, we have the press to talk microphones like some of you have used in the advisory panel uh, previously. Uh, and so that's new. Remember to turn your microphone on and off. We're going to be using Zoom rather than Adobe Connect for uh, the remote participants and the public. And so people will be able to see the presentations, but we won't have uh, any YouTube uh, recording of the meeting. Instead, uh, those audio files will be available and posted after the meeting. When we take public comment, we're going to try to take it in order of sign up, and that may be such that we have back and forth between an in-person testifier and one testifying remotely. It's, I think it's been working in the advisory panel, so uh, we should, shouldn't, I don't expect any trouble here, but if we find that we can't administer that, we will go back and figure out a different solution where we group perhaps in-person testifiers uh, together and then take the remote folks. Uh, I know that, uh, that unlike other in-person meetings, uh, I haven't planned for catered lunches. If, if it doesn't work out the way I've planned it, then we could obviously bring catered lunches in. But uh, I, Diana was going to send an email to everybody with some lunch instructions some, uh, on the various list of restaurants that are open and options if you want it delivered or if you want to order ahead and then go pick it up a sandwich at Oregon Greens, which is what I intend to do. Or if you uh, email uh, Shannon uh, looking at the Bruins menu for the restaurant downstairs, uh, if you email that to her before the break, what you would like, she can go place an order and, and bring that up to you. So you have it right at the break if you intend to meet with stakeholders in the room or just eat at your desk here. So some options and we can help you, staff can help you with that. Uh, you did introduce uh, Mr. Kerland. Congratulations, John, on being the new regional administrator. And I know our staff looks forward to working with you. Uh, there's also a new regional director for US Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Ms. Sarah Boario. And uh, I know Pete Fassbender is uh, attending online today. And uh, if he comes in in person at all, uh, maybe he, maybe, uh, Ms. Barrio can attend as well. Uh, and when we get to that uh, US Fish and Wildlife Ser Service report, uh, Mr. Fassbender can introduce her at that time as well. Next on the list, I, I just note that uh, Mr. Uh, Mesero was honored by the International Game Fish Association. 
and he was bestowed with the prestigious Tommy Gifford Award that's given in recognition to uh, extraordinary contributions to the advancement of sport fishing. So congratulations, Mr. Mesro. Uh, I thank you for sending me the picture of you getting the award and I'm sure you had a good time down in Florida for a couple of days. So congratulations. Uh, another uh, note is that uh, Dr. Stram, Diana Stram on staff has been selected to be a Fulbright specialist at the Ministry of Fisheries in Madagascar. And she's gonna be assisting them uh, with uh, their ecosystem-based management approach and sustainable fisheries. And so she's gonna bring her experience here with the council and bring it to Madagascar and probably report back and help uh, her develop some education materials and outreach materials for us after that experience. So looking forward to that, but she'll be gone all of May and we'll be back uh, in time for the June uh, meeting. So congratulations to Diana for being selected for the Fulbright spe specialist. Uh, next item is uh, just that council members participated in the virtual two-day council awareness training uh, hosted by First Alaskan Institutes in March. Uh, this is the, you received the same training that the staff did. And this provided the council members with a better understanding of Alaska native perspectives and the diversity of those perspectives and some challenges facing Alaska native tribes and their members uh, when they engage in the council process. And I'm gonna stop here because uh, I suspect that some council members may have a comment on the training or provide me with feedback. If, Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thanks, Mr. Witherall, for a good summary of that. Um, I just want to take the opportunity first to just publicly thank the First Alaskans Institute for the work they put into um, putting together the training session. Obviously, a lot of work went into it. Uh, it flowed very smoothly, naturally. And even though we covered some really tough subjects, um, they managed to maintain an environment where we felt um, that we could discuss those subjects openly, um, but sort of not comfortably because they weren't comfortable subjects, but um, we could discuss them without sort of trepidation of, of treading on delicate issues. And uh, I, I found that really constructive. I'm still thinking about and I'm hoping that the council will discuss um, where we go next with that training that we got and with the knowledge that we got. I, don't believe that it should have simply been a training that we checked the box on and moved on. I think it's gotta be a training that uh, helps us build the foundation for uh, making sure that our process is uh, open to all. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Well said. Mr. Witherell. Thank you, moving on. Uh, I wanted to bring to your attention that a month ago, the Tanana Chief Conference held a Yukon Salmon Summit in Fairbanks, Alaska, and it focused on indigenous knowledge and tribal government to support ecosystem stewardship from the ocean to headwaters. And on the third day of the meeting, uh, they opened it up to agency staff and other partners, and Mr. Twight attended in person while uh, Dr. Stram and Dr. Hoppala uh, attended virtually. I've included the list of tribal priorities and concerns that were shared and developed, developed by participants in the summit uh, in the first two days and uh, released, and that's attached for you. So as I mentioned, the third day of the summit provide an opportunity for the tribal community members uh, from across the Yukon River to dialogue with agency staff. And I'm not gonna say anything further, but I suspect Mr. Twight may have some comments on his experience at the summit. If, if you'd like to, Mr. Twight. Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Witherell. Um, I, I was, I, I felt honored to be able to attend um, and uh, appreciated the opportunity to be able to be there in person. I think that was really appreciated. Um, um, Commissioner um, Vincent Lang from Department of Fish and Game was able to attend remotely uh, and, and also provide some, I think, really thoughtful input as was Mr. Martin from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I believe there might've been other Fish and Wildlife Service on staff on as well. And uh, I know that uh, NIMS staff are also monitoring and participating. Um, but it was, I think, useful to be there in person. Uh, and uh, um, uh, again, as with the, um, the training from 
First Alaskans Institute. Um, I, I hope that we can regard uh, this as uh, an opportunity to pick up again on uh, an activity that unfortunately, largely due to the pandemic, we weren't able to follow through with last summer. And that was the invitation, accepting the invitation from Tanana chiefs and from um, Yukon River uh, Fishery Development Association to uh, um, actually see what um, fish camp looks like uh, from their perspective to visit them in some of their villages in the upper Yukon. Um, and while we may not want to actually reduplicate that exact opportunity, I think the opportunity for us as a council to meet um, people living the subsistence lifestyle in the interior of Alaska who are affected by what we do as well as affected by the changes in the in the Bering Sea ecosystem that we're also affected by, the opportunity to meet them in their villages on their terms and uh, see um, the changes they're experiencing through their eyes as well as ours, I think would be invaluable for us. And I'm hopeful that some of the conversations that I had was able to have with some of the tribal elders, um, some of the fishery leaders, and some of the members of those two organizations at the workshop will lead to another opportunity for that kind of in-person dialogue, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. I know staff have been continuing to explore that, those possibilities uh, as a follow-up. And uh, I'm hopeful that we'll hear more from them when they have more to offer on, on that. But again, I, I'd like to view both of these as, a, um, as an opportunity for us to just um, really provide a, um, a, a better environment for us to discuss these difficult issues with um, Alaska Native communities and leaders. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Mr. Witherall. Uh, on March 14th, the executive committee uh, met with the AP and SSC leadership to discuss the reflections on the council process paper that uh, the staff produced and presented to you in February. And I've attached a summary of that meeting. And I envision that the council received this report. Uh, we're gonna get a report from uh, Ms. Evans now, a PowerPoint on that. And, uh, and then you'll hear, it allows the testimony to occur under B1. And then if the council wants to pick up any actions uh, from this report uh, under staff tasking, you'd also have the ability for the public to provide additional comments at that time. So with that, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Ms. Evans to provide a PowerPoint presentation on the summary of the executive committee meeting. All right, thank you, Mr. Witherall. Good morning, Ms. Evans. Good morning, morning, members of the council, Diana Evans, council staff. And yes, we had just a, a brief summary here of the executive committee and the SSC and the AP leadership meeting. Uh, just give me a moment to figure out again how to advance slides. Technical difficulties. Yep. Okay, so we reviewed, I reviewed with you um, in February, the paper that we put together that looked at reflections on the process and ideas for change. And that paper, as, as Mr. Witherall noted, was really focused on uh, a compilation of ideas that we have heard um, either from council members or coming from staff about different ways that we might consider changing our process as we come back to in-person meetings. And we spent a lot of our focus over the last two years focusing on changes that have been the result of the virtual uh, meetings, uh, particularly focused on accessibility and engagement coming both out of your priorities and then also the community engagement committee recommendations from last February. So this is a, this, the ideas that were in this paper moving away from that accessibility and engagement ideas that you've already put in place and looking at other ways in which we might think about uh, resuming the council process in an in-person way. And those changes related to how we structure the agenda um, and, and look at the, the, the information that the council takes up at these various meetings and the schedule for that. And then also looking at your advisory bodies. So 
The group met together in March, the executive committee and the SSE and the AP leadership and walked through, uh, there was a public meeting with public input, walked through each of those 14 ideas that were included in that paper um, with the view to providing new recommendations on which at least should be initially prioritized for further work by the, uh, by the council. And the recommendation coming out of that committee was to really focus on five of those ideas. And I'm gonna walk through those briefly in this PowerPoint, but just noting that in the document, in the report that's posted, um, the, the committee's comments on all, all of the 14 ideas were included as well as some new ideas um, that came out of that conversation. But to talk first about the priorities, the first uh, highest priority that the committee identified was labeled idea five in the paper. And that is to reevaluate the timing of the crab and groundfish harvest specifications in light of fishery needs and stock prioritization. Some of the reasons for that were discussed in the paper, looking at the difficulties and the, the tight compressed timeframe in the fall for crab specifications, opening fisheries, and also for the groundfish specifications process. Um, that paper and the committee's discussion reflected that any changes to the way that we do specifications is complex and involves consulting with a whole lot of different actors, um, integral parts of that process. So that whether the regional office, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, um, the Alaska Fishery Science Center authors, our council plan teams, and obviously the SSC's role in the council's role in that process as well. The committee really prioritized this idea with, as a major way to address what was also categorized as issue uh, idea 13 to address the SSC workload. And while that seems a really big priority, it's also, um, this seemed a, a focused targeted way to really address that issue. As staff moves forward, if the council gives us direction to pursue this idea, um, the committee was anxious to make sure that we um, maintain the idea that any changes that we propose should maintain the robust quality of scientific information in our process as we're exploring those different ideas or different timing. The next pair of ideas, which I'm having trouble getting to, here we go, are relating to the meeting schedule. And they were ideas one and two in the paper. Um, the committee asked us or prioritized uh, the idea to reduce the number of annual meetings from five to four and to drop the February meeting. And we talked about that uh, in the paper, noting that that is really a very short work time for staff to produce uh, new work for the council between that December and February deadlines. There's just not a lot of, um, of, of weeks to generate new work during that time period. Uh, if this idea gets moved forward, the committee recommends that we look at some of the impacts on recurring February issues, and this would be particularly for the SSC, um, particularly informational issues. They usually have an SSC workshop in February, and it's important to the SSC members to maintain that um, balance in their workload, also including some informational issues that they are able to dive a little deeper, to, deeper into, for example, in that February workshop. How could we adjust to that? Consider the trade-offs of a four-meeting schedule uh, with the potential need to add extra days to those four meetings. So making our overall, the four meetings longer, with what would that look like and how could we address those concerns? And then also to be concerned about, or to, be, to look into the uh, constraints of in our SOP, when would we schedule a meeting to occur in the Pacific Northwest? That's a current requirement in our, in our council SOP um, and making sure we avoid overlapping meeting dates with the Pacific Council to the extent that we can. So we would look into all of those issues moving forward with this idea. Again, if the council directs us to following from this meeting. And then in a related way, idea two looks at potentially adding to that schedule or adding to our meeting schedule some designated virtual meetings. There is some conversation about this at the committee. I think we'd consider that in, the, in conjunction with the idea of dropping a meeting. Um, and some of the conversation, initial conversation was that perhaps scheduled, um, a, a schedule of when we do a virtual meeting might not be the best option. Virtual meetings are a really great tool, particularly for ad hoc meetings if issues come up and we need to add an extra meeting that gives us a lot of flexibility. But uh, the discussion of whether the discussion should include moving forward, what are the issues that best lend themselves to virtual um, discussion versus the ones that best lend themselves to in-person discussion. And that should be included in information that we bring back to you. 
Then the final pair of issues both relate to the nomination and reappointment process for the advisory panel and the SSC. Um, council, the committee rather was interested in prioritizing some further staff exploration of this idea. Um, for the advisory panel, uh, we would look at the trade-offs of having a one-year initial appointment versus a three-year initial appointment, potentially some options for more mentorship for new AP members and what would that look like. Um, and then in both cases, the committee highlighted this. The, uh, the reason for this being a priority is that opportunity for the council to have more time to consider the candidates uh, that are put forward for either the advisory panel or the SSC. With the SSE recruitment, we just need to put a little bit more uh, thought and into evaluating the timing factors for, uh, for the SSE members when they consider whether they are choosing to be reappointed um, and then some leadership factors because those influence the SSC's timing of when they could provide, uh, communicate to you about what expertise was needed on the SSC from their perspective to round out the advice that they give you. I think that's the uh, ideas that I covered in the presentation and what we have done at this meeting, also at the direction of the committee, is to give the same presentation to the SSC and the AP, um, uh, who will probably provide you some comment back in their minutes. The AP is intending to take this up at staff tasking, at their staff tasking, um, to provide you any comments back. And so I think Mr. Witherall's recommendation is that you might also take this, uh, come circle back to this issue at staff tasking for your actions, provide uh, more opportunity for both those bodies to provide you comments as well as the public. Um, uh, if, as you decide to move forward, what we have told, um, hopefully, hopefully consistent with your intent, but we have told both the AP and the SSC that we would take any ideas that come out of this process that you direct us to look at further and bring those back to you again on the appropriate time frame, which might depend a little bit on, on the different issues so that there is, though we're being fully transparent and there's lots of opportunity for iterative public uh, input as the council considers these changes moving forward. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Evans. So th that was clear to me that, that the idea is we provide the opportunity for the AP and the SSC to weigh in and get public comment at, at this meeting and identify ideas for further exploration. But if there are some fairly simple ideas out of this paper that we might wanna implement sooner rather than later, is the appropriate time frame to notify folks about that in June? How do, we, how do we draw out some of these more simple ideas that could improve the process without being on a, another year long time frame to evaluate? What's the, how would we do that? Through the chair, Ms. Kimball. We did actually have a little bit of conversation about that at our committee meeting as well, uh, in terms of timing, understanding that some of these actions are, as you say, ones that can be implemented fairly quickly and others are on the longer time frame. So to take two of the examples that were highlighted by committee recommendation, uh, there, if you were interested, for example, in changing the timing of your AP and SSC nominations, uh, we, could, we could bring you back for the June meeting, maybe just a little bit more uh, discussion about some of the different options or some of the questions that the, the committee asked um, with respect to that nomination process and particularly for the SSC with the, the right timing for getting information on expertise for um, that, that, might, that the SSC might find needful on their committee that could be part of an, a nomination announcement. Uh, we could bring that back for you for the June council meeting and in June you could act on that uh, if you wanted to. I think in the paper one suggestion we had was that in June you would uh, make a decision that you wanted to call for nominations. And we can decide what that timing, what the dates of that nomination period would be um, specifically coming out of out of the June council meeting, but you could take action immediately in June with the information that's coming back. Uh, a different case, the specifications process. I don't think that we can do all of the consultations that's necessary to bring you back a deeper dive on options and discussion on the specifications process as soon as June. I think we will, assuming that you direct us to move forward, we would begin talking with the crab plant team in May, but we'd want to talk with the, the groundfish plant teams. We need to meet with the ADFNG, talk with Alaska Fishery Science Center and stock authors. I just don't see that that process would be, uh, would give us quite enough time to bring you back a comprehensive look at how we might 
might consider changing the specifications process as quickly as June. So that one might be on a slightly longer time frame. And I think in terms of implement implementation, you would expect any changes that we make to the specifications process also to um, take a to be implemented over a longer time frame to make sure that we're. Uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't think that any of the changes that we started now would be implemented for this year's specifications process that would be looking at a future year. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Diana. Then um, would we expect the uh, an, another paper with the full list of ideas in June if the council went that direction with then an identified subset of those that could be we could take action on in June, others would be on a longer track or would we just identify the subset? I'm trying to just get a process question out there. Sure, Mr. Chair, Ms. Gimble, my anticipation not having, uh, I think there are other directions that you could go, but I was I was thinking that the council would identify the list of you know the highest priorities. For example, if you were to go with the committee's recommendations, look into these five issues and bring us back information on these five. And we would probably have a conversation that you know, ideas nine and 12 that relate to the nomination process we could bring back in June and maybe commit to bringing you back a, a start, uh, our first look at the specifications process in October, for example. Um, there, if you wanted, uh, there was conversation at the committee that these were the initial list and we should, that shouldn't necessarily mean that the council might at a future time want to explore some of those other ideas. Um, how we keep track of those, I think we can, we can, um, decide, but I wouldn't necessarily anticipate doing any deeper dive into those other issues until you gave us direction to do so. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Thanks, Ms. Kimball. Any further questions? Thank you. Mr. Witherall. Thanks, Diana, for a thoughtful and thorough report. Uh, I did want to um, alert you to the notice that ACFIN in conjunction with NIMS has provided an annual IFQ report to the fleet, which I've attached. This is a really a simplified data report than what uh, NIMS used to prepare up to 2014. Uh, but on your request, uh, uh, Mike Fye at ACFIN has put together this uh, report. And while he's not available uh, this morning, uh, he'll be around if you have questions, people have questions about what's in that report. Uh, I also uh, received a notice that uh, NOAA Fisheries and BOEM have developed a draft federal survey mitigation strategy to address uh, anticipated effects of offshore wind development on uh, NOAA Fisheries scientific surveys. And They've utilized a uh, framework uh, strategy that was developed for the New England and Mid-Atlantic region. And the intent is to apply that framework strategy to the nationally. And so uh, I don't really know all that much about this, but I did want to bring it to your attention because there are uh, there is a request for comments on this framework uh, that, are, that, that are due uh, May 6th. So. I don't really have that much more information, but I did want to bring it to your attention. Thank you, Mr. Witherell. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Witherell, for that introduction. And I did notice this item in your report. And while I haven't had a chance to review the complete uh, mitigation strategy, it, it definitely did catch my eye, given this council's ongoing and consistent uh, interest in fully supporting our, our NIMS fisheries surveys. And so while I, I recognize, as you just mentioned, that the initial strategy focuses on the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic, I, I do think it's important, I guess I'll put out there uh, before public testimony and for council member consideration that I, I, for one, would recommend that the council submit a comment letter during this open comment period uh, to at least start thinking about how potential offshore wind energy development could impact our, our surveys and building on the experience in the Northeast where I know it's, it's quite a significant issue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Okay, Mr. Witherell. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Moving on. Uh, consistent with our uh, council comment policy, I'm reporting back that uh, our comment period was open for 15 days and no comments were removed. The B1 report also includes a list of recent staff and council member activities, uh, some of our committee meetings and how the committee reports will be integrated and reported back to you at this meeting. Uh, one I wanted to highlight is the Pacific Northwest Crab Industry Advisory Committee, PINSIAC, uh, have a number of comments on uh, stock assessment and some of the activities that are going on with the council in terms of the boundaries and uh, closures in the Red King Crab Savings Area. And so I've attached the report. Uh, I, I don't know if the new chairman is going to be here, uh, but if somebody wants to represent uh, PINSIAC, perhaps their secretary uh, may provide some comments under staff tasking for the B reports. If you want more information, you could probably ask Ms. Gowen at that time. The other meetings this week uh, on Friday, uh, we'll take a break at three o'clock for executive session to discuss administrative matters. And I will distribute those materials uh, to you all on Thursday evening, probably, or Friday morning, so they don't get lost in the mix. Uh, following the full executive session, uh, the Executive Finance Committee will uh, meet immediately afterwards to uh, review the status of council finances. I've got a written finance report as well, and a performance review for the executive director. So. That concludes my B1 report. Thank you, Mr. Witherall. Any further questions on the B1 report? Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Not really a question, just wanted to update council members that uh, um, I think most council members know that I have the um, opportunity to visit pretty regularly with one of our former MACE members, uh, MACE recipients, Ken Hansen. And, Ken uh, told me recently that he had the opportunity to swing by uh, Roy, former council member Roy Heider's place and uh, visit with uh, Roy and, um, for a couple hours recently. And uh, Roy sends back his regards to all and uh, reports that he's doing well. Great, thank you, Mr. Twight. Okay, if nothing further under B1, that will bring us to uh, B2, the NIMPS management report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is Glenn Merrill, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, uh, apologies, I'm not able to be there in person. I, I caught a little something that's been going around. So um, what I'd like to do is just uh, briefly walk you through a few of the key issues on the B2 report and then turn it over to Alicia Miller, who can walk you through uh, some issues related to the uh, emergency rule request from the council from last meeting. And then also uh, Gretchen Harrington will be providing an overview of EFH. So briefly walking you through a few key issues in our report, wanted to highlight uh, some of the work that we've been doing on uh, tribal consultation as well as, well as tribal engagement. Uh, first, wanted to make sure that you're aware that uh, we have reached out to a number of uh, tribes that were identified as having previously participated in the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands halibut fishery. Uh, I think there were 19 uh, tribal governments that were identified in the uh, draft EIS, reached out to those groups and are still awaiting, I think, hopefully an opportunity perhaps to have additional consultations with them. We'll continue to outreach and update the council on that effort as we as we proceed. Uh, also wanted to uh, let the council know that we have, uh, as requested by the EPA in their letter to us on the uh, ABM draft uh, environmental impact statement, also uh, reached out to the Bering Intergovernmental uh, Tribal Advisory Council. And again, uh, we're waiting for uh, some additional feedback from them on that issue. I, I also wanted to highlight one of the things that we've uh, been interested in, and we've heard from a number of uh, tribal organizations and tribal governments, is to improve our engagement with uh, on issues that are before the council in a manner that could help to facilitate improved communications. And so one of the things that we're uh, thinking of uh, seeking additional comments on is the idea of having an opportunity perhaps twice a year to reach out to uh, various tribal governments, tribal organizations, and have an opportunity to discuss issues that are before the council in a separate forum that might help to facilitate some of the communications. 
this is still somewhat in its nascent stage, but we are asking for comments uh, from tribal governments and, and tribal organizations about how we could do that better. What would that look like? Uh, what are some of the ways that that type of engagement could be productive? I will skip over the IFQ medical transfer issues since we'll come back to those later. I did want to highlight for the council uh, an ongoing effort, uh, really a, a broad Alaska region wide effort uh, for the integrated fisheries application pro uh, program. So this is a program that basically <clears throat> would look at replacing and enhancing and revising a number of our permitting and licensing requirements, as you might imagine, building each of those uh, separate uh, requirements over the course of about three decades can lead to some challenges. So we're trying to streamline, simplify, and improve the documentation and, and accounting of those various programs. Um, so this is going to be a, a broad scale uh, revision of a lot of those aspects of, of the way that we operate. Uh, this includes not only our IFQ programs, but uh, fee and cost recovery issues, uh, licensing issues for the LLPs. What we will be doing is um, moving away from sort of this paper-based world into one that's more electronically focused, uh, trying to improve our accounting processes as well, specifically in, in the interface that we have with our, with our catch accounting system, and overall modernizing the way that we operate. Uh, this is going to be a, a pretty significant change to the way that we operate and we will certainly be adv advising the council and the public about this process as we go forward. Um, there will certainly be opportunities for some feedback on things that we can improve. Part of this process of modernizing and streamlining is likely to result in additional regulatory and changes as well. And we will be working with the council on those as we would proceed forward. Also some policy changes in terms of how various things are handled. <clears throat> um, so I just wanted to highlight this as sort of early stage for the council to be aware of that this is an ongoing effort, one that we've identified as a real critical need for our continued functioning of, of our various uh, programs that we have. Uh, also wanted to highlight just very briefly, we did have an IPHC special session. <clears throat> and at that meeting, we were able to resolve uh, issues uh, regarding the budget, as well as come to a, an agreement for a short-term duration uh, extension for the uh, recreational fisheries in Canada to have a three fish bag limit for a, for a period of time that will extend for the 2022 and, and part of 2023. Uh, that is something that we would revisit at, at a future annual meeting, but just wanted to highlight that for the council as well. Uh, and then I also wanted to touch on, I'll skip over uh, issues related to the petitions for ringed and bearded seals. I believe Mr. Curland can uh, address those directly if <clears throat> there are questions from the council, uh, but uh, wanted to provide a quick update for the council on the aquaculture opportunity area. This has been something that it, there's been extensive interest within Alaska. And really at this stage, rather than proceeding to identify a, a, a aquaculture opportunity area in Alaska due to funding restraints that are currently in place, uh, this is something that is uh, of great interest to the agency. Uh, however, there's not funding currently available to proceed with that. Um, I'll pause there to see if there are questions on any of those issues that I've presented. And if not, I'll just briefly provide a quick overview of uh, issues related to um, <clears throat> our in-season management report, as well as our status of actions. I think uh, speaking to the status of actions, uh, not too many changes since last time you've uh, seen this. Uh, we did publish, obviously, the harvest specifications, and then we're continuing work both on uh, the uh, Pacific Cod Trawl uh, LAP program, as well as the Halibut AVM action. Moving on to the in-season management report issues. This Glenn? is still, yes? Pardon me, I think there's a question, but there's a microphone issue. Okay. It's gotten kicked loose over there. Yeah, after this table, it's unplugged. Apologies, uh, Glenn, you may proceed. Uh, for the in-season management report, I just briefly wanted to highlight this is still relatively early in the year. 
Um, I won't go into great detail on, on all of the aspects of, of how this year is different than previous years. And I believe Mary Perunis is online if there are specific questions on issues. A couple of things though that I did want to highlight, and uh, that is one within the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands, there's been uh, perhaps a larger proportion of flatfish that have been taken this time as compared to uh, the same time period last year as well. Um, so you'll notice that uh, in, in particular in, in a number of the documents. <clears throat> as you know, we have a higher overall uh, Bering Sea Pacific Cod tack this year as compared to last year. Uh, and that's been proceeding on pace uh, fairly, fairly typically as, as it does at this time of the year. Um, there has been, in addition, I think an increase as well uh, with Pacific Cod in both uh, the Gulf of Alaska areas as well. Um, one thing I wanted to note is uh, there's still ongoing effort within the Gulf of Alaska, particularly in uh, area uh, 620, uh, that uh, there's a considerable amount of quota that remains to be harvested in that area, uh, but the fleet is beginning to uh, be able to find some of the pollock that are available for harvest. <clears throat> I did also want to highlight just briefly that, um, as I'm sure you've noted, the last table on, of the uh, in-season management report, that halibut mortality is um, higher than it was this time last year. That can probably be attributed to a number of factors, one of which is the rate overall of halibut encounters uh, seems to be higher this year, and the overall rate is, uh, as you can see from the third column uh, there under 2022 as compared to 2021 is um, higher really across all of the different gear types, all of the different sectors that are described here in the table. And in addition, there's been, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a higher amount of flatfish that's been harvested in the Bering Sea uh, as compared to this time last year. That's my brief uh, overview, uh, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I guess I would turn it to uh, Alicia Miller unless there are questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Merrill. We do have some questions, uh, Mr. Twight and then Mr. Dow. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Mr. Merrill. Um, hope you are recovering well. Um, my question was about the IPHC special session and, um, and just um, it didn't mention whether um, the Management Strategy Evaluation Board was gonna be continuing its work on looking at um, the effects of adopting a different lowered minimum size and I'm wondering if that's one of the included in the list of um, <clears throat> possible scenarios that the commission directed the management strategy evaluation group to work on. Yeah, thank you for that question, Mr. Twight. Yes, that work will be ongoing. Um, the commission had previously at its annual meeting identified that as, as one of the issues that they were interested in pursuing and, that, and we clarified at this special session that that is something that we would like the um, MSAB to continue to, their work on. Um, I think there's also an understanding that in, in doing so, there's um, a bit of work that needs to be done in the operating model in order to be able to better describe what the potential impacts of that would be. Uh, but that is something that I think we anticipate the MSAB will, will continue some work on uh, over the coming year. Thanks, Glenn, and I miss having you here. So I look forward to seeing you soon. Mr. Down. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. My question is on the Pacific Cod in the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands. And we've got a bigger tack out there, uh, a combined tack than we did last year, which is gonna be a some help. My question is the, the uh, stranded cod that we saw in the Aleutian Islands this last, last year. And um, I'm just wondering, it, you know, kind of what the timing is going to be by National Marine Fisheries Service to begin to calculate some formula like if uh, X amount of fish is not caught in the Aleutian Islands by X date, then we'd see a closure of the uh, early closure, or a, a, a closure anyways, of the Bering Sea. That, that, that my concern is of, that uh, um, to, to what degree are we going to be able to monitor that? Are we going to be able to see any um, problems with cod being the, the early closures in the Bering Sea and, and stranded cod in the Aleutian Islands, when will we be able to get an idea whether that situation is, is uh, being relieved a bit by efforts from the trawl and the hook and line fleet? Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Down. I, I believe, you know, at this point, this time this year, it's really difficult to say exactly how things will unfold with all of the different sectors and, and what things may look like. Uh, I do note that there's about 13% of the non-COD TAC has been taken in the Aleutian Islands thus far this year, which is, I think, a little bit higher than it was this time last year as well. So um, that might be some indication there might be some additional effort there that there wasn't in past years. Um, but I think for the details on this, I don't know if uh, Ms. Farunas is available online. Um, I would defer to her on sort of the art of in-season management. Sure. Can you hear me? We can. Good morning. Great. Good morning. Uh, right. I think um, Glenn said that 13% of the non-CDQ Pacific Cod TAC has been taken in the Aleutian Islands so far. And um, Mr. Down, we can start looking at that. As Glenn said, it is you know pretty early in the year to, to really um, get a good idea, but um, we can provide an update of that in June, if that would be helpful. And um, we also put out a weekly update on kind of what's going on in the fisheries called our Outlook, which is posted on our catch report page. And we can look at discussing that issue more in that report. We usually try to get it posted by Friday every week. Mr. Down. Uh, th thank you very much. I, I, I've uh, had that question posed to me by, by several people in industry, and that's the reason I asked the question. And, and uh, those are people that are looking at the Outlook report, which is great to see that every week. Um, and uh, a report in June would be a, 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 a better answer. And June will obviously be able to um, be prepared in June. So that's just fine. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Down. Any further questions? Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a, a quick question for either Mr. Merrill or Ms. Furness. There's several in the Bering Sea COD and the Gulf COD um, tables. There's um, overages in the A season allocation to several of the pot sectors. And I'm, I'm just wondering if that original A season allocation doesn't reflect any reallocations from other sectors or if because it's so early in the season, we accommodate that in the B season allocation to those same sectors. Just wanted a little bit of explanation on the record such that the public doesn't think we're having a mismatch in our accounting for COD. Sure, I can answer that. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Kimball. Um, so yes, we did have some overages in the pot sectors. That's a fairly difficult sector to come in right on the, um, allocation amount, although we do try really hard um, for one of the sectors greater than 60 foot pot, um, the catch rates really jumped on us the last couple of days after we had projected the closure date, you know, um, before the weekend. Fishing over the weekend was um, really good after some um, bad weather. So um, yeah, that overage in the A season will be covered by the um, allocation, um, it would be deducted from the B season allocations. And the only reallocation we've done so far for Pacific Cod is from the jig sector to the less than 60 hook and line and pot. And then of course, um, in some cases, not, not very much yet, there is some incidental catch or um, more catch that's been reported after the closure date that just um, um, adds to that overage amount. Thank you, Ms. Farunas. Thanks, Ms. Kimball. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the report, Mr. Merrill. My question, I'm, I'm gonna go back to the early part of the report and I see uh, Dr. Ike up there, so this actually might be better directed at her, but you can tell me. Uh, I appreciated the update uh, with respect to tribal consultation and tribal engagement for the Halibut ABM action. And I, I was just wondering, uh, for the council and public's knowledge, uh, you noted in, in your report that the uh, environmental impact statement for that action is, is currently underdeveloped. And I just wondered if you could help me understand uh, the status of that and, and how that interacts with rulemaking. Just a really quick primer on the, the rulemaking process for that since we uh, since the analytical document is an EIS versus our more typical 
environmental assessment and how these tribal consultation and engagement updates are working into that EIS process. Thank you, Ms. Baker. I'll uh, defer to uh, Dr. Ike. Thank you for the question, Ms. Baker, through the chair. Um, for the EIS, um, Bridget Mansfield is actually the, the lead for this one, so I will try to do my best to answer the question. Um, the, uh, the final EIS is being prepared currently, and it will be published at about the same time that the proposed rule will come out. And then um, the proposed rule will go out for public comment, um, and, and that is scheduled to occur um, I believe this fall, sorry, I'm getting some feedback. <laughs> um, so we are working as, as, um, as quickly as we can. Um, as you know, we received a lot of comments and so we're working as fast as we can to make, make it through the, the rulemaking process. Thank you, Mr. Chair, that's helpful. Thank you, Ms. Baker and Dr. Ike. Okay, I don't see any further questions. So it looks like we are ready to continue. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And first I wanna apologize for uh, inappropriately interrupting Mr. Merrill earlier, just trying to help in our new world of hybrid virtual and in-person. Uh, happy to be with you. Uh, for the record, my name is Alicia Miller, National Marine Fisheries Service. I'm the Catch Share Branch Chief and I'm here to give you an update on the request for emergency and expedited actions. So in February, uh, as you know, you made two recommendations for implementation of emergency or expedited actions. There's a letter attached to the B report um, notifying you that the request for emergency action to allow IFQ transfers has been denied. I'm not planning on walking through that letter in detail, but I wanted to provide you an update on one of the action items that's coming out of that denial. Uh, in addition, you recommended a um, expedited rulemaking to uh, remove the halibut vessel use caps in area four for 2022. Um, that is an action that is uh, moving forward under the authority of the Halibut Act and the council's authority to recommend uh, rulemaking um, that is not in conflict with the existing regulations issued by the IPHC. So uh, there's an update in uh, your packet that um, on the schedule of rulemakings that indicates that proposed rule package has been um, moved forward through the Alaska Regional Review process and uh, forwarded to headquarters as of last Friday. Um, so we expect a proposed rule to be published in the coming weeks on that. Um, so with that, I'll move on to um, more information that's in your packet um, about emergency medical transfers. In our review of the request to allow temporary transfers in 2022, we looked at uh, all of the rulemaking authority that we have under those emergency actions. Um, and one of the things that we saw was that in 2020 and 2021, there was a trade-off between the use of medical transfers and the use of the temporary transfers as recommended in those emergency actions. Uh, we've also received a number of requests about whether or not medical transfers count towards the limitation of three in any seven years. As you know, um, that was a rulemaking the council recommended several years ago and became effective on March 16th, 2020. Um, that coincides with exactly the same timing as when we began to feel impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so one of the things that we're looking at is an analysis to look at should those medical transfers count? Is it fair that some people um, requested and were granted medical transfers in 2020 prior to the implementation of the emergency action that allowed more widespread temporary transfers? Um, and so one of the things that we're looking at is whether or not those should count. Um, and especially for those years um, in which there was that expanded authority for temporary IFQ transfers. So our intention with bringing this to you today is to consult with the council and see if this is something that you would like us to proceed with under our rulemaking authority under 305D to implement um, 
record keeping and reporting in those administrative provisions of the council's management programs, um, or if this is something that you would like to come back and make a recommendation to NIMS on. It is a policy call um, in that regard. And so there's a bit of data that shows the number of transfers uh, used um, prior to the pandemic in 2017, 18, and 19. And then you see a large increase in 2020 and 2021. Um, our first figure uh, in the packet shows that there is a wide, more widespread use of this temporary IFQ transfer options. Um, and that you can see there's a, a large increase in the number of temporary transfers that were used in 2021. Uh, the second figure shows a time series of the temporary transfer or the medical transfers that were used in 2019, 2020, and 2021. And this shows uh, the breakdown of how many transfers were used by month. I've also included in this figure um, the, the indicator for the timing of when the council made recommendations for emergency action to allow that broader use of the temporary transfer provision and also showing the implementation date of those um, recommendations in 2020 and 2021. So due to the timing of all of these things, the convergence of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic with the um, implementation of the revised medical transfer provision that implemented that limitation of three and seven years, we thought it prudent to come back to the council um, and see if this is something that you'd like to weigh in on. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Miller, for that report. I just, I think you said this, but I would just like to clarify of the figures included in the NIMS B2 report, figure two is just the emergency medical IFQ transfers. It does not include the temporary transfers authorized under the emergency rules, correct? Through the chair, um, Madam Ms. Baker, yes, that's correct. Thank you. And uh, not so much a, a question, Mr. Chair, but just a comment. I, I appreciate you putting this in, in your report. I have heard uh, from fishery stakeholders the potential confusion or concern about the uh, if they undertake an emergency medical transfer in that counting toward the limit. And so I look forward to hearing uh, public testimony about that. And, and uh, but at least for me, I, I think, uh, I appreciate you bringing that forward. And, and uh, at this point uh, before public testimony, but, um, and needing to think about it a little bit more, I, I think that might be worth thinking about uh, pursuing. Thanks. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the comment, Ms. Baker. Um, and yes, just to clarify, all medical transfers processed since implementation of that regulation in March of 2020 do count currently, um, and it would take a regulatory change um, to make them not count. All right. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Anything further? All right, uh, and that concludes the, the B2 reports. Okay. All right. Um, then uh, next up, we've got uh, written only reports on uh, the NOAA GC report and Alaska Department of Fish and Game. I'd like to offer the opportunity to ask questions, though, if anybody has any. So, uh, any questions on the NOAA GC report? Okay, if uh, no questions on the GC report, are there any questions on the uh, ADF and G report? All right. Uh, that will bring us to uh, B5, the Coast Guard report. Or, sorry, uh, Mr. Kerland. Mr. Chairman, I think Ms. Harrington might have been planning to give the Essential Fish Habitat report as part of B2. Oh, okay, I, I apologize. Um, Ms. Harrington, are you with us? Good 
morning. Yes, I'm available. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. We can. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Gretchen Harrington. I'm the ARA for the Habitat Conservation Division, um, and we prepared this annual Essential Fish Habitat Report. I'm not sure if I can control the... I, I believe control is going to be transferred to you here shortly. Okay, thank you. You'll need to click in the presentation in order to control the screen. Okay, I think. All right. Um, so just to refresh uh, with the council's role in EFH consultations under the Magnuson Act um, provides a role for the council to comment on actions by any federal or state agency that may um, affect habitat, including essential fish habitat. So every year um, we provide our EFH consultation report that summarizes the um, consultations that we've conducted and provides additional EFH information to the council. Additionally, the EFH regulations um, provide that the council should establish, proce establish procedures for reviewing federal or state actions that may adversely affect habitat. Um, and just uh, to refresh the council's EFH consultation policy identified the following criteria to guide NIMS in determining whether an activity is likely to be of particular interest to the council. So the first one, uh, the extent to which activities would adversely affect DFH, one of the ways that we identify this is when we're working on an action, um, we consult with council staff, provide them information on the action to help decide whether or not it's an action that the council would be interested in. Um, and we also try to determine whether an action would uh, adversely affect habitat areas of particular concern um, to the extent to which the activity would be inconsistent with measures taken by the council to minimize potential adverse effects of fishing on EFH and the extent to which the activity would conflict with um, would conflict with council managed fishing operations. So uh, we have more detail in the written report but since April 2020, we've consulted on a number of actions. Um, the largest one was on a mining operations near Nome called IPOP. Um, we provided our EFH letter and conservation recommendations. Um, and now we're waiting for the Corps' response and the Corps' permitting on that action. We've also consulted on um, oil and gas lease sales, a number of aquaculture projects, um, dredging and harbor improvements, coastal development projects, hydropower, highways, um, two fiber optic cable projects, which we provided information to the council on um, last year when they were under consultation. Um, and then most recently, the Mendenhall Glacier facilities improvement. Um, we do have a few ongoing consultations. So these are, these are in various stages. We do a lot of our work pre-consultation. So um, early coordination and advanced planning, working with other federal agencies because the consultation officially starts when the action agency submits its EFH assessment, which provides the action agency's analysis of the, the potential impacts to EFH um, and so these are ones where we're still in the early phases. We have a couple of mines, including an offshore um, gold mine near Nome. There's a, a that's um, a reinitiation of that consultation. We have a little bit more information on that in the report. Um, the Greens Creek mine, and then we also um, provide input on other mines, um, transboundary mines. There's a few coastal development projects. We routinely um, comment on pollution discharge elimination systems permits um, at very le various levels of degree, depending on their potential impacts to habitat. Uh, we have an ongoing aquaculture permit applications, um, various, you know, St. Mary's Airport, and then uh, segment coring in Catchmack Bay under the um, USGS. 
So one of the things that we're anticipating is under the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that there will be an increase in federal projects um, funded under this act over the next five years. And we're coordinating with other agencies to understand future projects and to front load and plan EFH consultations. In addition, this act um, included funding um, under the NOAA Restoration Center for um, different funding opportunities. Um, those have not been released yet, but they will be posted and all with all other funding opportunities under the NOAA Fisheries um, Funding Opportunities. And I have the, the website here. And the anticipated funding for these opportunities are um, listed here. There's the Habitat Resilience, um, a fish passage program targeted towards um, tribal entities and their fish passage efforts, and then a general fish passage um, grant opportunity, and then the Pacific Coast Summit uh, Restoration Fund uh, has increased funding under the um, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, we also in the written report provide a brief update on the EFH five-year review. Um, we launched the five-year review in 2019 and we've been working Oh, you know, we had a little bit of delays with COVID, um, but we started with the EFH descriptions and identification because of the work required to modernize the species distribution models used to create the EFH maps. Um, there's been an extensive review process through the plan teams and SSC. We also had a stock author review of the species distribution models and the resulting maps uh, last year from January to November. And the results of that review are in the report, the stock author, uh, report of the stock assessment author review. Um, this information was provided to the SSC in February. So these documents are linked in the SSC uh, agenda from the February 2022 meeting. Also at the February 2022 meeting, the SSC reviewed um, our fishing effects work and um, the fishing effects model and the plan for the fishing effects assessment. Um, that started once the new EFH maps were completed. And right now, currently the stock authors and stock experts are reviewing the fishing effects model results and conducting the fishing effects assessment. Uh, and we will provide, and providing input on data limitations per the SSC request. So one of the things the SSC requested in February was more information from NIMS and the stock assessment authors on the limitations in data for the species distribution models and also for the, the fishing effects assessment. And we will provide the results of this work to the SSC in October, 2022. Um, and so we just started the stock author and experts reviewing the fishing effects. Concurrently um, to these, the first two issues, we are revising the report on the non-fishing activities that may adversely affect EFH and EFH conservation recommendations. And we're identifying research and information needs in developing a new um, five-year EFH research plan. So we will take all of these different pieces and put them together in a summary report um, and provide that to the council at a date to be determined. I think that will be, we'll work with um, council staff once we have the information for the SSC in October. Um, and then based on that information, if the council chooses to update its FMPs, then uh, we will prepare FMP amendments um, and the appropriate analytical documents through the normal council process. So there are a few other items in the EFH report. Um, just providing information, the tools for the EFH consultation. So this is one of the things we work on is to be able to, because uh, the action agencies provide the EFH assessments, um, we try to provide information to the action agencies that they can use in their analysis. We have the Alaska EFH web application, which we're very excited. We're, we're uh, improving that greatly this year. Um, we have funding for, for making that more um, user-friendly and accessible. We also have Shore Zone, which I think the council is very familiar with, uh, the Near Shore Fish Atlas, which is also in, in the process of being 
um, updated, and then the non-fishing report. So this is what we're in the process of revising under the EFH five-year review, but we use the non-fishing report from the last um, five-year review from 2017. There's also a section on the NOAA Restoration Center and partner restoration work in Alaska. The exciting project that was concluded was the Buskin River uh, restoration project, and there's more information on that in the report. We also every year conduct a um, call for proposals for EFH research conducted by the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. And we fund um, the region funds a, a number of projects every year that meet the, they go through a scientific ranking um, and then considerations for EFH management needs. And we've funded uh, four projects this year two on um, crab um, and then condition indicators for specific cod and walleye pollock, and then um, accounting for trophic relationships and EFH designation. This gets at component seven, which um, is EFH information for prey species. And then finally, in our consultation report, we have our HCD accomplishments report for FY um, 2021. And, um, we have the entire report um, attached, and this is really exciting. We've been doing accomplishments reports for quite a few years, and um, I was just really excited with the work that um, Charlene and um, Charlene Felkley and Stephanie Cox and Sean McDermott did on this report, and I just wanted to highlight that to the council family. Um, We've organized the work that HCD does by our HCD goals um, and, and highlight the, the work under each of those goals in addition to outreach and publications. And finally, as many of you know, um, Matt Eagleton retired last November and we have a tribute page to Matt Eagleton as well in our accomplishments report, which is, a, a which is part of the EFH consultation report. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Harrington. Are there any questions? Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Harrington. I'm back on your report about the non-fishing uh, activities in Alaska, the EF cons EFH consultations you're doing on all the other non-fishing projects. And I understand that that's a huge list of, of projects and you're uh, task, I guess, is to provide any recommendations to other agencies um, to reduce the loss and degradation of habitat. In that entire list of projects, are you providing those types of recommendations on every project, or is there some subset of projects that you get, you know, those detailed recommendations into those agencies? Um, thank you. Through the chair, um, Ms. Kimball. So, we we provide conservation recommendations to for every project where the action agency has provided an EFH assessment. So yes, we do provide conservation rec. These are all the projects where we've provided conservation recommendations. We also sometimes the action agency um, under the Magnuson Act that's one pathway. Another pathway is if we see that there are adverse impacts to habitat that can be mitigated with conservation recommendations. We can go ahead and provide those to the action agency and sometimes we do that as well. Um, so yeah, these are all actions that we've consulted and provided conservation recommendations on. Ms. Kimball. Quick follow up, Mr. Chair, then Ms. Harrington, then if the agencies you're working with don't follow your recommendations, um, are they required to provide um, some other impact statement or understanding of what mitigation actions that, that they are taking in order to avoid degradation of habitat? Or do those just kind of go out into the ether and we hope that they follow our recommendations? Um, Mr. Chair, Ms. Kimball, so under the Magnuson Act, um, action agencies have to respond to NIMPS with um, whether or not they're following our recommendations. And if they're not following them, they have to provide a scientific justification as to why they're not, and then tell us what they are doing to mitigate adverse impacts um, to fish habitat. And 
you know, that's part of the process that we're really working with action agencies to improve. I think um, providing that documentation, we do receive some responses. It's not, we don't have, you know, 100% compliance, but we're trying to be able to make sure and communicate that that is a requirement under the Magnuson Act and the EFH final rule, and then work with them it's also a way for us to improve our conservation recommendations if we're making recommendations that um, that are problematic and if there's a better way to to modify a project to minimize adverse impacts, you know that's part of our learning process. So it's really um, beneficial when the action agency responds. And we try to provide that opportunity and work with them so they know that that's a requirement. Are we allowed two questions? Or do we... Only two. I'm trying to read your lips through your mask. Um, yeah, we're two two questions under B, under B reports. All right, any uh, further questions for Ms. Harrington? All right, thank you, Ms. Harrington. Thank you. Okay, that will bring us back to the Coast Guard report. Apologies, uh, Lieutenant Commander. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chairman and council members. My name is Lieutenant Commander Jed Rasky from Coast Guard District 17 in Juneau, Alaska. And this morning I'll be providing the enforcement report for the period January through March, 2022. First, I'll cover the search and rescue statistics for this period. We had eight uh, SAR cases, search and rescue cases that involved fishing vessels with a total of six lives saved, zero lives lost and one vessel lost. This uh, graph shows the uh, cumulative total over the, the last few five years. Uh, of note, we had 15 safety violations on five vessels, and some of the common violations were expired visual distress signals, expired hydrostatic releases, and expired life raft, and also one vessel had inadequate uh, survival suits. The vessel that was lost was the fishing vessel Emerald Beauty, and thankfully all the members were recovered by the fishing vessel Annalyn, which was on scene nearby. Next, I'll cover the US-Russia maritime boundary line enforcement. So this period saw low activity uh, within 20 nautical miles of the MBL. We did conduct uh, three C-130 fixed wing aircraft MBL patrols and we detected no incursions during this time. Next, I'll cover the fishing vessel boardings and violations. These charts show the total boardings and the uh, coinciding violations over the last five years. Um, so in this period in 2022, we had 49 total boardings with seven violations on six vessels with a violation rate of 12% of the vessels uh, that were boarded having detected violations. On the right-hand side graph, it looks like the annual rate has jumped up steadily, but uh, with a low sample rate, um, this will probably go away uh, over time. So um, I would kind of disregard that jump in the violation rate. Next, I'll cover the halibut and sable fish enforcement. We did a total of 10 boardings of IFQ halibut sable fish vessels with zero violations and three boardings of REC uh, subsistence halibut vessels with zero violations. But of note, we did have a recent uh, halibut seizure that we worked with NOAA uh, near Kodiak. And it was a vessel that was uh, not a halibut targeting vessel, but they did illegally retain 18 halibut that we seized with Noah's help. Uh, 
For crab fisheries, we did a total of 21 cra crab fishery boardings. Uh, these were all Tanner crab boardings and uh, air station um, Kodiak did put a H H60 helicopter out at Cold Bay for the period of January 4th through March 16th. Lastly, I'll cutter, cover the cutter and aircraft resource allocations. So these two graphs show the um, periods January, February, and March over the last three years. And you'll see that the major cutter days in the Bering Sea have increased slightly. Uh, but the patrol boat hours have decreased um, in March uh, slightly, and that's mainly due to maintenance and heavy weather. And for the aircraft hours, the rotary wing aircraft did 50 hours, or sorry, 51 hours uh, during this period, and the fixed wing aircraft, the C-130, did um, 51 hours during this period. And of note, we uh, worked with NOAA, to have a C-130 site a vessel that was potentially in a stellar sea line no entry zone. And we were able to document that and uh, NOAA was able to issue them a violation. Pending any questions, this does conclude my brief. Great, thank you, Lieutenant Commander. Are there any questions? Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Lieutenant Commander. Um, as, as you look forward to the, um, the rest of this year, can you give us a sense of um, the adequacy from your perspective of your resources for um, patrolling the maritime boundary line? Through the chair, yes, Mr. Twight. So um, we had a relatively low activity level along the MBL uh, during this period. And that's, that's why we only had three uh, MBL flights. But as the ice recedes and the fisheries pick up out there, we definitely expect to see a little bit higher level of activity. Uh, so we will have the Bering Sea Cutter patrol that area pretty routinely, uh, as well as we have uh, icebreakers that will be visiting our area of responsibility this year. Uh, so we typically have them patrol the MBL as well. And then we can use the C-130s uh, to get out there uh, pretty quickly if we have any indications that the fishing vessels are crowding the line. And uh, we're... we're Doing a better job, I think, of managing the aircraft hours to uh, only respond when we think the, the threat is high. So instead of wasting hours and just flying out in the ocean and not sighting any vessels, we're, we're using intelligence driven operations to uh, really kind of be more efficient on those hours. Thank you. And I just really appreciate the Coast Guard sort of proactive thinking about this. Um, I think you're to be commended. Clearly, it's an area that given the global uncertainties we're seeing right now is an area that's of potential sensitivity and, and your proactive approach, I think is, is really constructive and useful. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Twight. Mr. Mesereau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander. Do you anticipate uh, less cooperative uh, cooperation with the Russian side of the border due to the current state of affairs or are you communicating regularly with them uh, as you were before? Through the chair, uh, Mr. Mesereau, we are still opening our lines of communication with the Russian border guard uh, simply because it, we do have that relationship regarding safety of life at sea and fisheries enforcement. Um, I will say the, the level of communication has dropped off obviously because of the US um, relations uh, regarding the Ukraine conflict, but we, the Coast Guard, are still keeping that line of communication open in the interest of safety of life at sea. Thank you. All right, thanks, Ms. Mesero. All right, I don't see any further questions. Thank you for the Thank presentation. You, okay, uh, next up is the uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, Service report. I believe this may uh, be written only, but um, if uh, Mr. Fassbender is is online and would like to provide any any comments or uh, be available for questions, we can do that. Okay. Not hearing uh, Mr. Fassbender, so I think uh, if there are no questions, uh, that will bring us to the um, NIOSH report. Uh, again, this is. Uh, written only, and I don't believe there's anybody available for questions on that. Okay. Um, so with that, perhaps uh, this is a, a good time to take a, a 
morning break before we get into the co-op report. So um, we can all mingle in the, in the hallways like the old days. Uh, let's come back in about 15 minutes and we'll uh, take the co-op reports. Council, please come back to order. Well, that was a 15-ish minute break. Um, great, to be, great to be back in person here. Uh, we are ready to move into our co-op reports and to kick that off for us is Sarah Marinin. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the council. Uh, for the record, Sarah Marinin, council staff. Um, and I'm just gonna give the introduction here for the cooperative reports. Um, we have uh, cooperative reporting requirements associated with four different programs. AFA and Amendment 80 um, have mandatory reporting requirements. Um, for, for the cooperatives, in addition, AFA also submits an incentive plan agreement. Um, this year, uh, those IPAs are going to be taken up in June. So um, just having the the co-op reports for AFA and Amendment 80 this meeting. And then um, the BSAI Crab Rationalization Program and the Central Gulf Rockfish Program have voluntary cooperative reporting requirements as well. Um, and you can access all the reports through the e-agenda that have been submitted. Um, the infographic that's um, up on the slide and also attached to the e-agenda highlights the requested information in each one of the reports. And I just wanted to provide a reminder to the council that as you're um, listening to the reports and reading through them, you can, you're welcome to um, ask for clarifications um, or modifications to the reports, uh, potentially uh, deletions of information if, if you don't think it's necessary, but um, any change to cooperative reports, whether mandatory or voluntary, mandatory reports would require rulemaking, but even with the voluntary reports, um, there's implications for the Paperwork Reduction Act, so staff will be monitoring your discussions, and um, that would be something that um, NIMS would consider when going through the paperwork reduction um, package that happens with these co-op reports, even voluntary requests. Um, so it's not meant to stunt the conversation, but just know that we're um, we would be paying attention in that way. Um, all oral reports are voluntary and um, we have four presentations for you this morning. So first up uh, with AFA is Stephanie Madsen, who's here in person and she's presenting with Austin Estabrooks, who'll be joining virtually. Um, and then for the AFA CV Intercoop, I believe John Groover's online and will be presenting. And then for AFA, um, Beth Concepcion and John Govin, um, who are here in person. Um, and in lieu of a voluntary written uh, report, um, since it's voluntary now, um, with the reauthorization of the Rockfish program, um, Julie Bonney will be providing an oral presentation um, for that sector. And I also wanted to note we're, we don't have any um, anyone scheduled to provide a oral presentation of crab reports this year. Um, there's in part, that's because there's less to report from the crab sector with closures. There's no Bristol Bay Red King crab lease rates, which is one of the things that the councils ask for in the sector before. Um, but we did have, we did receive, um, last I checked, eight of the nine voluntary written reports from the crab sector, and those are attached to the agenda. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions from council members. Otherwise, we can start with the first report. Thank you, Ms. Marinin. I don't see any questions. 
Well, okay, you said first up is uh, Stephanie and Austin. Good morning, Ms. Manson. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of oh. yep. there you go. New changes. Sorry, now I'm talking too loud. Wow. Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. My name is Stephanie Matson. I'm executive director of the ASCII Processors Association. Uh, welcome to uh, Mr. Curlin. Congratulations. So look forward to continuing to work with you. You and I go back a little ways. So welcome. Um, I have Austin on the phone, so uh, I might have to phone a friend if we get some questions. Austin does do all of our co-op information management and uh, provides the reports. Um, as Sarah mentioned, uh, our IPA report has been filed, uh, but we won't present that until June. So if there's questions on that IPA report, you can ask me, but we'll, we'll be making that presentation in, Zoom, in June. So today, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, is the uh, Pollock Conservation Cooperative and High Seas Catcher Cooperative Annual Report. Uh, as uh, Sarah introduced it, it is required by AFA, and the uh, products of this report were either mandated in AFA or recommended to uh, us by you uh, during the course of it. But there hasn't been any real uh, information request changes for some time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, since it is required in AFA, we have been giving this report now since about 2000. So this is like our 22nd report. Um, unfortunately, it's a little pro forma probably. Uh, it is a, a lot of data driven or a lot of information there. All of that information is uh, either provided by C-State but really all comes from the agency. It's a little hard to find on the website. You have to be familiar with, with how you get that data, but all this data is publicly available uh, on the NIMS website. So Mr. Chairman, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, the one thing I did wanna report uh, that there hasn't been any major changes, but I, um, what, but I did wanna let you know that there has been uh, a change uh, in our structure membership wise. Uh, we don't have Aleutian Spray Starbound as a member anymore, as you probably remember or read in the press, uh, Starbound was uh, acquired by Trident Seafoods. So now we have uh, five companies instead of the six that we had, same number of vessels. Um, so moving forward here, uh, this just kind of talks about the Pollock directed uh, fishing catch and bycatch of all the species. So it kind of speaks for itself. Uh, what I would like to highlight that our ground fish bycatch ratio was 0 0.018 or 1.8% 1 uh, this year or last year, 2021. Uh, our, the the long-term 15 year average has been 0 0.033 or 3.3%. 3 .3%. So 2021 fishing was much cleaner uh, than the long-term uh, average. Okay, Shannon, so I use this or this. Okay. Okay, here is another required amount, uh, just a total retained um, uh, versus uh, discarded. So you can see that we retain 99.4% of all the ground fish catch uh, was retained by PCC vessels while directed fishing uh, in 2021. Here, Mr. Chairman, is a list by vessel because as you recall, this is required by AFA. So complete transparency on what each vessel catches. Uh, so here's our list of vessels with their retained catch and their discards. Also um, on page, if you wanted to get a little bit more clarity, um, there is a chart on page, uh, I think 17, um, that does list Pollock discards by vessel uh, in, a, in a table form versus uh, this chart form. Here, Mr. Chairman, is uh, the PCC Pollock Fish, Fishery Historical Halibut Bycatch. Uh, 2021 is highlighted. Here, I would just like to uh, note that uh, halibut bycatch in the Pollock Fishery is strongly correlated with coal pool extent. Uh, therefore, you can note that there was very low bycatch in 2018. Uh, the 2021 halibut bycatch rates in the Pollock Fishery were slightly below the recent 10-year average. We also uh, do yellowfin sole. 
we, we are in the TLAS fishery for yellowfin sole, many of the members do. But in 2021, only two of our PCC vessels participated in the TLAS yellowfin sole. Average halibut mortality in the yellowfin fishery by PCC vessels was just three kilograms per ton of total ground fish. As you note, yeah, as you note, um, and I'm not sure how many of you remember, but the High Seas uh, Catcher Cooperative were kind of what we talked about. Those are the catcher vessels that prior to AFA delivered to CPs. So when the history was uh, awarded, these vessels have a relationship with PCC vessels and we harvest all of that fish. Now there are some vessels that fish in the Gulf or have other uh, responsibilities and we do discuss this right now. Um, so we are, because of our agreement with the High Seas Catcher Cooperative, uh, we report uh, all of their information. So this is the High Seas Catcher Cooperative, a BSI Pacific Cod Directive Fishing Catch and Bycatch. We have, whoops, we have, hmm. Well, I have a slide that you don't. I don't know what happened here, but um, we have sideboards, uh, which is the slide I can't quite find. Oh, here it is. So um, we have sideboards required by AFA. And so we're required to report where we are uh, on the sideboards. And as you can see uh, on our 2021 catch and our 2021 limits there on of the prohibited species, we were under uh, all of those limits in 2021. Now this is non-pollock, uh, this, so this is for our tea last yellowfin fisheries. Oh, that's why I skipped it. Mr. Chairman, I added this uh, chart today uh, because I know that there's great interest in chum salmon bycatch. And we do report those numbers and those numbers are in the document uh, by vessel. Uh, again, transparency by vessel. But I raised this today because I just wanted to uh, provide you an update on where PCC is. Um, you can see the, the data up there that you've seen before uh, for 2021. But we have, um, we have a working group in our membership. And we've been meeting to try to address the concerns on CHUM. So what we've been doing is we looked at our uh, incentive plan agreement. Uh, we looked, we, we met with C-State and our members to see if there were tweaks or changes we could do to our IPA report that would enhance uh, measures for CHUM. We haven't landed on it uh, yet, we, um, but we do have three areas that we think uh, we continue to pursue looking at the data. And the three areas are one, um, I don't want to bore you with the details, but right now we identify closures on Thursday. On Monday, uh, the IPA had only allowed C-State to modify those closures, but we decided to look at the data. And in 2021, we would, if we would have been allowed to, or allow C-State to determine new closures, there would have been four instances where the data that came in over the weekend would have triggered C-State to institute new closures. So we're gonna look at that. Uh, we think that that is a representative of a more responsive to the data that comes over the weekend and not wait until Thursday to, uh, to, to initiate new closures. So again, it only would have occurred four times. It's difficult for us to tell what the, how many chum salmon that would have saved. You've heard that before. It's really difficult to say how many you have avoided, um, but we're gonna look at that. The second one is that when we have bycatch avoidance areas uh, in our IPA, as you're well aware, the bycatch avoidance areas for vessels to be excluded from that area is based on a base rate and performance of those vessels. What we thought we would look at is um, maybe we should require in times of you know, high chum in encounters that if there's a bycatch avoidance area identified, all vessels need to remain out of those areas instead of just the, the ones that had a base rate uh, performance correctly. So we're looking at that. Uh, we also can't you know, predict what that would 
mean? Uh, as you have heard in our IPA reports, uh, there has been behavioral changes in our fleet to where even those vessels that are allowed to fish in some of the BAA, specifically for Chinook, they don't go there. They don't wanna take the risk uh, that they're gonna encounter it, even if their performance would allow them to go in. So we're not quite positive if this will have a significant change, but we thought that that was a, an area worthwhile pursuing. And then finally, Mr. Chairman, our CHUM uh, IPA does not have an outlier provision. As you all recall, our Chinook uh, IPA does have an outlier provision, and we think we could implement a, an outlier provision in CHUM. Uh, so we're looking at that again, I know I've said this three times now, but it's very difficult for us to come back to you and tell you that these things are gonna save X amount of chum. But we are very serious about examining our IPA to be responsive to the concerns on chum uh, and, and what we can do uh, in our IPA. And then lastly, Mr. Chairman, I would just note that uh, uh, I've been asked by some to kind of provide opportunities to share the information that we have been doing as far as research. So there is a document posted to your agenda that describes all of the salmon work uh, projects that the Pollock Conservation Cooperative Research Center has funded. Um, it would be small print for me to put it up here, but I think you can read it online. Uh, and that was uh, done by Keith Criddle at PCCRC. And it uh, summarizes all the work that we have funded over the years on salmon. And I think uh, I'd be happy to respond to any questions on that or Austin will, um, but I think it's pretty self-explanatory. And I think if you're interested in any of the details of those projects, uh, the PCCRC has a great website uh, with all of the work that we have funded over the years and you can read about the projects and the uh, final reports on those projects. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's all I have for you this morning. Thank you, Ms. Madsen. Are there any questions? Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Madsen. I, I realize you're giving a, the IPA report in June. You mentioned that at the start, but then you did open the door a bit on CHUM. Um, I appreciate that. And, and so on some of those ideas that it sounds like the group is discussing, I wanted to make sure I understood the difference in the current structure for Chinook versus CHUM. For Chinook, you'd have closed areas but you're finding behaviorally vessels that even aren't required to be out of those closed areas because their Chinook bycatch rates are lower, they are staying out of those areas. So one of your ideas is to apply that same kind of thing through the IPA to CHUM. So does that mean you're not finding that behavior kind of evolving naturally for CHUM salmon? Yes, Madsen. It's a good question. Um, I'm not quite sure we thought, you know, that we saw, we, we see similar behavior, um, but we thought given the emphasis on CHUM uh, and relatively new, I mean, you know, the CHUM provisions came in later than Chinook, so we don't quite have as much history uh, with that program. Um, so I, I can't say that we saw behavior differences between the CHUM IPA provisions and Chinook, uh, but we thought that that would be one that would be, uh, very clean to provide, just require them to stay out of those CHUM BAAs as we refer to them. Separate question, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, all, all three, and I realize this is a work in progress is how you talked about, these are ideas. Um, all of those ideas look like they're with the intent of reducing overall CHUM bycatch or encounters. Is there anything you see in the current genetic work or anything we're working towards that would allow the fleet to better avoid coastal Western Alaska chum, middle to upper Yukon chum, the, the component, smaller component of the chum bycatch that we really care about? Uh, we have met with the genetics folks and you're gonna get those reports uh, as well. You know, we have for CHUM, we have the five areas. You know, we, we started spatially and temporally identifying in our bycatch where we're finding the Western Alaska Chinook versus hatchery. Unfortunately for us, cause it would be very, it would be really nice if there was a real strong trend and we could focus, you know, our efforts on a particular time or area, but the genetics is a little fuzzy. Uh, regarding that. So we've talked to the genetics folks about, you know, if there's is anything that they could do to refine that. So we continue to work with them to see if there's things that they could provide in the genetics that we could use in management. Uh, but it, it, it's not, 
it's not as definitively clear as we would like. You'll recall that when we first started down this process, we thought Western Alaska chum were more prevalent in the Bering Sea in June, and that we really should focus you know, our management measures there. That's gotten a little bit fuzzy. Um, and with the huge increase of, of Asian uh, hatchery chum, uh, it's really confounding a lot of the, the genetic work a little bit it, because those Asian hatchery chum are kind of mixing with the Western Alaska chum and they seem to be everywhere all the time. So it's unfortunately not as clear, but we haven't given up and we continue to try to kind of dig down deeper to see if those, those, uh, that data would develop into management measures. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Medicine. Uh, Ms. Kimball asked uh, a couple of my questions already, um, but as I was listening to you describe the, the work that APA is, is doing, um, I was thinking a lot about um, the, the impacts on sort of decision-making in the wheelhouse and the impacts on, on um, how C state sort of uh, really tailors its guidance. Uh, as we keep adding in another species um, to the mix to, to be thinking about in terms of avoidance, um, you know, we've, as a council, we sort of recognize some of the difficulties that creates and we try to provide some sense of priorities sometimes, but then we can get a little inconsistent about that. And I'm just wondering if, you know, you, you've got access to a pretty impressive set of brains on this whole decision-making thing. That, and you know, Mr. Esther Brooks and Dr. Martell in particular have really um, got a lot of expertise in this area. And I'm wondering if they're starting to develop a sense of, of at what point do you essentially run out of, how many constraints can you sort of pile in there before you essentially run out of options and, and the only way to really, meet all the um, bycatch avoidance priorities is to stay tied up at the dock. Do you, are, are, do you have a sense of, or are you starting to think about how that affects the wheelhouse decision-making? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Twight. Um, you, you are right. We have a lot of brain trust and we have a lot of data. And we go back and we, you know, unfortunately we have to look back at historic data and given climate conditions, you know, it doesn't always predict the future. But uh, we've been working with C-State on what we're kind of calling a framework structure, uh, looking at uh, historic, more recent than way past, but historic areas of known bycatch uh, in encounters uh, to try to provide a kind of tool that the skippers can use that, you know, uh, they can be in season and they're, they're running into something and they're kind of thinking, well, where should I move? And then you have this historic data that will, could indicate to them what happened in the past, that last year this area was this, or we encountered this there. Um, it's not a refined tool and it's not a decision-making tool. It's just uh, trying to provide the captains uh, as much information in order for them to make the real-time decisions they have to make on the grounds when they're thinking about moving. And as you all know, the reason that the rolling hotspot closure is kind of core to our IPA is that for catcher processors to pick up and move is very expensive, uh, it's time-consuming, uh, you don't want to move. If you're on good fish, you want to make sure that you can stay there. And you want to understand that if you do have to move, where's the best place to move so I don't have to move again. And we can look back. Uh, Steve Martell, Dr. Martell, as you know, is great at putting maps and things together. So I think you're, you're correct in, in saying that we're working on that. Uh, it's, as you know, it's complex and it's not... Uh, it's definitely data driven, but it's not precise necessarily because we're talking about different conditions every year. Uh, but there is some trends and, and we're providing that. Um, we rely on the council to prioritize what we should be taking care of first. Um, so we'll always rely on that because as you're right, there's, there's a lot of things that we should uh, you know, be encouraged to avoid. And we try that and you know, you know the list. Um, and as abundance of some of those things change, you know, we encounter them more. Um, but right now, Chinook salmon is our priority uh, and chum salmon is not too far behind. And then we have herring, uh, crab, 
and uh, Peacock. So we're, we, uh, we pay attention to all of that, Mr. Uh, Twight, but we prioritize Chinook. Thanks, just don't forget small sable fish. Uh, well, that's on the list, but lower because of our interactions with sable fish. Ms. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Madsen, for the report and particularly for the update on the research that was funded. We've had a lot of forums lately about salmon research, and I think this is a, a piece of the puzzle. I just have a simple question about the dates. So, um, do, and it might be more of a, an Austin question if he's the one that put that together, but many of these projects uh, have end dates of, you know, 2018 or 2019. Are they, have they been extended and are currently ongoing or is there other research that, that is currently being funded uh, by the PCC? Uh, Ms. Campbell, uh, those, you're right. Those are done and the final reports would be on the website. We continue to uh, support uh, uh, salmon research uh, through the university. You might recall that uh, Patrick Berry, uh, who is with the genetics in Oc Bay now, was funded and some of his work uh, about the identification, the onboard identification of uh, potential someday, uh, onboard identification of, of using the genetics uh, for CHUM is what we've been working on. We just extended uh, Dr. McPhee's work on that. Uh, now that Patrick Berry is working for Oc Bay Lab, he's still involved in the project, but we've extended that one. Um, and, you know, we're looking for ideas, uh, you know, you, with, with the university, you're kind of limited on who at the university has the expertise and has the graduate students do the work. Uh, but we're very open to uh, trying to cooperate. Uh, we, we have talked to the Bering Sea Fishermen's Association, AYK, SSI. We try to monitor that. Uh, we, under, we wrote a letter of support just recently uh, for uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, again, on some work that they're submitting to um, AYK, SSI on genetics. And it would be, when we were talking to the genetics folk, they said, well, if there's one thing we could do, uh, to help you, what would that be? Tell us when we're in hatchery fish versus wild fish. If we could just have a clear understanding of that in real time, that would really, you know, position us to be making on the grounds management decisions. I don't know if that's ever possible, but that was the response to that question. So I appreciate, you know, your interest and I'll do a better job of keeping you posted. And maybe at some point we could have an evening session and ask PCCRC to come and talk about all the other projects or maybe even invite the investigators. And it looks like uh, Mr. Mr. Estabrooks has a uh, point you'd like to make. Go ahead, Austin. Oh, thanks. Uh, just through the chair, I um, I just wanted to highlight that yes, some of these current projects are actually completed projects. Um, some of them are are ongoing or still have residual funding that hasn't been um, and haven't been completed yet. But uh, I just wanted to highlight the project uh, in uh, the most recent funding cycle that we have. Uh, agreed to fund, and that is um, building out some species distribution models for Chinook. And so I think um, sort of the future of chum and Chinook bycatch avoidance measures is um, trying to um, uh, do more forward-looking projections of when and where uh, Chinook are most likely to occur rather than looking in the rear view mirror using uh, closures and bycatch avoidance areas where we know that we've already encountered Chinook in a given year. And so those species distribution models are gonna look at uh, some environmental covariates uh, such as depth um, is the primary one um, just to try to help identify uh, and give, again, our skippers more information about when and where they are most likely to encounter Chinook salmon. Thank you, Mr. Estabrooks. Thanks, Ms. Campbell. Thank you, Austin. Okay, any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Right. Chairman. Thank you.
Okay, uh, next up, uh, we'll have a remote report from John Groover. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Um, let's see, I, I can't see the slides right now. Here we go. Um, John Groover, I'm the uh, uh, American Fisheries Act uh, Catcher Vessel Intercooperative Manager. And uh, we give this report um, every year. It's a, a voluntary report, but it's pretty necessary, I think, because there, there's you require the eight individual uh, catcher vessel cooperatives that each supply a, a, re a report, but you know the, the regulations uh, that deal with catcher vessels are in the aggregate for sideboard fisheries, PSC, uh, et cetera. And so, you know, rather than having to sort through many pages of, of eight different reports, we uh, have uh, been putting this intercooperative report together every year since uh, uh, since the 2001 for the 2020 season or 2000 so 2000 season. So anyway, with that, I'll proceed. Uh, hopefully I uh, can advance the slides. I must be doing something wrong. Control the presenter screen. Yep. I'll look to Stafford help on that. I think you need to click on your presentation. Hey, John. You oh, there to... we go. Yeah, right. I, I flunked my uh, training currently. There we go. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, tough to teach an old dog new tricks sometimes. Um, anyway, uh, so this is a slide uh, showing the, uh, the Pollock catch by the uh, eight individual cooperatives. Uh, of course, the high seas catch vessel cooperatives as Ms. Madsen explained, uh, their pollock is caught by the CPs. And, and so uh, the details of how that all takes place is found in the, uh, the PCC and H, uh, high seas cooperative combination report. So uh, you see that uh, all the co-ops stayed under their annual pollock allocations. Um, we did have one less catcher vessel uh, in the inshore sector this year. Uh, this is small morning star that was in the Unicy Cooperative that's been retired and replaced by this starfish. So we went from 88 catcher boats down to 87. Um, so talk, talking about salmon bycatch, which is a popular topic here, uh, is uh, for, in 2021, the three of index was below the 250,000 fish threshold. So the limits were reduced, the uh, overall limit to the fishery, then uh, this would be CDQ, offshore, uh, so, uh, and uh, mothership and inshore cooperatives. It goes down to 45,000 Chinook from the 60,000. Then we have a performance standard that is what everybody really allocates to. And, and uh, the focus is the standard and that that dropped down to 32,318 from the 47,591. It would have been, if we'd been over the 250,000 fish threshold. So you get an inshore uh, sector hard cap limit of 25,020, mothership limit of uh, 3,510, and uh, inshore performance standard, once again, is a more important number because that's where we allocate from to the vessels and to the cooperatives uh, down to. Uh, 18,525 and the mothership performance standard dropped to 2,599. Um, so the results for salmon bycatch this last year uh, were uh, quite low on, in Chinook, one of the lowest years. Um, chum salmon, uh, we can't make the same claim. So one of the higher years, uh, of course, um, you know, high seas, once again, because they don't fish pollocks, it doesn't have any salmon bycatch. Um, so I'd note that one of the requirements that's in the regulation is for the co-ops to uh, re uh, report the number of times they appear on a dirty 20 list. And of course, when, when we change to the incentive plan agreements uh, in Alaska around the IPAs, uh, a dirty 20 list program was dropped from uh, the IPAs, and so the inshore co-ops uh, and the mothership co-ops, they, they don't report in there. If you went through the reports, you'd see that they will tell you that the, there's no appearances on the dirty 20 list, so you won't find that 
in the reports anymore, even though it still exists in regulation. They're just, they don't exist. Um, so one of the things to talk about in the beginning is the ground fish uh, sideboard harvest. And the sideboards are allocated uh, to the catcher vessels, uh, inshore mothership and high seas in the aggregate. And so we, through a COD agreement between everybody, have, have determined what uh, every, each COD boat's history from 95, 96, and 97 is, and came up with a formula and work all that out. And each vessel became, uh, has a sideboard allocation. Each of the non-exempt vessels, I should say, has a sideboard allocation. Uh, and when you put those groups and they move between co-opers or whatever they do, we add it up and each co-op comes up with a uh, co-op sideboard percentage. And then it's up to them internally to figure out how to manage that. But we do make uh, sideboard limit transfers. And you can see that in the uh, one column here, made sideboard labeled sideboard limit transfers. And uh, there were some transfers, you know, very, very little uh, fishing from the high seas boats anymore. And so some of that sideboard got moved around to the Mothership Cooperative and uh, to Alaska from Westward. And this, uh, you can see those sideboard transfer allocation or amounts there. Uh, and you can see the, the final sideboard limits then where we assigned each cooperative after those transfers and the, uh, the harvest and uh, how much of the sideboard limits they did not harvest. And of course, you can see that we are under the, uh, uh, fell under the uh, sideboard limit for the AFA catch with those by 8,349 tons. Um, so we also have groundfish sideboards in the Gulf of Alaska fisheries. Uh, this year we had very little uh, AFA catch for vessel uh, effort from non-exempt vessels. There was uh, three vessels uh, fished by two cooperatives and uh, came nowhere near any of the sideboard limits, um, very little activity. Um, so we also have PSC sideboard limits and catch. Uh, and here we have, uh, this is the, the uh, sideboard limits for halibut, red king crab and so on, one opelio crab and baradite crab. And we, it's difficult for us to determine crab necessarily by the zone. So we're reporting all crab, all king crab bycatch, all apelio crab bycatch, and all baradite bycatch combined here. Of course, we're, we're way under the sideboard limits. Um, so I've also reported that there's only, in the Bering Sea, there's just two ground fish categories here. We'll get to Pollock later, but uh, bottom trawl fisheries that uh, our boats participate in, and that's uh, Pacific cod uh, trawl, and then yellowfin sole tea last trawl. Um, same, there's PSC uh, uh, sideboard limits in the Gulf fisheries. And once again, we had very limited participation and the total, more on, uh, this is on how, but mortality only in the Gulf of Alaska. And uh, our three vessels that fished in the Gulf caught in the aggregate caught one ton of uh, halibut. Um, so talk a little bit about uh, PSC catch in the pollock fishery for the Gulf is uh, for Chinook salmon uh, by the, those three vessels, they did catch uh, 346 Chinook salmon in the central Gulf and there was no effort in the Western Gulf. So, uh, and then finally, uh, talking about PSC catch directed to the pollock fishery other than salmon, which we talked about earlier. Um, herring, we did catch 1,521 tons. Halibut in the pollock fishery was 19.53 tons. And sable fish, uh, this is sable fish for the year for us, not just after it went on uh, no retention status on July 17th was 1,049 tons. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Gruber. Are there any questions? All right. Thanks again. Thank you. Okay. Next, we'll move into the Amendment 80 report. Ms. Concepcion and Dr. Gava.
Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the council. Uh, my name is Beth Concepcion with Alaska Seafood Co-op. I'm here with John Gobbin, also Alaska Seafood Co-op. I'm gonna go through the report and then John's here to help with any questions um, anyone might have. So this is our report for the 2021 fishery. Um, we are the Amendment 80 fleet. It's just a little background. Amendment 80 started in 2008. We had 27 catcher processors, um, a limited access fleet, one co-op. We now, since 2017, have um, one co-op, 20 catcher processors, and one catcher vessel. Also with Amendment 80, we had to have two observers on all of our boats, so nearly all of our hulls are sampled. We have an MCP scale, a flow scale. Uh, we cannot mix our hulls. No fish on the deck outside of the cod end. Um, excluding halibut deck sorting. We have one conveyor line for the observer to collect their sample. We have bin monitoring, designated observer sampling stations in both the factory and now also on deck. We also are required to have a deck safety plan to um, do deck sorting. And we have a vessel monitoring system. On page six of the report, um, goes through our catch. Amendment 80 gives us hard cap allocations for cod, yellowfin sole, rock sole, flathead, POP in the Aleutian Islands and mackerel and the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands. We've caught the majority of our cod and nearly 100% of our POP and mackerel and a good amount of our flatfish. You will note that it does look like we had a slight overage and POP 543 and macro 542. This was not an actual fishing overage. After our fishing was completed, data was deleted by the observer program, which altered the numbers um, due to their algorithm for unsampled toes. We also are given hard caps for five PSC species, halibut, king crab, bared eye zone one, zone two, and cobalt zocchelio. We stayed under those um, limits as well. We also are required to retain um, upwards of 85% of all the ground fish caught. Last year, we had a ground fish retention standard of 91%. We also are allowed to do a flatfish flexibility trade, which allows us to trade our yellowfin sole, rock sole, and flathead. Um, quotas around, we didn't have to do any flatfish exchanges last year. As every other year, we try to catch the majority of our target species with the least amount of prohibited bycatch, um, mostly halibut, um, but crab as well. We do this by on-ground communications and weekly reports. We have our halibut avoidance plan, which I won't go into, we've talked at length on that. All vessels complied with the standards for the 2021 fishing year. We also have excluders that we continue to make modifications to, as well as deck sorting. And I'll touch just a little bit on deck sorting for last year. All 20 of our vessels participated in deck sorting. We used it in both the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands and the Gulf of Alaska. We also have quarterly meetings with um, Alaska region, the national, um, sorry, excuse me, the Pacific Observer Program, North Pacific Observer <laughs> Program, and um, OLE. And so we do these uh, four times a year where we discuss any issues that may arise relative to deck sorting and then take actions as required. I will note in 2021 that we had to stop deck sorting um, when marine mammals, particularly orcas, were present. This was after continued conversations with the Alaska region and the observer program. Um, because deck sorting takes a lot of effort on everyone's part and we didn't know what sort of feeding was happening, we just stopped deck sorting altogether. So although we don't know exactly how this impacted deck sorting savings, it did at some level. Lastly, uh, for 2021, we were able to catch the majority of our um, target species with minimal impact 
to the PSC limits. Um, they were well below regulatory limits and we exceeded our ground fish retention. And that is all I have for the MS80 report. Thank you. Mr. Dale. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Concepcion, and, uh, for your report. I'm interested in the, um, in the, the killer whale ob, uh, observations. So when the killer whales are observed and you stop the deck sorting, is that, a, is that rare that that happens or is it, uh, um, is it common that that happens? And, and, and did you have any luck? Like when you, when you um, stopped deck sorting, did the killer whales seem to go away? I'm just curious as to whether there's an, that, that, that's effective um, method coming from the fixed gear deal dealt with this for years and it's hard to, so it's just of interest to me personally, thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Down. So we've, this is nothing new to have orcas around our boats when we're fishing. I think a lot of boats in the Bering Sea have this. Um, I think longliners also have this problem. Yeah, in deep water flats. Um, we stopped deck sorting. Did the whales go away? No. No. <laughs> I guess that's the short answer. They were still there. It's just, it's a lot of work. And because we don't know for sure um, what is happening with the halibut once they're deck sorted off, it was decided to just stop deck sorting. And that was within conversations with Alaska Region and OLE and the Observer Program. And so that's why we did that. But the, the orcas were still around. They, we've had this issue for many years, well before deck sorting <laughs> um, decades. So I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Down. Ms. Vanderhoven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Concepcion. I think Kenny's, Mr. Down started to get to my, my question. I guess I'm wondering if you're continuing to see those behaviors um, this year or, and you may have started to answer that a little bit, but I, I guess I'm looking kind of forward and, and what you're seeing this year. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll take this one. Uh, thanks, Ms. Vanderhoven, for the question. Um, yeah, we are seeing uh, some changes in the activity that uh, Ms. Concepcion described. In the past, the encounters we've had with killer whales following the boats have been restricted to deep water fisheries. And it was our thinking that their attraction was to the higher fat content fish in those fisheries like uh, uh, parts of uh, like turbid heads and, and, and if, if we had to uh, discard sable fish because it was on uh, prohib or bycatch. Um, but this year we have seen something that uh, is different. We have, uh, we're tracking to learn more about, but we, in the yellowfin sole fishery, which is a shallow water fishery, um, fishing this spring west of the Pribilofs uh, in an area that had very good yellowfin sole fishing and virtually our whole flatfish fleet was out there. Um, we got reports from captains that orcas were around the boats. Never seen that before. It was our assumption that, and there was really wasn't much halibut being caught that the, the orcas wouldn't find that energetically worthwhile. I don't know if that's the right term. Um, so in response to that, you know, we started hearing of some reports, we asked the fleet to start to collect information on that. And we did two things um, as part of one of our other spreadsheets, I think it might've been for red, tracking red king crab, uh, dump the bag and see how many crab you see. We had the, a new column put in there to Ask them if there were whales uh, around the boats and um, what they were doing. And uh, we got reports uh, from that. And we also basically talked to the observer program about the degree this was happening and decided to suspend deck sorting in Yellowfin Sole while we were out there. 
So um, what we saw was somewhat different behavior in the sense that we didn't have large numbers, but they seemed to be in sort of mini groups of six or so that would be around the boats. And they were persistent even when, as Ms. Concepcion said, even when we stopped deck sorting, they, they stayed around the boats. So we're monitoring this as it's new behavior and I will report that when the boats move to the east, so um, east of the Pribilof Islands, and I don't, I can't guess how many miles, but significant distance, um, we had to continue monitoring and the uh, whales didn't follow us there. But that's what's new this year and um, worth noting. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. We're done? Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. That was easy. <laughs> okay, uh, last up, we'll, we'll hear from Julie Bonney, and I believe this is the, the last item under B report. So remind members of the public to please sign up to testify prior to the conclusion of this report. Um, Mr. Chair and members of the council, my name is Julie Bonney, and I am the inner co-op manager for all five CV co-ops. So this is, and I just, I put a lot of background in here and also put some data that kind of goes to your future action under C4, just to kind of highlight um, what that action is about and what data we actually had available. Let's see. It's not moving. Oops, there we go. So this is the rock finish program background. Um, prior to the program in 2007, the rockfish fishery was a very fast three week race that occurred in July, which directly conflicted with the Kodiak pink salmon fishery. The Rockfish Pilot Program was a five-year test program authorized by Congress from 2007 through 2011. The Council reauthorized the program with some modifications before its sunset due to the success of the program and support by industry. It was renamed the Rockfish Program. The RP was authorized for a 10-year period, 2012 through 2021, and instead of allowing the program to sunset in 2021, the council reauthorized the program again, March 31, through, um, 2021, without a sunset date at that time. Hmm. Um, the goals of the Rockfish program was economic benefits to Kodiak to stabilize the residential processing workforce by filling times of year with low processing volumes, particularly May and June, and we're hoping to add April. Remove the processing timing conflict with salmon and slow the fishery so more valuable products could be produced. Uh, it's a co-op management structure where the council sets program objectives Industry develops internal rules and agreements to meet those objectives, and industry is responsible for co-op management and staying within the allocations. NIMS oversees harvest and council objectives. Annual voluntary co-op reporting to the council, what I'm doing right now, and then the co-op structure builds co cooperation among harvesters and processors where the entire industry is working together to meet the common goals. And this just give, is a schematic of who's reporting to who and how all the pieces fit together in terms of fish tickets, bycatch, uh, the agency's role, the processor's role, the co-op's role. I'm not gonna walk you through all that pieces here. Um, <clears throat> the co-op fishery allocations, we, there's primary species, which is Pacific Ocean perch. Northern rockfish, dusky rockfish, secondary species, which includes sablefish, Pacific cod, thorny head rockfish, 
And then there's a bycatch cap for halibut mortality and a sector cap for Chinook salmon that was implemented in 2015. The monitoring requirements for this pr program, it requires 100% observer coverage for catcher vessels. There's, there's a catch monitoring and control plan required for shoreside processors. And we also have a CMCP monitor who monitors offloads in Kodiak. Vessels must check in and out of the fishery. Vessels must carry a laptop for observers for faster data turnaround. Uh, community social conservation measures. There's a port landing requirement, which maintains historical landing patterns and protects Kodiak. All, all rockfish for the program must be delivered in the city limits of Kodiak. There's no transfers from the CV sector to the CP sector, but that you can transfer fish from the CP sector to the CV sector to increase landings. Uh, there's ownership caps, co-op caps, processor cap, vessel use caps. Um, we have a cost recovery, a maximum of 3%. It was 2.77% this last year. There's a 100% retention requirement. So no at sea discards allowed for the co-op species. This includes POP, Northern rockfish, dusky rockfish, fish, Pacific cod, sablefish, and thorny heads. Halibut must still be discarded at sea and all salmon must be retained. Uh, the requested modifications for the program, which you'll see later in the agenda, is to um, change the start date from May 1 to April 1st. Um, and we did operate under at April 1st last year because uh, you, we were able to get an emergency rule. Thank you increase the processing cap from the 30% to 35 to 40% and change the harvesting cap to 8% of, for only POP and remove the co-op cap. This is, um, shows that we've had minimal vessel consolidation from the very beginning of the program until now. So we, prior to rationalization, there were 25 vessels participating. In 2021, we had 26 vessels participating. This, this shows um, what's how, why we're asking for the processor um, cap to be changed. We've had um, significant processor consolidation from 2012, where we had seven processors. And as you can see over time, we've moved from seven down to four. This is the 8% vessel um, harvesting cap that occurred. This is how the vessels rank, the 26 vessels that participated in 2021. And as you can see, we had three vessels that approached the cap, but all the other vessels, all the other 23 vessels were well under the 8% um, cap. This actually shows landings by week um, from 2016 through 2021, all species combined. And this is just for the catcher vessel sector. And so you can see that we did catch a significant amount of rockfish in April last year. Though, um, as you can see, there wasn't a lot in the first two weeks because we needed to sort out um, PSC and bycatch avoidance before we really got onto it to, catch rockfish. Uh, it, we caught about 27% of the harvest in April last year. Uh, this just shows the trends in terms of e increasing rockfish and sablefish quotas over time, which obviously when you have more fish to catch, it affects your usage of halibut and salmon because you've got, um, it's, uh, your rate may stay the same, but yet you've got to catch more ground fish to get um, all the fish out of the water. So just like in 2012, we had 25 million pounds of rockfish. And in uh, 2022, we're looking at 50 million. So it's a significant change over time. This shows the actual harvest compared to the quota for 2021. So for POP, uh, we caught uh, of the 15,000 tons, we caught 14,600. So we left uh, about 550 tons in the water. 
For Northerns, it was much more significant where we, um, of the 1,800 ton quota, we only caught 450 tons of fish. And then for Duskies, we, the quota was 2,600 and we caught 1,000 tons. And so that really goes to the harvesting cap that we're asking for a change. Um, in terms of secondary species, um, uh, you can see that for sable fish and cod, we basically catch virtually the entire allocation. And that's where we've been tripping up on the processing cap where we had an overage um, in 2021 for sable fish. And then we had an overage in 2020 for cod. Now I'm moving on to the conservation goals, um, and the first is halibut bycatch. Um, we set halibut bycatch rates by target fishery. The rates are set on what vessel operators think, think they can achieve. Rates assure all co-op quota can be harvested, and there's individual accountability. If a vessel exceeds halibut standards, they must stop fishing until the vessel's fishing plans or practices can be assessed. We've had this happen in the past where we've required um, change in gear, change in operators, just to make sure that we can have the best behavior on the grounds. The RP uh, report uh, it has a re reward system which allows 55% of the halibut savings to be rolled over to limited access fisheries um, uh, compared to 100% under the RPP. This allows for additional ground fish catches in November and December. This shows halibut bycatch, and this is rate-based. Um, so it shows that in pre-rationalization from 1996 through 2007, we were, uh, you know, ranged, it looks like probably between 40 and 50 um, pounds of halibut per metric ton of uh, rockfish. And after rationalization, um, we are more in, uh, le less than 10 on average. Um, that, and the top is inshore and the bottom is both inshore and offshore combined. This is the halibut bycatch rates for the CVE co-ops. And this is um, the current time frame from 2000 under the either the RPP or the RP program. And you can see that the, the rates for halibut is um, right around um, high seven um, pounds per metric ton to about eight. And so in 2021, we were at 8.1, which is pretty similar to our uh, range in the past. Um, in terms of halibut allocations, when we move from the RPP to the RP, um, we our uh, cap was reduced to 87.5% of our historical usage, which resulted in a 27 ton metric ton savings. And then because of the rollover savings, where it's 55%, 45% can't be used in any other fishery that resulted in a 50 ton savings. So in 2021, a total savings was 77 metric tons, not for use in any other fishery. Moving on to Chinook salmon, uh, Amendment 97 became effective January 1st, 2015. It placed a hard cap of 1,200 fish on the CV rockfish program sector. Estimates based on at-sea samples, just it's not a census like in Pollock. So it makes, while that may be representative, um, the estimates aren't as precise as they would be with a census count. Um, the, we, the, the avoidance plan that we've come up with is we do a slow start to test the fishing grounds. Each co-op is allowed either one or two vessels at one time at the start of the fishery. Individual vessels should look salmon bycatch standards and they're enforced by fish tickets, not by observer data. Um, the co-op avoidance plan assumes that controlling individual vessels behavior behavior via fish tickets will keep the co-op under the sector Chinook cap. This actually shows the PSC for Chinook for the co-ops um, uh, from the 2007 through 2021 
uh, period. And it just shows how variable that the salmon can be. And I'll note in 2020, <laughs> there was 52 salmon attributed to the um, sector. And in 2021, it was 1,290. And we did exceed the cap, the 1,200 um, fish cap in 2021. Um, but it happened on November 13th and the fishery ends on November uh, 15th. Um, we've been involved with a cooperative research um, a rockfish genetics project from 2013 through 2020. Um, uh, we've uh, partnered with the observer program, the Alaska region and the NIMS genetics lab in Off Bay along with um, fishing game. Uh, so far, we've um, collected 6,333 uh, salmon landed over the eight years, of which 98.4% were genetically um, sampled. I would note that this is a full census, so every Chinook that is landed it has the Chinook or the genetics done. We've also um, done coded wire tags and otoliths and fin cuts. Uh, with the goal of trying to understand the hatchery component of what we catch, we chose not to continue the project in 2021. And this shows the genetics that we have. You're going to see more of this in June when the Off Bay guys show up, but it shows that overall from 2013 through, and that should 2020, that the bulk of what we catch is from areas of uh, Chinook salmon hatcheries with 94.8% uh, coming from Southeast BC and the West Coast and Canada. And that's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Bonnie. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that will bring us to public comment. We have two signed up to testify. Uh, first up is Rye Pengilly and then uh, Linda Benkin. Uh, Mr. Pengilly, I believe you are scheduled to testify remotely. Are you with us? Yes. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. And just a reminder that uh, individuals and companies have uh, three minutes and organizations have six minutes. I believe we'll have a timer going. Uh, I will. Uh, yep, there it is. And I will uh, let you know if uh, your time is up. So with that, uh, Mr. Pengilly. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, through the chair. Uh, hello, I'd like to thank the chairman Keenan and members of the council for this opportunity to share some of the work that Eat on the Wild Side is doing regarding workforce development and the commercial fishing industry. A uh, copy of this presentation has been submitted to the online agenda for your reference. My name is Rai Pengeli. I'm originally a commercial fisherman from Kodiak, Alaska. And over this last year, I've been working with the Deep Sea Fishermen's Union and Fishing Vessels Owner Association to develop an apprenticeship program under their joint nonprofit, Eat on the Wild Side. In February of 2022, Eat on the Wild Side launched the Inbreaker Program, a registered apprenticeship program for the commercial halibut and sable fish fisheries. The program was developed with the support of employers and labor to provide training to the next generation of commercial fishermen and address the shortage of skilled labor within the industry. Today, I would like to share with the council and those attending a description of the program and other efforts by Eat on the Wild Side to address the workforce shortage in the maritime industry. In November of 2021, Eat on the Wild Side opened applications and began recruiting for the Inbreaker program with applicants from around the country applying for an opportunity to work as deckhands in the commercial fishing industry. Applicants that passed the initial screening interview were then placed into an online portal that vessel owners and skippers interested in the apprenticeship could access allowing them an opportunity to contact and interview the candidates. Applicants that secured a hiring commitment and position for the upcoming season were eligible to participate in the apprenticeship program. In the beginning of February, the successful candidates gathered in Seattle to commence training for the apprenticeship program, starting with the related technical instruction portion of the apprenticeship, 
where over three weeks, apprentices took fishery-specific and general maritime courses. The fishery-specific courses were developed by Eat on the Wild Side in collaboration with fishermen from the Deep Sea Fishermen's Union and Fishing Vessels Owner Association, and resulted in the development of two novel commercial fishing courses for the apprenticeship program. The onshore course that introduced apprentices to the technical skills used in commercial fishing, and the at-sea course that gave apprentices the opportunity to practice hauling and setting fishing gear out on the water. After completion of the fishery-specific courses, apprentices then traveled to Port Townsend to begin general maritime courses through Washington Sea Grant. These courses included a diesel engines repair and maintenance course, marine electrical, marine hydraulics, first aid at sea, and a U.S. Coast Guard approved at sea safety course. After apprentices completed the related technical instruction, they met with their sponsoring vessel to begin preseason boat work and prepare for the beginning of the fishing season and the on-the-job training stage of the apprenticeship. During on-the-job training, the apprentice is hired by the vessel and paid a reduced crew share that increases progressively as they gain competency in the skills of the occupation. The first cohort of apprentices from the Inbreaker program have just begun on-the-job training, and we have apprentices placed on vessels in both Washington and Alaska. <clears throat> Once these apprentices have been deemed competent in all the skills outlined in the apprenticeship standards and voted to a full share by the vessel's crew, they will have completed the on-the-job training and thus finished the apprenticeship and prepared for a career in commercial fishing. As the Inbreaker program was under development, we quickly saw that demand for the recruitment and training programs exceeded our industry alone, and that there was strong demand from other areas of the commercial fishing industry and the maritime industry as a whole. At this time, Eat on the Wild Site is actively working to expand the Inbreaker program into other gear types and is partnering with the Freezer Longline Coalition and Alaska Bering Sea Crabbers to develop a program for their members. Additionally, members of the maritime industry outside of commercial fishing have partnered with Eat on the Wild Side, including employers and unions from the passenger ferries, towing, and transportation industries to participate in the development and implementation of apprenticeship programs for a variety of careers in the maritime industry. Eat on the Wild Side is currently working with these employers and union partners to develop an able-bodied seaman apprenticeship that we plan to launch in early 2023. To support the development of a broad range of maritime training programs, Eat on the Wild Side acquired Crawford Nautical School, a local maritime school, to develop Crawford Nautical Training, a subsidiary of Eat on the Wild Side. With this acquisition, Eat on the Wild Side will be able to provide Coast Guard approved training for maritime occupations on deck, in the engine room, and in the wheelhouse. We're also working to provide this curriculum in the most affordable and accessible manner on exploring a hybrid approach of in-person and online courses. In December of 2021, Eat on the Wild Side helped to form a maritime sectoral partnership within Washington, composed of employers, labor unions, and community organizations, with the goal of providing accessible and affordable partnership for a variety of career paths within the maritime industry, and to enhance recruitment efforts for maritime with a focus on underserved communities. Through our involvement with these organizations, Eat on the Wild Side is helping to ensure that the commercial fishing industry is represented in Washington statewide workforce development efforts. I'd like to thank the council again for this opportunity to share the work Eat on the Wild Side is doing for workforce development in the fisheries and allow for any questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pangeli, for your testimony and uh, sharing the program with us. Let's see if there are any questions. Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Pengilly. Um is, is this program linked up at all with the Washington State um, Maritime Blue Initiative? No, we have not um, linked up with them for this program specifically, but we're aware that they're working uh, in this broader maritime uh, coalition and hope to work with them soon on, on, on programs like these. Thanks. Um, second question is, um, does your initiative have um, goals for um, diversity um, in terms of d diversity in terms of um, the workforce that you're bringing through? Yes, and, and that is a big part of what we're doing uh, by partnering with these community organizations is to be able to uh, recruit from these underserved communities um, and we're working with native corporations and um, working to get access and provide this affordable program to um, help diversify the industry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Mr. Mesereau. 
Yeah, thank you for this. It's uh, looks like it's a really great program. I tried to do something similar when I worked at Avtech here in Alaska, and uh, I was glad to hear you um, comment about the Able Seaman program because it seems like there's a connection between uh, the seasonal occupation of fishing and the possibility for crew members to work in the maritime industry in the off season. Were you considering offering this able seaman training to these same people that are going to be uh, entering these uh, fisheries? Or was that just a separate um, training that would be offered to anyone that was interested? Well, it would be um, a, a separate training, but the, like you're saying, there's definitely some overlap there. Um, we're, we're using parts of the able-bodied seamen uh, apprenticeship and integrating that into our existing inbreaker program. Um, and then we're also aware that there that this program will be helpful for um, the commercial fisheries, the able-bodied seamen apprenticeship, that is. It will be helpful for those in the commercial fisheries uh, attain wheelhouse statuses and things like that and, and move um, uh, and help create a peer, career pathway in that way. Thank you. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. How many applicants did you initially receive and then how many were you able to support through the apprenticeship part of the program? Um, there were, I'd have to look at the number again, but there was, I would say close to 30 uh, or so that applied. Um, and we had, of those applied, there were some that were uh, paired with vessels and we had about a 66% uh, retention of apprentices uh, and, and have them paired with vessels and, and out on the water now. Mr. Down. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Pingoli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, my, my question is, I, I've, I've read your, uh, I've read through your, your presentation here that you've given us and and um, had some conversations with your folks and it's just such a great first I just want to say it's such a great thing to uh, have eat on the wild side. Um, uh, you know head in this direction I think it's really great and I think you're going to find wide approval and and applause from the Council members here, my question is uh, adding to Mr Twites comment about maritime blue but what is it that the is there anything the Council can do to support you or the folks from Washington State or Alaska can do to support your organization, or is there anything that you're asking us here, or is this just uh, informational at this point? Uh, I mean, at this time, it is more informational, but um, definitely support um, from from the commercial fishing industry um, will be helpful as we, um, you know, apply for larger grants um, and just kind of an adoption of this method. Uh, to replace kind of the antiquated uh, recruitment process that the fisheries um, has been doing for a while and um, just the general support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I don't see any further questions. Thanks again, Mr. Pengilly. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Okay, Linda Benkin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, sorry. Uh, Linda Benkin testifying for Alaska Longline Fishermen's Association and also um, the Alaska Sustainable Fisheries Trust. I wanted to um, thank the agency, mostly coming up just briefly to say how much we appreciate seeing the report to the fleet, again, published for the IFQ fisheries. That report has been really important in our work to help bring young people back into these fisheries. Um, similar to what you hear be heard before, we run a crew apprentice program out of Sitka, helping young people get started in these fisheries and get jobs on boats. We run twice annual workshops um, to support particularly our young fishermen in understanding some of the challenges and opportunities in the fisheries. And we've deployed um, a fair bit of money, one and a half million in entry level loans to help young people from our coastal communities get started. The report to the fleet's really important to our work to help inform where that investment 
needs to go, where the needs are, what's happening with the demographics of quota share distribution and ownership in the communities around Alaska. I would say our one um, uh, complaint or criticism of the report is that it only goes back to 2017 and it's really hard to see what the trends are over time um, when this program has in, been in place for such a long time when we look at that kind of snapshot. I understand from the agency, they're, they're starting to gear up for another big review of the IFQ program. And at that point, more information, more of that historic information and trend will be brought forward. Um, and just to lend our full support um, to doing that review and providing the information that shows what those trends are with where quota is moving, um, particularly as we look at quota ownership in rural communities, indigenous communities, um, inside, outside Alaska, and help the council to focus its actions and our efforts to try and help support people from our communities in accessing these fisheries. So thanks, that's all I have, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Benkin. Are there any questions? Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, that concludes public comment. Um, there's no action required on any of the, uh, the B items at this point. Um, happy to entertain anything that council would wish to discuss or potentially flag for staff tasking. Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I referenced these already, but just thought I'd re-reference and just some try to do some thinking with individual council members through the meeting and then at staff tasking uh, maybe provide some thoughts about uh, next steps relative to um, both the um, outreach efforts that are under discussion with um, Alaska Natives organizations and the Yukon and Kuskokwim. Also um, next steps regarding the cultural awareness training that we got and how those might tie in to sort of our efforts to rethink some parts of our process and hoping to have some items for the council to consider for the public to provide testimony on it, staff tasking. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Anything further? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And similar to Mr. Twight, I, I've raised this before, but I, now that we've had public testimony, I, I am uh, interested in uh, the council submitting a letter uh, for the NOAA fisheries BOEM comment period on the offshore wind energy development strategic plan or the plan, I, I'm probably not getting the name right. I would like though, uh, much as Mr. Choi was suggesting for his issue uh, to take this week uh, to talk with other council members and perhaps some agency staff uh, to have a more in-depth discussion uh, in staff tasking and provide, uh, first of all, see if there is council interest in uh, developing and submitting a letter uh, for that comment period. And, and perhaps if so, providing some suggestions for the content of that letter. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This I'm, this might be evident already, but it, it seems like we were we got a presentation about improvements to the process. It's been an ongoing effort. We didn't receive testimony on that in the B reports, but there's always that opportunity under staff tasking. So just making it clear that would be our intent to address that paper and further things for evaluation um, in staff tasking. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Ms. Baker. Thank you. This really isn't uh, a tickler for coming back to staff tasking, but I, I guess I did just want to acknowledge uh, now that we've completed public testimony, the cooperative reports that we received in this agenda item. And it's, it's an annual agenda item for the council. And as, as several of the presenters noted, uh, it is an opportunity for the council and the public uh, to review the operations of the cooperative programs that 
we have implemented in the North Pacific. And I just now that we're uh, back in the hybrid meetings and getting back together, I just really encourage uh, members of the public to review those cooperative reports and, and if possible, listen to the presentations as they're made each year and, and uh, to try and understand uh, what the council's laid out in terms of those presentations. And if there are questions from the public, uh, at least from my experience, the presenters and representatives of the cooperatives have been uh, quite willing and able to uh, respond to those questions. And so just real encouragement. I'm, I'm also remembering uh, one of Mr. Cross's, Craig Cross's parting words as a council member uh, with sort of a desire to re-energize those cooperative reports. And uh, I think while we're always thinking about how to do that, I just wanted to express my appreciation for that agenda item and uh, to the presenters here today. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Anything further? All right, great. Well, let's go ahead and uh, break for lunch, come back at uh, one o'clock and pick up with agenda item C1. See you at one o'clock. Council, please come to order. Okay, we are ready to uh, begin agenda item C1. And uh, here to present that is uh, Sarah Cleaver and Abby John. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and council members. Uh, I'm Sarah Cleaver. It's good to see you all in person again. And presenting with me today is Abby John from NIMPS Sustainable Fisheries Division. Uh, we also have Alicia Miller, who's also from NIMPS, um, with us to help answer any questions. And we're presenting the IFQ omnibus analysis for final action. And first, we have a few things to turn to your attention on the e agenda. The um, e agenda has the action memo as well as our analysis, a link to the PowerPoint presentation. And then there are a couple of addendums to the analysis. Um, one just provides more information to table 47, um, and the other provides some information on crab bycatch rates um, in the Bering Sea. And the Enforcement Committee received a presentation on this action as well. So their report is attached to the E agenda, and um, we can get that uh, the presentation, um, I think, from John McCracken after we are done with our presentation. And then I also turn your attention to the 10 written comments that are included on the e agenda. So in April of 2021, the Council adopted a two part purpose and need statement and that's shown here on the screen, each paragraph speaks to one of the alternatives, so the top paragraph is in in regard to alternative two and the bottom is in regard to alternative three and so i'll 
I'll start working through alternative two today and we'll come back around to alternative three. And the, the top purpose and need reads as follows. IFQ stakeholders, the IFQ committee and NIMPS have identified regulatory revisions that could increase operational efficiency, reduce administrative burden and clarify how harvesters can meet existing regulatory requirements. In addition, the council is considering revisions to pot limits and gear tending restrictions also identified through the recent three year Gulf of Alaska Sablefish Pot Review to determine whether they are serving their intended purpose. As I said, I'll come back to um, alternative three. So there are three alternatives for the action. Alternative one is the no action alternative and alternative two consists of six different elements and sub options that would revise IFQ program regulations. Elements one, two, four, five, and six would address changes to pot gear regula uh, regulations and requirements. So my plan after providing some background on the action is to start with those elements on the pot gear requirements um, and then circle back to element three, which would authorize jig gear for Sablefish IFQ or CDQ. And then alternative three would temporarily remove the ADAC CQE residency requirement. So we'll circle back to that at the end. The alternatives are not mutually exclusive, but they're really separate actions. Um, so we'll try to take some questions as we go through um, each element and then circle back to alternative three and take questions on that one at the end. The document is split into the regulatory impact review and then the environmental assessment, but we're structuring the presentation um, in a way that I will describe the elements, uh, including the status quo and highlight some of the potential environmental and socioeconomic impacts and then Abby will provide the management, monitoring, and enforcement considerations uh, of each element as we go along. A little bit on the history of this action. In April 2015, the Council took action on Gulf of Alaska Amendment 101, which allowed the use of pots to fish sablefish IFQ in the Gulf of Alaska. And that action was in response to increased whale depredation in the hook and line fishery. And that was uh, implemented in 2016 in the first year that pot gear was legal um, in the Gulf of Alaska for sablefish IFQ was 2017. So the council's motion from that action included pot limits, gear retrieval requirements, gear specifications, and a provision to allow the retention of incidentally caught halibut, meaning that if someone is fishing for IFQ using pot gear in the Gulf of Alaska, they could only retain halibut if they also had sablefish IFQ on board the vessel. In 2020, uh, pots became a legal gear type for halibut in the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands under Amendment 118, and this allowed more efficient harvest of halibut and it was meant to reduce whale depredation of halibut and decrease the wastage of legal size halibut that was being discarded uh, in the already occurring sablefish pot fishery there. And so in that action, halibut retention in pots was not linked to the possession of sablefish IFQ as it was in the Gulf. Um, and so that essentially created what is commonly referred to as a directed or directed or targeted halibut pot fishery in the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands. So I highlight um, these particular histories to demonstrate the kind of patchwork of pot gear regulations as they relate to fishing IFQ across the different areas in Alaska. And when the council um, implemented Amendment 101 in the Gulf, they included a request for a review three years after the gear type was implemented. And as you'll recall, this review was presented to the council in April, 2021. And that summarized three to four years of, um, of fishing data from the, the new fishery. And during that action, the council heard a lot of public testimony and advisory had some advisory body discussion that highlighted aspects of fishery management that could be improved. And so 
In response to that, the council initiated this analysis that's before us today to revise several regulatory components of the IFQ program. Under alternative one, this is the status quo alternative. And so the IFQ fisheries in both areas would be required to operate as they're currently described in regulation. So that alternative is pretty straightforward. Um, the details of the status quo as it relates to each element, I'll be, I'll be describing as we walk through um, the individual elements. But there is a table on page 17 and 18 of, of the document that kind of highlights the status quo in each area side by side with the proposed action. And in general, alternative one provides less flexibility for IFQ participants um, that are fishing with pot gear um, than alternative two. And it also would provide less flexibility um, in that it wouldn't authorize jig fishing for sablefish IFQ. Some important context for uh, the analysis is that the, the Sablefish Pot Review last April highlighted the expanding use of pot gear in the IFQ fisheries. And so the figure here on the screen shows the percentage of IFQ or CDQ Sablefish catch um, by pot gear and the dramatic increase once pot gear was legalized in both the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska. And so while the use of pot gear in in the IFQ fisheries is, is increasing, there really are differences across management areas. And the um, bottom part of the figure is the Gulf of Alaska. And so you can see some of those differences in the amount of IFQ uh, catch in different areas that, that pot gear uh, accounts for. This table, which is um, found on page 36, continues to break down some of these differences and just shows the percent of sablefish IFQ that's landed by pots versus hook and line gear uh, in each area in the Gulf. So on the bottom right of the slide, you can see that in Southeast hook and line gear still accounts for the majority of sablefish catch, um, but in the Western and Central Gulf, and uh, as of the last year in Western Yakutat, pot gear has surpassed hook and line gear in terms of the percent of sablefish IFQ that's been landed. We also see a similar trend in terms of the number of vessels that are using pot gear to harvest sablefish IFQ in the Gulf. Um, this figure or table just shows that pot gear wasn't legal until 2017 there and after um, after that, we see an increase in the number of vessels using pots in all these areas, but there's still uh, a lot of vessels that are using hook and line gear to harvest sablefish IFQ, and you can particularly see that again in, in Southeast. Um, and so the next few slides continue to describe the status quo in the pot fisheries, particularly as it relates to element one, which includes slinky pots and the biodegradable panel. With the adoption of pot gear as a legal gear for sable fish uh, in the Gulf, fishermen are increasingly using lightweight collapsible slinky pots and they, um, they do use these in both areas. Um, but these, these pots reduce the amount of space on deck that's required to store them. And they're significantly lighter. And you can see this one that we have um, up in front of us here today to refer to if, if there's, uh, we need any, if we need to look at it to clarify anything about, about the gear type. Um, and so the, the development of these pots has enabled harvesters with smaller boats to be able to transition to using pot gear without having to drastically alter their vessels as they would with the larger and heavier conventional pots. And so the diagram on the right here in the slide shows the components of a slinky pot. And we have a few different versions of uh, this figure to reference as we walk through these specifications.
NIMS clarified that slinky pots may be used in the IFQ fisheries as long as the pot is equipped with a biodegradable panel that is at least 18 inches in length that is parallel to and within six inches of the bottom of the pot. And that is sewn up with untreated cotton thread no larger than size 30. And so uh, while slinky pots don't have a distinct top or bottom because of their shape, NIMS concluded that it is possible to configure the pots in order to comply with this regulation. Um, so each 18 inch panel has to be sewn into the mesh that's covering the frame of the slinky pot on the curved surface of the pot. So in front of me, this would be on the green part um, on the, the larger part of the, of the pot, not on either end. And um, so this is also shown in this figure on the left here, especially for our people that are um, tuning in online. There's a white string in this photo on the blue pot um, and that's the biodegradable panel that's sewn in there. And so NIMS created a, an FAQ that's posted online in order to clarify this current regulation. The point of that regulation uh, is it's intended to reduce ghost fishing because if the pot is lost, it's expected that the thread would break after a certain amount of time. Uh, and that's to allow organisms that are caught in the pot to escape through that opening that's left behind. Um, and this is, is similar to the mechanism that's used in, in conventional pots. So many, um, if not all of the slinky pots that are currently manufactured are designed with two different doors one on either end so that one door can be tied shut and then the other one can be used as a dump door. And so that's a door that's um, tied shut when the pot is deployed and then it opens up to empty the catch. And so the door that stays tied shut and on the PowerPoint slide, that would be A, um, that's designed to have a biodegradable twine threaded around the door. Um, which would keep the door shut while it's fishing, but that thread is meant to break apart after a certain amount of time as well um, if the pot is lost in order to pre prevent ghost fishing. So a different type of mechanism than, um, than what's currently allowed. And the reason that these pots are designed this way with the biodegradable twine threaded around the door is because it allows the weight of the catch to be distributed in such a way that it's not straining on a uh, piece of breakable biodegradable twine as it would if the twine were sewn into the mesh. And so you can see this um, in the photo on the left, the load of the fish is really borne by the webbing. And some of those familiar with the fishery have indicated that um, if they cut the mesh to sew in the biodegradable panel, this can actually cause premature failures when the weight of the fish is hauled up. Um, and so if that cotton thread fails, it can actually zipper along the pot, which compromises the whole structural integrity um, of the pot and you can lose your catch. So that current regulation that I was describing earlier um, stipulates a panel that's biodegradable and NIMS interpreted this to be different than what has been called this door latch method that's shown in A which wraps the pot door closed. And we had um, NIMS OLE review the regulation and with other agency input, it was determined that the method shown in A does not meet the current regulatory requirement. So in response to that determination, um, for now, the regulation has been met by industry um, by sewing in one or two of those biodegradable panels into the side of the slinky pot. So again, this, this part, the large part in green here um, and shown on the screen in, uh, by letter B. And so there are some costs in terms of time and money to cutting the mesh and sewing in the thread and they're relatively minimal, but these costs um, fall on fishery participants and they can build up, particularly if someone has to convert hundreds of their pots to comply with that regulation. So that brings us to element one of 
our action alternative number two, which would revise regulations to allow the use of biodegradable twine in the door latch or in the pot tunnel. So this would mean allowing the method either here on the right, which shows white twine tied around the pot door or allowing um, the method on the left, which is what's required under current regulations. So this is the biodegradable panel kind of threaded through the mesh. This element could provide IFQ participants who use slinky pots with flexibility to choose a particular gear specification that's most effective for their operation. And the additional benefit here um, to those participants is that there wouldn't be any additional time or money burden to trying to adjust their gear to comply with these current regulations. And there's less potential um, for gear malfunctions and losing their catch. Because the purpose of a biodegradable um, escape panel is to prevent ghost fishing, as I described earlier, the impacts relevant to ghost fishing are what we've really tried to address in this analysis. And the main thing to note here is that the efficacy of this escapement mechanism is not well understood. And the efficacy of the status quo mechanism is also not very well understood. There's not a lot of information on um, what went into that biodegradable panel regulation to begin with. And so impacts to target or non-target species are really dependent upon whether this biodegradable twine breaks in such a way that fish and other organisms can escape. And so the current assumption is that the status quo biodegradable panel is effective and that's based on, on the few studies of breaking strength of the twine that we've looked at. Um, but any changes in the biodegradable panel that would increase the likelihood that organisms in the pot can't escape could have impacts on target or non-target species. We also highlight, um, so we had our enforcement committee last week and um, we heard about a new state proposal and some concerns um, about the, the, the door not opening under this new method. Um, if the pot gets stuck in rocks, for example, then the door wouldn't be able to open. Um, and if, if anyone has interest in kind of me showing how the pot works, I'm happy to do that too. But basically, um, the, the state's proposal is still in development, and now there are discussions that we've been having um, with those at ADFNG to um, try to make sure we're all on the same page about the impacts of different types of biodegradable panels and sharing information. Um, so that's in development, and, and we're kind of tracking it as it goes along. But there were some concerns there that were highlighted to us that were new to us. Um, before we move to the management monitoring and enforcement, I wanted to check if there are questions. Thanks. Great timing. Ms. Campbell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Sarah. So when you say concerns were identified, when I read the enforcement committee minutes, I felt as if they were trying to tell us that regulations could diverge between federal and state waters and that the state could potentially have more restrictive requirements for pots in their waters than those that are used in federal waters. Um, and I, is that what you mean when you say concerns identified? Because that doesn't seem especially problematic to me. So I want to be clear about the use of the word concerns. Through the chair, yeah, um, Ms. Campbell, thank you for the question. So to clarify, there were a couple things. The first was that um, the state was concerned, and I think some of the some of the people that were on the committee discussed that there were concerns of that if the pot were stuck in such a way, like in between rocks or something, uh, in such a way that the door could no longer open, even if the panel were to degrade, then fish that are stuck in the pot wouldn't be able to get out. And so that was one concern that was highlighted to us that we hadn't heard about before. And then the second part that you mentioned um, about 
inconsistent regulations was also highlighted. And I think Abby was going to discuss that when she talked about our um, enforcement concerns. All right, thank you for that explanation. I think I'm, I'll be looking for, for further clarity as we talk through this about uh, the magnitude of a concern about a situation where one pot gets stuck in the rocks and the escape me mechanism. To, I mean, that's just, <clears throat> on my list of concerns, you know, that's sort of, it's not in the top 10, but I, but, um, but I would be very interested in hearing more. Mr. Kerland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate you touching on the efficacy of the escape mechanism. And I, I guess I'm just curious about uh, whether there's empirical information about the, the twine breaking down, the time frame, that sort of thing, because it, it um, seems fairly important to address ghost fishing. Can you speak to that, please? Through the chair, yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Curlin. So I think we mentioned um, in the analysis a few of these, there were some, some old studies, I think maybe done in the 80s about the breaking down of biodegradable twine. Um, and I, we think that that's where the original mechanism came from or was developed, or it was trying to kind of mimic some of the regulations that, um, that the state had at the time. But there haven't been any studies that are really specific to this gear type and the way that twine um, or string, what you're using, uh, the way that it's wrapped around certain different gears and what would allow a, uh, a pot door or some other type of opening to allow organisms to escape. So I think there's kind of this standard for the amount of time that the biodegradable panel um, or the, the twine degrades. And I've talked to a few people that said that it's really clear that that twine does break down after a certain number of days and people have to replace that twine because um, it does start to degrade. But in terms of how these different forms of biodegradable panels are functioning, there, have, there haven't been any new research studies um, and it's just really not, not tested. Please continue. Good afternoon, members of the council. Abby John with the National Marine Fisheries Service. So for management, monitoring, and enforcement considerations for element one, we've addressed this in two parts. For the first part, as slinky pots are an allowable gear type and their use is increasing, NIMS is working to collect more data. For updates to data collection since initial review, first for e-landings, a new pot type was added to identify slinky pots in catch data at the trip level in the fall of 2021. The rollout of this is going well so far. Second, the observer program is working on a special project this year to collect data on pot gear attributes, including type, mesh size, escape rings, and other components. Pot data are needed if this is to be added to stock assessments in the future. For the second part, and for implementation of this element, to revise regulations to allow the use of biodegradable twine in the door latch or pot tunnel, as interpreted per the council motion, an exception would be added in regulations, which would allow the use of biodegradable twine in either the mesh or wrapped around the door and frame. This is prescriptive, although, however, because it is specific to where the bio twine escape mechanism would be authorized. Um, after a demo and productive discussion in the AP for how escape mechanisms could be included on one end of the pot, a different approach to this element could be to recommend to NIMPS to write regulations that allow for some variations and innovations in where the biodegradable twine escape mechanism could be placed. This would mean focusing on a performance standard where the biodegradable twine would break and allow for escapement regardless of where it is placed on the pot. Um, also noting that this exception would apply only to IFQ fisheries and would not apply to non-IFQ CDQ groundfish fisheries such as Pacific cod. And then lastly, circling back to the state's Board of Fisheries proposal for escape mechanisms, 
Um, just noting that the proposal is still under development. However, if there are mismatches in regulations, noting that there may be compliance concerns for participants in both the federal and state fisheries. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it, it are, is from the, I can't see around that big thing. Um, the management and enforcement concerns, and I'm sorry, I don't have that right at my fingertips, but is there a suggestion then to write, should the council take action on this, that element differently than is proposed in our current suite of alternatives? For, to add more flexibility, I'm, I might've missed that point. Uh, through the chair, um, I guess I could phrase it as a question. Um, if the council's intent is to write a regulation that is prescriptive, such as the how the element is currently written, or if the council's intent is to be open to some innovations and flexibility in the um, in the in the regulation. Just a quick follow up for a clarification. Then, should the council act on the exact language that's in our element under alternative two? Would that look very prescriptive and we should add something in addition to provide the flexibility in the regulation? Through the chair, Ms. Kimball, um, the element is currently written is, is likely to be prescriptive in regulations. That's correct. Um, so any additions to how the element is written or um, rewording to allow for some flexibility uh, could be an option. Please continue. All right, Mr. Chairman. So that brings us um, to element two of alternative two. And this element proposes that regulations be revised to remove the requirement in the Gulf of Alaska that requires a cluster of four buoys and remove the flagpole requirement, but retain the LP marking requirement, which is for long line pop. So where this comes from is that when implementing Gulf of Alaska Amendment 101, the council had recommended several gear specifications that were meant to distinguish pot longline gear from other fixed gear when setting gear on the fishing grounds. And so these specifications included the four buoy clusters, flagpoles, and radar reflectors. And so the four buoy clusters and flagpoles were really intended to reduce unintentional gear conflicts in the Gulf by enhancing visibility of the gear ends to other vessels. And the thought was that using multiple buoys should help keep the gear, um, the gear marker above the water line in stronger currents. At the time of, of Amendment 101, the council had received a lot of testimony that um, that these marking requirements would not impose a substantial cost on vessel operators and that these marking tools were commonly used by operators that deploy pot gear um, in other fisheries in Alaska. And so since then, and I think this is one of the things that came up when we had the Sable Fish Pots review, but further testimony and engagement in, in IFQ meetings and council meetings has uh, indicated that this additional gear increases demand on deck space, particularly for um, the smaller vessels that are entering this pot fishery or that are attempting to switch to pot gear from hook and line gear. Because gear is obviously a major cost for fishermen, um, anything, that, anything that prevents conflicts or otherwise reduces the likelihood of gear loss is a benefit that um, often can merit moderate additional expenditures, but that said, the costs of extra gear um, only accrue to the harvester and the additional costs may fall more heavily on operators that have smaller gross revenues. Another impact of element two is that um, gear could potentially be less visible without this extra gear. However, I'll note that several times throughout the development of this action, we've heard a desire from industry to um, really clarify that they still want both ends of pot long line strings to continue to be marked so that it is visible. Uh, 
For the management and enforcement considerations, uh, very briefly, for implementation of this element, it would remove the above requirements from regulations but retain the LP marking requirement. Um, and this element would only change regulations for vessels fishing in the Gulf. So that um, brings us to element four, which would revise the pot gear configuration requirements to remove the nine inch maximum width of tunnel opening so that it does not apply when a vessel begins a trip with unfished halibut IFQ on board. There's also an option to remove the nine inch maximum width of the tunnel opening for vessels targeting IFQ stable fish. So the first part of element four would apply to the Gulf of Alaska and the option would apply to both the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands. And um, so we'll kind of break this down and see, see what it all means here. During the development of Amendment 101, um, the sable fish pots in the Gulf, the council was cognizant of concerns that were surrounding changes to the traditional nature of the directed halibut fishery, which has historically been prosecuted with hook and line gear. And the regulations currently require that each pot used to fish for ground fish must be equipped with a tunnel opening, which is shown in B on the slide, that's no, inch or, no larger than nine inches by nine inches. That nine by nine inch tunnel opening is often referred to as a halibut excluder, as it was originally intended to reduce incidental catch of halibut while fishing with pots. And so as these fisheries have evolved and hook and line fisheries have experienced increased whale depredation, the desire for, um, for some fishery participants to exclude halibut from pots has also changed. Removing this requirement in the Gulf of Alaska would allow fishermen to target larger halibut and potentially larger sable fish more effectively. At the council's April 2021 meeting, the council discussed the need to be proactive about whale depredation issues and how getting ahead of the whales um, in terms of depredation of halibut on hook and line gear could prevent wastage of halibut and be beneficial to fishery participants. And so the council noted that, um, you know, it might, it might only be a matter of time before depredation of halibut on hook and line gear in the Gulf increases to levels similar uh, to similar levels experienced in the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands or by the sablefish fishermen in the Gulf. And those with um, a knowledge of the fishery and out on the grounds have noticed that the whales have already become problematic in, in certain areas. Element four allows a vessel that begins a trip with unfished halibut IFQ to use a tunnel opening larger than nine inches, similar to the requirement that's in the Bering Sea. And the difference between this and the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands regulation is that a vessel would still not be allowed to retain halibut nor use a larger tunnel opening unless they also possess sablefish IFQ um, in the Gulf of Alaska. And so there's, there's a kind of a lot of a big patchwork of regulations with this element and created um, some diagrams here to try to help understand this mismatch of, of regulations across both areas. So this demonstrates kind of where and how tunnel opening exemptions would apply. Um, we have pots in, that are used in the IFQ fisheries in both the Bering Sea and um, the Gulf of Alaska. And these pots shown on the screen here are more conventional pots, but this, this could very well be slinky pots. There are three aspects that we're looking at here of element four. The first is um, retaining sable fish and retaining halibut and whether or not we can use a tunnel opening larger than nine inches. So that's my graphic for that larger tunnel opening. And what we have under the status quo right now is that we can retain sable fish IFQ in pots in both the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska. 
we can retain halibut in pots in the Bering Sea, either with Sablefish IFQ or on its own. So if I only hold halibut IFQ, I can retain that halibut in a pot in the Bering Sea. And we can also use tunnel openings that are larger than nine inches uh, if we have unfished halibut IFQ on board in the Bering Sea. In the Gulf of Alaska, we can retain halibut in pot gear, but only if we also have sablefish IFQ. So that's our status quo, what we're working under under our status quo. Under element four on its own, so without the option, someone would be able to use a tunnel opening that is larger than nine inches uh, if they have unfished, if they begin a trip with unfished halibut IFQ. This would, they would still only be able to retain this halibut if it's linked to uh, sablefish IFQ as well. Under element four with the option, there are a few different things that would happen. So first, someone in the Gulf of Alaska could use a tunnel opening larger than nine inches if they were fishing sablefish IFQ with pot gear. And this same thing would apply in the Bering Sea. So if I were in the Bering Sea using pot gear, I could use a tunnel opening larger than nine inches, uh, even if I only have sablefish IFQ on board the vessel. However, even under um, element four with either option, if I wanted to retain a halibut in a pot in the Gulf of Alaska, I still would not be allowed to unless I had both halibut and sablefish IFQ. So there's a real patchwork going on and I just wanna make sure that um, everyone's clear on, on the differences between the element with and without the option as well as the status quo. As far as impacts of element four, uh, allowing participants to better target halibut and pot gear with a larger tunnel opening would increase operational efficiency as participants wouldn't be required to deploy two different types of gear to target um, each IFQ species. And many of the, the participants in the sablefish IFQ fishery are also halibut IFQ holders. So there's a table, table 421 shows that there were over 600, I think it was 617, 617 quota shareholders um, in the Gulf that held both sablefish and halibut IFQ as of 2021. So requiring a vessel to use a different size tunnel opening for different IFQ species can unnecessarily restrict fishery participants um, and reduce their operational efficiency by requiring different gear specifications to be used when harvesting separate IFQ species that could otherwise be retained simultaneously. The conversations, some of the conversations with those that are um, involved in this fishery indicate that there are some IFQ fishermen who would benefit from the flexibility to use a larger tunnel opening for targeting larger sable fish. And um, they would prefer that this element not be exclusive to halibut IFQ holders. And so that's where, um, in response to this, the council added the option under element four, which would allow vessels with sablefish IFQ to use pot gear with the larger tunnel openings, uh, even if they don't concurrently possess halibut IFQ. The figure on the slide here shows the percent of total catch in sablefish pots um, in the Gulf of Alaska. And so these are pots that are using the maximum nine inch size of tunnel opening. And in general, the gear that's used to, um, the pot gear that's used to fish IFQ has less bycatch than hook and line gear. And you can see that here on the figure. So the hook and line gear is on the left of each gear and um, pot gear is on the right. And the blue is, is 
um, sable fish. And so you can see kind of some of the differences in the catch composition using those two different gear types. It's unclear to us what size of tunnel opening harvesters would use if they had flexibility to use a larger than nine inch tunnel opening, especially given the variety of um, different pot sizes and pot styles that are used in the fishery. But a change in the size of the tunnel opening could affect catch composition, both in terms of size selectivity um, of, of target species and the amount and size of incidental catch. But we don't have any quantitative data on the size and species of fish that would get harvested with different sizes of tunnel openings because um, that data is not available, it's not collected. And um, the changes to the size of the tunnel opening under element four, we think it would likely increase the number of larger halibut and larger sable fish caught as compared with nine inch pot tunnels. Um, and that's, that's not necessarily based on um, any observer data or anything that we have to track this because we don't have that information, but um, just kind of in speaking with people that are using the gear and kind of logically, um, we've heard that there are, you know, a large halibut can still fit in this nine inch tunnel, but we would expect that likely more of them and larger ones would be able to fit into a larger tunnel. Escape rings are not required by regulation, but they're commonly used in the fleet to target specific size ranges of fish. And so um, without escape rings or with escape rings that aren't appropriately sized, it's possible that vessels could experience an increase uh, in catch of smaller sable fish. But appropriately sized escape rings could mitigate some of the impacts of element four on incidental catch. And I think some, at least some of the slinky pots, so the slinky pot that's here in front of us is designed with four escape rings in it. So, um, and we have heard that they are fairly commonly being used uh, in the IFQ fisheries. Another potential impact of the option under element four is a potential for increased discarding of halibut that's caught in pots by vessels that only possess sablefish IFQ. The vessels that don't possess halibut IFQ are required to discard halibut um, as PSC. And so if a vessel that possesses only sablefish IFQ were to use a pot with a larger tunnel opening um, under the option here, and their catch of halibut increases because of that, then halibut mortality could also increase to some level. I'll also highlight though that um, we've heard that IFQ participants may be able to target one species or the other by fishing different depths or habitats, which could limit incidental catch of halibut, but I've kind of heard a a wide variety of, um, depending on what area people are fish, the amount of halibut that, that they're getting caught um, in pots or vice versa, sable fish when you're fishing for halibut. Mr. Mesro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that. Uh, my question for you is, it seems like it wouldn't be in the best interest of a fisherman to be incidentally catching halibut when they're targeting sablefish. It's just more work. And can they adjust the size of the tunnel opening if they're not intending to retain halibut? Is that the idea of this, to keep it flexible? Or is it a permanent commitment to the size of the tunnel and the gear? Through the chair, um, thank you, Mr. Mesro, for the question. So I think there's definitely an ability to be adjusting gear, and this is obviously a, a new gear type, and so there are adjustments to it um, going on. And I don't know how easy it would be to kind of switch out your tunnel opening, but um, people make gear modifications all the time, and I, I do think that uh, public testimony public testimony might be able to answer how easy it is to switch out that gear. But the point of this element as it would be in regulation is that there would be flexibility to um, you could it would just provide more flexibility to change the size of that tunnel opening um, it would not require any any specific size
for the, <clears throat> excuse me, for the management and enforcement considerations for element four, uh, we're noting that the current definition of pot gear and regulations does not differentiate between pots used to fish ground fish and pots used to harvest IFQ or CDQ sable fish. Uh, for implementation very broadly, the element without the option would bring the Gulf re regulations in line with the Bering Sea and Aleutian Island regulations for, tunnel for the tunnel openings exception, meaning that the exception that currently applies in the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands would apply similarly in the Gulf and that retention of halibut would still be tied to sablefish. The element with the option would change the regulations for both the Gulf and the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands. Element four with the option is likely easier for compliance and to enforce because it would apply more consistently across both areas and for both halibut and sablefish. And with that, it, pending any questions, I'll turn it back to Sarah. All right, so moving on to element five, the council adopted a precautionary approach by recommending pot limits for all areas of the Gulf um, as part of amendment 101. And vessels that fish sablefish using pots have to adhere to pot limits, which are specific to each sub area. And so the current pot limits across the Gulf um, are shown on the screen here for Southeast and Western Yakutat. It's 120 pots per vessel and for Western Gulf and Central Gulf, it's 300 pots. And there aren't any pot limits in the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands. Element five would change the pot limits for the Gulf of Alaska areas in uh, Western Yakutat and Southeast. And the options under alternative two are either, it would change it to either 160 pots per vessel, 200 pots or 300 pots. The, uh, the original point of these pot limits, so these, they're area specific, which allowed the council to account for the makeup of the fleet and the physical nature of the sablefish fishing grounds in each management area as the intent of the pot limits was really to cap the total amount of fishing grounds that any single vessel um, could preempt at a given time. And so the council had acknowledged that lower pot limits could be appropriate in areas where the fishing grounds are more spatially concentrated uh, or where grounds preemption was um, more pressing consideration, such as in Southeast. However, limiting the number of pots can reduce efficiency if the limit is lower than what a skipper deems optimal for his or her vessel. Um, a low limit, low pot limit could increase variable fishing costs such as fuel and time. And more restrictive pot limits may cause fishermen to turn their gear over um, more often. And so ideally a fisherman would, would use their knowledge of catch rates and fish size in a particular area to um, choose the right amount of soak time that selects for larger fish, but allows them to keep rotating and rebating their strings of, um, of long line gear. I'll highlight the, um, the element six first, and then walk through some of the impacts of elements five and six together, since they're really um, kind of interrelated and very similar. So the current gear retrieval requirements in the Gulf are shown here and in Southeast, catcher vessels have to remove their gear from the fishing grounds when making a sable fish landing. So that's the most restrictive gear retrieval requirement in the Gulf. And catcher processors in Southeast have five days um, to remove their gear. In Western Yakutat and the Central Gulf, the gear retrieval requirements are five days. And in the Western Gulf, it's seven days. And in the Bering Sea, there are not any gear retrieval requirements. So this element would either remove these requirements entirely, which is option one, or it would increase the amount of time that gear can be left on the grounds to either seven days in all areas of the Gulf, which is option two, or um, there's also a sub option 
of three days in southeast. And similar to the pot limits, um, gear retrieval requirements were primarily meant to limit a vessel's footprint on the fishing grounds. So between the pot limits and the gear retrieval requirements, you're really looking at um, limiting kind of the space and time that, that fishing vessels and their gear can take up. So since implementation of the Gulf um, of POTS for Sablefish IFQ in the Gulf, there hasn't been any systematic data collection on preferences of gear retrieval requirements, but we've heard testimony and highlighted in the review some of the challenges that pot fishermen are experiencing in the Gulf with these gear retrieval requirements. And one of those such challenges is bad weather. So if bad weather comes up, it could make it unsafe for fishermen to haul their pot gear um, and bring it back in. And this is particularly an issue for vessels that um, are using conventional pot gear as the weight of those pots and the space needed on deck can increase stability issues and risk. But obviously it's also an issue for small vessels that um, would have a harder time out in, in bad weather. Ms. Cleaver, Ms. Campbell has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Cleaver, I was just wondering if you could speak to whether anything in your analysis would inform me about the council's decision in Southeast outside to have more restrictive gear retrieval requirements for catcher vessels than for catcher processors. Through the chair, Ms. Campbell, that is a great question. So. Uh, when we looked into the history of the catcher processor requirement, because I went back to Amendment 101 and could not find that um, in the council's motion. And so I think this was something that was added at the proposed rule or the final rule stage. And I'm not sure the process of how that came about, but for the, mo for the action um, in front of us here today, uh, the, the way that we have um, interpreted this element is that the council would be able to modify um, modify the gear retrieval requirements there as well. The only information that I have on the catcher processors or uh, on catcher processors that would help you make a decision is that in Southeast, so there are only three catcher processors in the Gulf of Alaska that are that have harvested sablefish IFQ and none of them have landed in Southeast. And so that's that's all the information on that specific piece that I have for you. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Cleaver, there's, you, you sort of reminded us that this is one of, uh, sort of a suite of re, um, regulations that are designed to sort of, I think in your words, you know, reduce the footprint of the vessel on the fishery. And it, as I was thinking about that, it occurred to me that there's probably sort of an inverse relationship between the effect of regulations that reduce the footprint on the fishery and what happens to the carbon footprint. Um, the things that reduce fishery footprint probably increase carbon footprint. And I'm sort of throwing that out as a speculation. And the question is, um, has staff been able to sort of, I don't think there's anything in the analysis, but has staff given any thought to that? And if we were to incorporate carbon footprint as one of our sort of considerations, um, in making decisions about this, um, is is there a is there actually an inverse relationship as I've posited? Through the chair, Mr. Twight, um, another great question. So, I you're correct. There's nothing specific to the carbon footprint um, in the analysis, but one of the things that can maybe help to inform that is. Is and I think you you will hear in testimony. So I don't want to speak too much off the cuff. But when we were doing this analysis and have talked to stakeholders, it seems like it's really it really varies based on the fishing operation. So we have heard that if you have a higher pot limit, um, you could potentially go to the fishing grounds, set a whole bunch of pots 
fish and get out of there faster. Um, that is kind of one side of, of what we've been hearing. So you could, in theory, increase efficiency in that way, and then you might spend less time um, or spend less fuel kind of going back and forth and going around fishing grounds if you can kind of get it all done at once. I think there's a lot of variety in terms of how much effort it takes to fish your IFQ. And so ultimately, I think that effort is, is capped by your IFQ. And so people want to get that fish and want to get their fish out of the water. Um, however, that's going to be done, whether that takes many sets with fewer pots um, or a few large sets with a lot more pots. I think it, there isn't specific data on it that, that could inform us in terms of our, our carbon footprint, because I do think there is such a variety of operations. Um, in terms of the gear retrieval requirements, I think, again, it would depend on, on people's operations and, and how far they're going from, from port to get their fishing done. Um, but I do think that hopefully some of, of what we hear in public testimony can, can help us understand a little bit more about overall efficiency of these, um, of these operations. And I think that's, that's kind of what would inform the carbon footprint question is what, what makes our fishing more efficient. Great, please continue. So the, um, I guess we were kind of just talking about this, uh, but the, the restrictive gear retrieval requirements. So one example to kind of, uh, I had this in my notes and, and I'm reminded of it in, in response to Mr. Twight's question is that um, we've heard that it's, it's efficient for some vessels to do what's called a town soak where they like leave the gear on, their, on the grounds to fish while they go into town to sell. Um, and so some stakeholders have indicated that that's the type of thing that would actually get them off the fishing grounds faster overall. Um, and this not only allows them to potentially consume less fuel and have lower operational costs, um, but it could lead to a decrease in the potential for gear conflicts as well. And we, again, don't have data with which to analyze this, but it's likely that the amount of time on the grounds and the overall impacts of gear retrieval requirements related to grounds preemption, um, again, varies by operation, as well as the geographical area that is, um, that's being fished. So in, in some parts of the Gulf, vessels are not going as far out to, um, to fish, going, not going as far from port. So the impacts of these requirements really vary by, by area, whether in your, you're in Southeast or um, whether you're up in, in the Western Gulf. Um, I previously earlier in the presentation highlighted that there's this increase in the number of vessels using pots in, in all areas of the Gulf. And as the number of the vessels using pots increases, um, increasing the pot limits and the gear retrieval requirements could increase the potential for gear conflicts with the hook and line fleet um, and other vessels. And so there are still a lot of vessels that are using hook and line gear. Um, while pots, while the use of pots is increasing, um, there's a table on page 20 table three one that shows that so far in 2021, 529 vessels used hook and line gear and 119 used pots to harvest IFQ in the Gulf of Alaska. And so the overall number of vessels fishing IFQ uh, in the Gulf is, is overall decreasing. Um, and that's shown in both, um, I think table three one and on page on page 22 of the analysis. 
so overall elements five and six could offer this increased efficiency and there may be more potential for gear conflicts between pot and hook and line gear but the frequency of these impacts um, is uncertain and it really depends on the operations and the ability of vessels to deploy their gear um, harvest their catch and then get their gear off the ground so there's there's um, a lot of differences in that across across areas um, and the the testimony that we heard in the AP really spoke to this variety and differences across areas so hopefully the Council will benefit from being able to hear some of that same testimony today. Uh, very briefly for implementation of element five and six, this would revise regulations for both pot limits and the gear retrieval requirements. As noted for previous elements and will likely be noted in the enforcement committee notes in general consistency across areas is preferred as vessels operate in multiple regulatory areas and enforcement can be challenging for varying restrictions. audio. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the that brings us to back to element three, um, which would authorize jig gear as a legal gear type for the harvest of sablefish, IFQ, and CDQ. And this would apply to the Gulf and the Bering Sea. Most jig vessels target Pacific cod and rockfish um, and and, and a little bit of halibut, since this is an authorized gear type for halibut IFQ. Um, the jig fishery is relatively small in terms of volume, as shown here on the slide, um, but it's a key fishery in the Gulf and it provides entry level opportunity and contributes to a, a diversified fishing portfolio um, for combination fishing vessels throughout a lot of the Gulf of Alaska coastal communities. And it's a relatively inexpensive fishery to begin commercial fishing in. Um, and many, many vessels can use jig gear as it's a gear type that doesn't require a lot of space or vessel retrofitting to use. So most data on um, in the jig fishery the jig fisheries are um, confidential as there are, are a few vessels that participate in the jig fishery. But, and so because of that, there's, there's little information on who exactly may use jig gear to harvest sablefish IFQ as proposed under this action. So we've had some discussions with stakeholders that indicated um, in general, it it's, seems like mostly IFQ holders with vessels that are too small to fish pots or hook and line gear. Um, and IFQ holders that have a small amount of IFQ are those that are expected to take advantage of this opportunity. That being said, it's expected that the number of people um, that we anticipate using jig gear to harvest sable fish would likely be minimal. Um, and the minimal effort that we would expect to see to a shift to a sablefish jig fishery um, combined with the really selective nature of this gear is not likely to have any significant impacts on things like incidental catch species. Um, so this is kind of a, a narrow action that is part of this larger IFQ omnibus action. For management and enforcement considerations for element three, the analyst provided an expanded discussion on the applicability of the Gulf and Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands for the fishery management plans, allocations, and how this element would be implemented. Under the status quo, jig gear is currently authorized for IFQ halibut in the Gulf and IFQ and CDQ halibut in the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands. And for implementation, this would require updates throughout regulations, but is unlikely to require any FMP amendments. And then um, lastly, for additional regulatory considerations as recommended by the agency, uh, for daily fishing logbook requirements for vessels less than 60 feet length overall using more than one gear type, 
NIMPS would clarify these regulations so that the vessels may record trip information for both pot and hook and line gear in the same daily fishing logbook on two separate pages. <clears throat> and then lastly, for fishing effort information recorded in the DFL, fixed gear regulations are challenging to interpret for gear deployment and gear retrieval. Um, NIMS is working on an in-depth review of regulations that define these. So Mr. Chairman, we'll just check if there are any questions on alternative two before moving to the CQE alternative. Thank you, Ms. Cleaver. Ms. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I should have asked this question earlier, but I wanted to bring up something that we that we were asked about um, in the written public comment. And that was a desire by uh, somebody who fishes in 4A that we provide clarity on the ability to to really target halibut with pots on the Gulf side of 4A. And my understanding, and I'm hoping you can uh, either correct me or clarify this, is that that's not really within the scope of the analysis because in element four, the council was pretty specific that we were talking about vessels with sable, fishing sablefish IFQ, targeting sablefish IFQ. And we, we, we actually specifically built a record saying that we were not looking to create options that would allow for directed halibut fishing by in the Gulf by vessels that don't have Sablefish IFQ on board. And so I, I, I read the comment letter, I thought it was well done. I was sympathetic to the concerns, but I, so I wanna clarify whether that's something that's on the table in front of us now, or it would require some subsequent action. Through the chair, Ms. Campbell, yes. Um, thank you for that question. So I read that public comment letter as well. And I, my understanding for the interpretation of this action is that because, and I think your question is specific to element four, um, because element four is specific to sablefish pots um, or pots where you would use sablefish IFQ I believe we are using the ground for the sable fish management areas. And so that action would apply to the parts of area four that overlap with those sable fish management areas. Um, so when we were back in, I believe when the council did amendment 118, there were several actions in front of the council that were trying to deal with halibut pots in area four and different parts of the Bering Sea in area four, different overlaps. And so my understanding of this action is it would really be specific to the sable fish management areas. And so if you look on, I think page, beginning of the analysis has like our, our overlap of the maps of those management areas. So what is, in front of the council today for element four is what would fall into those ground fish management areas. So like the Western regulatory area of 610 and anywhere where it overlaps with 4A, but 4A as a whole would not be, that hasn't been analyzed as part of this action. Any further questions on alternative two? Okay, please continue. Sorry about that. So um, for alternative three, this, the council saw this as part of the uh, initial review for the IFQ omnibus back in October as well. And there aren't any big updates to this in terms of the presentation or the analysis itself from the last time you saw it, other than the analysis was updated with the most recent data um, where it was available. So starting with the purpose and need, which was developed by the council last April, 
the community quota entity program was modified in 2014 to include the Aleutian Islands. And this allowed the community of ADAC to form a CQE and purchase halibut and sablefish quota. Since the implementation of the Aleutian Islands CQE in 2014, ADAC has faced challenges being able to harvest its IFQ. The council is considering temporarily broadening who is eligible to harvest IFQ held by the ADAC CQE to provide more opportunities for more fully harvesting its allocation. And the options in front of the council under this action are either alternative one, the no action alternative, or alternative three, which would remove the ADAC CQE residency requirement for a period of five years. The CQE program was implemented in 2004, and it was meant to allow remote coastal communities with few economic alternatives to purchase and hold catcher vessel quota share in the Gulf of Alaska in order to help facilitate access to and sustain participation uh, in the commercial halibut and sablefish fisheries. And so in the final motion establishing the CQE program, the council established three performance standards that were intended to be seen as goals of the program. These are shown on the slide here. And the first one is to maximize the benefit from use of community IFQ for crew members that are community residents. The second performance standard is to ensure that benefits are equitably distributed throughout the community. And the third is to ensure that quota shares or IFQ that's allocated to an eligible community entity would not be held and unfished. So the CQE program was really intended to promote ownership by individual residents in coastal communities. Um, and, and eligible community residents have the opportunity to lease annual IFQ from the CQE. So there are um, several components to the, the regulatory definition of an eligible community resident. And the one part of that definition that is um, applicable to this action is that an eligible community resident has maintained a domicile in the CQE community for 12 consecutive months preceding the time when the assertion of residency is made. It's important to note that the criteria for residency in the existing CQE program do not appear to require that the person must have lived continuously in that community for 12 months. Rather, it is uh, residency is based on domicile. So that is having uh, had a, a principal home in the community or um, the intent to return in the intent to return to that home. A little bit on um, where this action came from. So in February of 2010, the ADAC Community Development Corporation or ACDC presented a proposal to the council to develop a CQE in area 4B, specifically in ADAC. And during discussion at that meeting, the council concluded that the 12 month residency requirement is a fundamental element of the CQE program in order to keep residents tied to the community. So in its motion in February, 2012, the council stated that the area 4B CQE must adhere to the residency requirement, but also included a five-year exemption period for the residency requirement with an effective date of March 17th, 2014, ending March 17th, 2019. And after that five-year period, the CQE is required to lease the annual IFQ um, that's derived from that CQE um, quota shares only to an eligible community resident of ADAC. And so that exemption was a significant departure from the Gulf CQE program, but the five-year exemption was allowed because the number of ADAC residents that had landed catch in ADAC in the past was really minimal and it provided time for the establishment of the CQE to try to attract individuals back into the community. So that exemption expired in 2019. And um, 
as there was an original goal in the development of that ADAC CQE to attract residents back to the community um, rather than only stay with just the current residents. Um, that was a goal, but the population of ADAC has been declining in recent years and the population and the economic vitality of ADAC are closely linked to the status of the local processor. And the council's familiar um, with this issue and, and data collection and reporting on things like employment uh, are limited in small coastal communities like ADAC. It's, it's expected that the Pacific Cod processing activity at the one ADAC shore plant likely accounts for a large proportion of local employment in ADAC. And that shore-based processor has struggled with maintaining stable operations and ownership um, in the years when the processor has been operational. Most commercial fishing deliveries to ADAC were from larger vessels from outside the area. And when these vessels offload, they may purchase provisions and fuel and the money that's spent there on goods and services by the vessels, um, by those vessels making port calls can increase uh, economic activity within the community. And so it's expected that in years when the processor is, in, is closed, uh, less economic activity occurs there. As far as um, describing the issue here and how the CQE and the economy of ADAC interact, so this analysis is very data limited, both because of the confidentiality constraints um, and just the lack of available data. So we really appreciate ACDC providing their annual CQE reports to us so that we could include some information here on this. So including, according to those CQE annual reports, um, a large amount of the CQE quota shares held by ACDC have gone unleased uh, and or unharvested in the past few years. And as shown here on the slide, um, in the past few years, the fees that are collected by ACDC through IFQ leasing have been dramatically lower than in previous years. And this impacts the available funds that the nonprofit can utilize in the development of um, fisheries infrastructure within their community. And so the, the decline in collected fees here, um, they've explained to us is due to several individuals who leased quota um, not being able to go fishing either due to difficulty in finding a vessel um, as there are a number of small, uh, a small number of available vessels for use in ADAC. Um, and another, another piece of that is that this decline in fees could also have to do with some impacts from COVID-19 on harvesting operations. We just um, can't completely piece all of that apart. But it's clear that on the slide, even before um, the COVID-19 pandemic, there were many fewer fees um, that were, that were being collected as a result of leasing IFQ. So to ensure the benefits are equitably distributed throughout the community, which if you'll recall, that was one of the three performance standards of the CQE program, ACDC has always prioritized the leasing of quota share to residents even during years when the exemption was in place. Um, and so you can see this on the slide in blue is the residents. During the five years after Amendment 102, which developed the CQE, ACDC prioritized leasing of community quelled, held quota to residents um, through their specific quota distribution criteria. And so for all but the first year, residents of ADAC were the recip recipients of more than half of the halibut quota and all of the sablefish quota that was leased. So under the status quo, there wouldn't be any change in eligible individuals who can lease from the CQE. Um, and if population trends continue, the number of eligible residents um, could continue to decrease. So the action alternative would remove this residency requirement um, for the ADAC CQE for a period of five years. And there aren't any significant impacts expected on individual participants in the IFQ fisheries as a result of this action, um, such as residents of 
of other CQ of non CQE communities, excuse me. Um, so there aren't any impacts there anticipated under alternative three as compared to the status quo and the analysis for amendment 102 which created this CQE analyzed the impacts of the creation of that CQE on existing IFQ holders and on the market. Um, so the only change from the status quo due to this action is extending the exemption or reinstating the exemption to the residency requirement. And so this, this action has, has already been done uh, under Amendment 102, it's just being extended again. And so this five-year exemption could provide one way to encourage non-residents to return to ADAC, participate in the fisheries, and eventually become residents potentially. That would lead to, or, or I guess the leasing of um, CQE held IFQ to non-residents could increase the revenue that ACDC would be able to collect and then put back into building and stabilizing the fishing economy of ADAC. This would allow more time for the community to rebuild its population um, while allowing ACDC to continue utilizing those funds to enhance the infrastructure in the community. The alternative on its own, so alternative three alone, is unlikely to revive the fishing economy in ADAC without the reopening of the processing plant. Um, things like employment and enrollment in schools are unlikely to change under alternative three when compared to the no action alternative. So there's no guarantee that a five-year exemption, even in combination with other efforts, would improve the current economic situation. But larger community benefits um, derived from a stable fishing industry in ADAC is, is tied to having stable processing operations. So the reopening of a processing plant is essential to being able to rebuild a pool of resident fishermen. Um, but this, this action um, allows, allows there to be increased incentives for vessel operators to operate out of and deliver to ADAC and the landings of leased halibut and sablefish IFQ could be crucial in ensuring that a processing plant is able to um, become established and stable, which could further assist in rebuilding the local economy. So this exemption under alternative three is one piece of, of kind of building a business portfolio that could benefit the economy of ADAC. Um, and with that, there, there weren't any management monitoring or enforcement concerns highlighted with this action um, at this time. So I'll open it up to um, questions and just thank the um, many stakeholders who kind of helped us work through some of these issues and gave us insight on the grounds as well as members of the agency that helped us develop the analysis. And as a reminder, we have the enforcement committee report as well, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you, Ms. Cleaver and Ms. John. Any further questions? Ms. Kimball. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation. I, I'm i sorry that I couldn't follow your response um, to Ms. Campbell, so I was going to try to ask it another way, and this is relative to Area 4A. Is there, is there any element or option in front of us that would make the regulations consistent throughout Area 4A with regard to the ability to retain halibut in pots? Mr. Chairman, Ms. Kimball, I'm going to double check by looking behind me at Ms. Miller because I think the answer is no, but I am double checking and yes, there's there's nothing under the table that would operate or allow that full consistency. Thank you. And then just one more question, Mr. Chair, on um, alternative three. Is there also not an opportunity um, under the current suite of alternatives and options to remove the residency requirement? in the CQE program relative only to ADAC, and I'm not presupposing that's anybody's wishes, but I just wanna clarify whether that's an option for the council under this action. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Kimball, so I think from an analytical standpoint, there, if there were, if the council wanted to do what you're saying and remove that, um, that exemption indefinitely. I don't think there's much more analytically that we could provide you 
um, than what we've provided you already in terms of data and making that decision. Um, I'll look to Alicia to see if that's a possible option. I think if the council and you know Mr. Merrill will chime in if, if this is incorrect, but I, I think that is an option for the council to, to take that action and then we can follow up with, with NIMPS if appropriate. Any further questions? Okay, all right, thank you again. On to Mr. McCracken and the Enforcement Committee report. Afternoon, Mr. Chair, Mr. members of the council, John McCracken, council staff. Uh, I'm gonna retain um, NIMS and council staff in case we get into the weeds on this. But anyway, so uh, so the, the, the enforcement committee met on March 29th, uh, 2022 virtually uh, to review C1 IFQ omnibus. Uh, Sarah Cleaver and Alicia Miller facilitated this by providing overviews of the draft final uh, action for the EA RIR for proposed IFQ omnibus attachment or amendments, uh, agenda item C1. I would say that their minutes, um, the enforcement minutes are germane to the alternative two uh, elements one through six. Uh, they do not obviously look at alternative three. So looking first at element one, committee recommended the regulations be specific to how to tie the biodegradable twine for either the hinge door or the escape panel cut uh, into the uh, pot mesh to enable the twine to break at one place, thereby allowing the entire panel or the door to open. The committee also learned that ADF and G was working with uh, wildlife troopers to develop a new regulation for slinky pots requiring two biodegradable panels sewn into the side of the pot, not the door side, which would allow for at least one opening in case the other panel is covered or, or silted in and may not open. As a result, the proposed action would be could be inconsistent with future state regulations, recognizing the federal regulation would, would require at least one biodegradable opening for pots and fish, uh, sable fish IFQ. If, either the, if the state of Alaska requires two biodegradable panels um, in the state waters, pots complying with the more restrictive state proposal could obviously be used in federal waters. The committee recommended tracking this issue and if necessary, provide suggested regulatory changes or adjustments to maintain consistency across both the state and federal waters. Looking at element two, uh, as outlined in the enforcement precepts, uh, the committee encourages uh, regulations should be as simple and straightforward as possible to seek to reduce the number of regulations where possible and improve consistency across areas. The committee noted element two would simplify both compliance and enforcement of gear marking requirements. Element three, uh, the committee had no comments uh, or recommendations for this element. Element four, the committee noted uh, that element four with the option to remove the nine inch uh, maximum width tunnel opening for vessels targeting IFQ sablefish provides the maximum flexibility and would potentially minimize or minimize challenges of enforcing the nine inch total opening. In addition, the committee also uh, noted that element four with the option improves consistency across management areas, which reduces the complexity of the regulations. The committee recognized that the removal of the nine inch maximum uh, width of the tunnel opening for vessels targeting IFQ sablefish could result in retention of larger halibut and sablefish it was noted uh, the change that changes in the bycatch of larger halibut as a result of removing this nine inch uh, maximum opening um, will be captured in the observer halibut length distribution data, which would allow the council to modify regulations uh, in the future if needed. Finally, the committee noted uh, uh, wanted to highlight the need to holistically review pot regulations to improve consistency and evaluate the tunnel size openings such as, uh, as well as recommendations or considerations for changes in biodegradable panels unnecessary for pot gear used in ground fish fisheries. Elements five and six, the committee noted once again that improving consistency across all areas is preferred as vessels operate across, across multiple areas. 
Committee also highlighted disadvantages trying to enforce restrictions on gear deployment, such as soak times or hook and pot counts, et cetera, because they are challenging to monitor during at sea boardings for vessel operators to interpret and for the enforcement officers to manage violations. To improve enforceability and compliance, the committee recommended ensuring consistency across FMPs and regulatory areas. It was noted during this discussion that the element that the original intent of reduced pot limits when compared to limits for other regulatory areas in the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea was to limit pot deployment and therefore reduce uh, gear conflicts with hook and line gear in West Yakutat and Southeast outside. Um, raising the pot limit for these areas would be counter to the original intent. The committee noted from enforcement's perspective that a no limit or a seven day limit for gear retrieval would be preferable. Finally, it was also noted that use of slinky pots will improve safety at sea due to the reduced weight of the pots relative to traditional pots and how this relates to vessel stability. Uh, there were, the committee took a look at the uh, additional considerations, specifically the daily logbook uh, requirements for vessels less than 60 using more than one gear type. The enforcement committee supports uh, the clarification in a single logbook requirement and looking at fishing effort um, or excuse, yeah, fishing ever re information reported in the daily logbook, the committee, um, from the committee's perspective, having greater clarity with regards to spatial data will be invaluable for investigating closed area incursions to get more clarity on whether there are false statements so that the committee encourages this continued in-depth review of regulations. Uh, that would be the end of the C1 um, minutes. There were uh, two other issues that they did look at, which were fairly minor. One was co-chair, so they, the committee approved co-chair um, Nate um, Nathan Logaway as a co-chair, and then they looked at um, the looking at June meeting and looking to have a, an enforcement meeting during the June meeting to look at the trawl EM issue specifically, and then hear reports from the observer report chapter, the chapter having to do with the enforcement, as well as the OLE Alaska division five-year priorities. Mr. Chairman, I am open for questions. We are. Thank you, Mr. McCracken. Are there questions on the committee report? All right, I don't see any. Okay, thank you. That concludes the entirety of the staff presentation. Oh, okay, so um, that would bring us to the advisory panel report. Sure, if we've got someone available to give that. Remind members of the public to please sign up to testify uh, prior to the end of the AP report. Good afternoon. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Not sure what I'm looking at here. Where's my partner? <laughs> All right.
and Ms. Christensen, whenever you're ready. Oh, now it's being displayed. Okay. Uh, sorry about that, Mr. Chairman. That kind of snuck up on everybody, apparently. Um, okay, for the record, Ruth Christensen and Matt Upton here to give the uh, advisory panel report on C1, the IFQ um, omnibus action. So the AP recommends the following bolded items for final action. Underlined language reflects modifications made to the council's October 2021 motion. Um, all right, alternative one should not be bolded, so apologize for that. Alternative two, uh, revise the IFQ program regulations to address the following regulatory clarifications. Element one, clarify that slinky pots are a legal gear for the IFQ fishery and CDQ fisheries and revise regulations to allow the use of biodegradable twine in the door latch or pop tunnel. Element two, remove buoy configuration, radar reflector, and flag hole requirements in regulation, but retain LP marking requirement. And for Southeast and West Yakutat, retain the flag pole requirement. Element three, authorize jig gear as a legal gear type for the harvest of sablefish IFQ and CDQ. Element four, revise the pot gear configuration requirements to remove the nine inch maximum width of tunnel opening. So it does not apply when a vessel begins a trip with unfished halibut IFQ on board. Element five for pot limits, option one, Change the pot limit for Western Yakutat and or Southeast outside to sub option B, 200 pots per vessel. Element six, gear retrieval requirements. Option two, modify the gear retrieval requirement to seven days for the Central Gulf area. Alternative three, remove ADAC CQE residency requirement for a period of five years. Um, and that main motion as amended was passed 17 to zero and Matt can take all the questions. <laughs> all right, thank you, Ms. Christensen. Let's see if there are any. Ms. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Ruth or Matt. Um, could you speak to whether there was any discussion at the AP about the gear retrieval requirement for Southeast outside? It's one of the topics that I've heard most about in public testimony, but it doesn't look like there, I, there wasn't an amendment or anything formal on that. So curious if you could characterize any discussion the AP might have had around that topic. Uh, through the chair, most of the discussion was focused on there needing to be um, some type of a requirement. We heard some concerns about if gear is left unintended and someone's offloading that creating a problem, particularly in Southeast around kind of a crowded edge. Um, and the seven day requirement was kind of um, viewed as a way to um, get at that. Um, and people were not interested in, for example, um, getting rid of any type of a um, restriction and just allowing it for it to be um, out there for longer. We had some discussion how that'd be a problem, but we heard some public testimony basically asking for maximum flexibility and not having a gear retrieval requirement. Hope that helps. Um, I'm, I'm so sorry, but it really doesn't. So in Southeast outside, you're, you're not allowed to leave your gear out at all. And it doesn't look like the AP addressed that through an amendment or anything. And, and so when you're saying you're talking about the seven day and the maximum flexibility, I, I don't see how your action really addressed that element at all. And so I was just wondering if the AP discussed it. If you didn't, that's fine. I'm not asking you to, you know, to create something for me, but I, I'm just trying to figure that piece out. Um. Through the chair, Ms. Campbell, I think that's why under element six, option two, the um, amended language, the underlying language focuses on the central gulf so that that seven day requirement would only apply to the central gulf and not Southeast. Does that make sense? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ruth. So my second question is really around some additional language under element two that has to do with retaining a flagpole requirement in Southeast and West Yak. 
And I was wondering if you could provide anything on the AP's rationale for having different marking requirements in different areas. And this is an addition that, that wasn't really analyzed. So can you let me know where you guys are coming from on that and why? Through the chair, Ms. Campbell, um, you know, similar to what Matt said about Southeast and, and, and what we heard in public comment and acknowledgement around the AP table about Southeast being a more um, congested area, it was felt that retaining um, the flagpole requirements for that particular area would help alleviate and notify um, everybody on the grounds, given that it is a more congested area. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Further questions on the AP report? Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Christensen or Ms. Christensen's designee. Um, so the AP settled in on 200. Um, I'm guessing it was a balancing act. I'm wondering if you could just describe a little bit of all the elements that went into that balancing act. Um, through the chair. So uh, the original motion had um, 160, um, which would be a change from 120. And a lot of the discussion we had was a response to some public testimony we heard for 300 pots and then others um, basically being concerned at, at more at 16 would already be an increase and around the efficiency that's involved for some of those larger operators. And I'm sure you'll hear public testimony from them as well in terms of if they don't have the ability to haul more pots, then there's some downtime during the day that leads to some efficiency concerns on their end. However, those that want to have the smaller limits, we're concerned particularly in Southeast around kind of a limited edge and with more pots potentially um, taking up more area leading to gear conflict. I don't see any additional questions. Thank you both. All right, council, let's go ahead and take our afternoon break, come back at um, oh, 310. Okay, council, please come back to order. We are ready to begin with public comment on agenda item C1. We have 12 members of the public signed up to testify. First up is Nick Johansson, then Tad Fujioka, who uh, we may need to circle back around to, and then Paul Clampett. And I believe Mr. Johansson may be testifying remotely. Are you with us, Mr. Johansson? Okay, um, we will circle back to Mr. Johansson, Tad Fujioka. Okay, then we'll move to uh, Paul Clampett. Hi, hi, can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can. This is I Tad Fujioka. This... Uh, hello. Hello, thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Tad Fujioka. I'm a Southeast Black Cod permit holder. I'm also a member of Alpha, the Linda Bankin's uh, organization. I think uh, very highly of her and, uh, and the, the Alpha organization. I hope that you do too. Um, I support uh, Alpha's recommendations regarding the IFQ omnibus amendments. Um, their pot uh, regulations that they propose are appropriate compromises, particularly here in Southeast that has a lot of different factors than Central Gulf and areas further west. The southeast, we have a very small area to fish, um, but as you see on page 37 of the regulatory impact review, um, 
more than half of the total Alaska black cod fleet fishes in Southeast. Um, and majority of boats here, here in Southeast are relatively small. We have a very large uh, troll fleet that makes up more than half of our salmon, salmon fleet. And many of these trollers are also black cotters. Um, so we have a, a small area. We have a black cod edge near the, near the coast um, and a lot of small boats with uh, these small boats. They're concentrated in small tight weather windows, which means the density of black cod boats on the ground is much higher in Southeast. Our fleet routinely communicates uh, on VHF um, regarding the location of their gear to avoid conflict. And that, uh, that won't work if vessels are in port. Um, so keep, keeping vessels on the grounds where they can communicate with one another will really help uh, eliminate gear conflict. The uh, proponents of liberalizing the regulations are doing so in the name of efficiency, but I would argue that when the quota is appropriate to biomass, the existing regulations allow for plenty high catch rates as the landings this year show. Um, the current regulations act as an insurance policy. It really keeps the stock from being subject to so often the high harvest in the event that there's an overly optimistic model forecast. We saw that in 2019 and 20 when there were fish left in the water um, because they, the quota was, was set uh, really higher than the stock around here could, could stand. And that, that's a feature, not a bug. I also support jig gear. My boat's too small to safely utilize traditional hook and line or even slinky pot gear, since gear like that takes too long to soak and to haul. Um, if weather turns bad, it's uh, hours before you can get the gear back aboard and come in where jig gear can be rapidly retrieved. Um, see jig gear as being useful to catch a small quota holding or to clean up a small amount of remaining quota. Um, it's not gonna be a big impact in any event, uh, very minor in the big picture, but be helpful to a handful of small vessel owners like myself. Uh, so appreciate if you pass that. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions for Mr. Fujioka? Okay, all right. Thanks for your testimony again. Thank you. Hey, I think we have um, Nick Johansson with us. Yeah, hello, are you hearing me now? Yes, we are. Good afternoon. Yes, hello. Hello, my name is Nick Johansson. I got the St. Dominic. I fished uh, Southeast Pots and uh, out of Craig there mostly. Anyhow, I want to speak in favor of allowing uh, pot boats to keep their pots out when they go to deliver. Um, this has really been a burden to us to have to uh, stack out every time to go deliver. It's costing us uh, cost us a lot of time, fishing time, and I'm uh, not sure as to uh, why the, our pots can't fish during bad weather and we can deliver during bad weather when uh, most of the fleet's not out there. That's uh, uh, a mystery to me and, uh, and my crew for that matter. They're, they're, you know, we have to stack out every time, which is a real, uh, a real burden to the crew. And they're asking me why, uh, why are we having to stack out? We still got uh, a lot of fish left to catch. Why can't we just uh, rebate and come back out and uh, and, uh, and and uh, and get our gear after a two or three day soak? So I'm in favor of uh, leave it, let, let, letting pot boats leave the gear out. I'm in favor of uh, like I don't know. If you if you want to make it as short as five days, if you could do that from mid April to mid September, but these longer seasons are uh, the storms last longer. So I'd say from the opening of the season to maybe April fifteenth to September fifth to uh, you know the April fifteenth, you could have like a ten day period just to let the storms blow and let the pots work. Uh, same thing at the September fifteenth to the closure. You know those storms that happened last fall were. Uh, they were pretty significant that lasted a long time and we had just had to tie the boat up and, and put the, uh, put the gear away. So, uh, I'm in favor of, uh, of that. And also I'm in favor of, uh, raising the, uh, pot limit. It doesn't take us too long to haul the 120 that we're limited to now. And uh, then we stand out there and we've had to, uh, if you add that up with the, uh, not getting a, 
not getting a town soak when we sell and then you get uh, only 120 pots and you can go through those pretty short order you know you're standing out you know you're out on the edge and and you, the guys are all ready to work and you know those pots need time to fish so thank you for allowing me to comment thank you mr johansson are there any questions All right, I don't see any. Thank you for your testimony. Okay, uh, now up is Paul Clampett. Thank you, Chairman uh, Keenan, and, and thank you, council members. Um, my name is Paul Clampett, and I'm the president of the Sable Fish and Alb Pot Association. I own the Fishing Vessel Augustine, and uh, I'm a member of the Fishing Vessel Owners Association also. Um, we support most of what the advisory panel passed concerning C1, but we disagree. What we disagree on is the proposal for the regulations in Southeast Alaska. We can live with 200 pots in West Yakutat and Southeast, but we really feel that it's a mistake not to allow us to leave the gear on the grounds when going to sell. This season, the Augustine, during the month of March in the West Yakutat area, we were only able to haul our gear once per week because of the weather. A three-day gear tendering requirement would not allow this because it takes a day to get to the gear, a day to haul and reset the gear, and a day to get back to unload. The weather would have to cooperate in order for you to make it back to the gear in time to meet a three-day requirement. We need more than three days. Seven days would be optimal. I would like to point out that our first delivery this year was for 32,000 pounds. We hauled that in one day. We only had a half a pound of bycatch. It's incredible how clean these pots are. Um, I don't know what the total bycatch was in the West, West Yakutat area, but it was very small. Overall in the West Yakutat area, we delivered 160,000 pounds of sable fish and we used 7,000 pounds of bait. If we were to use hook and line gear, we would have used three times that much bait. The current regulations requiring the removal of gear when going to town is dangerous and inefficient. It's dangerous, not just because of the weight of the pots on the boat, but dangerous to stack the pots that can hold a few hundred pounds on a rocking boat in rough weather. Also, this gear is fishing while we are in town, so we are losing valuable soak time, which causes us to be on the grounds longer than necessary. The issue is trying to be efficient. Currently, we are limited to 120 pots in West Yak and Southeast, which we can haul in about six hours. This is, causes us to twiddle our thumbs and for much of the day and leaves us on the grounds, taking up room longer than necessary using up valuable fuel and time. The gear is fishing while we are in town. And remember the gear needs to soak for about 36 hours to have an optimal snow soak time and to use the bait efficiently. This can happen while we're unloading in town. And this should be a concern to you if we're really serious about limiting CO2 as much as possible. The two most dangerous times of fishing with pots is when we set and when we stack the pots on the boat to bring them to town. We never want to expose our crew to danger especially now with insurance becoming more expensive and harder to get. If we can soak this gear and use 200 pots, we would be off the grounds much faster and thus freeing up the grounds for other fishermen. In listening to testimony and debate in the advisory panel, there seems to be an impression that among the advisory panel members that there is an increase in amount of space taken up on the grounds. Well, there isn't. Pots new, use no more space on the grounds. We are just replacing one type of gear with another. There are some pictures being shown of AIS plots on the ground showing how crowded the grounds are. You know, that would look the same if we were all using hooks. All we're doing is, again, replacing hook gear with pot gear. Uh, 200 pots at 40 fathom spacing takes up about eight miles of ground. It's less space than three 30 skate sets of hook and line gear. A lot of this concern with gear conflict is diminishing every year as more and more vessels switch to pots. Even in Southeast, more vessels are using pots and that is only increasing. Pot gear doesn't preempt the grounds any more than hook and line gear. Since we started using pots, we haven't experienced gear conflicts at all. I think this worry is really overblown. We communicate with other fishermen the same way we always have by radio. And now we have the advantage of AIS which we hope will be able to continue to use. But even if AIS is not allowed, there's going to be other technologies. I've had 
people try to sell me some other technologies. They're going to work fine. Uh, the only difference is that they're more expensive. <laughs> so we prefer to use AIS. That's all I have. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to testify. And one more comment is that if we're not allowed, if we're forced to take that gear off the grounds in the Southeast, we're just going to be coming back here and, and uh, asking for that in the future. Uh, as more vessels switch to pots, and they will, um, they're going to see the benefit of leaving that gear on the grounds while they're fishing. It's going to save fuel, save time. It's safer. So thank you again. Thanks, Mr. Clampett. Mr. Down has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Clampett. The, uh, my, my question is, you testified that that uh, you use AIS to, to, to uh, keep track of your gear. You've got an AIS system on the boat as a lot of boats do, and you're able to track your gear that way. But we heard another uh, person testify here just a few minutes ago that they use VHF to track their gear and, uh, um, and, and to communicate where gear is. So um, why, why, why is it, I'm not asking you to, to comment on somebody else's, I'm asking you to comment on your testimony. Why is it that you choose to use AIS rather than, than, than VHS or why would one fleet use one method to track gear and another fleet use another method excuse me if i understood the through the chair if i understood the um gentleman before me's testimony i think he was talking about um he communicates with other vessels on the grounds at in time with the vhs system and our ais system anybody with a a receiver an ais receiver can see every one of my buoys exactly where they are in real time, just by looking at a little screen, that is not an expensive piece of equipment. That equipment costs, I, I think you can get it as cheap as $1,500. The, the buoys are $100 a piece. Um, so if that gentleman had an AIS system, he didn't have to use those buoys. He can talk with his friends on VHS, but he could see all my pots and all my gear wherever they go. So there's no question. And everybody in our fleet is using those AIS beacons. And so I did hear a comment at the AP and they mentioned that, well, we don't use AIS. And my, my comment to them is why not? Why aren't you using it? So that's all I have. Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Clampett, thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm gonna go slightly off the topic here. But um, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about if we were to start incorporating CO2 emissions or carbon footprint into our analyses, what would it look like from your perspective in this analysis? I mean, you've got your operation, Ms. Cleaver pointed out, there is a huge diversity of operations, both in terms of physical configuration, but also in terms of just how they choose to conduct their fishery and all that. How would you measure across all that or just what, what would you do to give me a sense of the actual differences in, in, uh, in carbon footprint? Thank you, uh, through the chair. Um, I've been thinking about that and it's considerable because um, the gear has a optimal soak time. And um, it's, for us, it's about 36 hours, but that gear continues to fish after the optimal soak time. So generally it takes about, if everything is perfect and you're going to town and it's not always perfect, but if everything's perfect, it's gonna take you about a three day turnaround. So that gear is sitting on the grounds, it's fishing for that entire three days. Now, how many days does that save me in running that boat, running that engine, putting my crew to work? I figure about 48 hours. So if I have an average trip of seven days and I'm saving 48 hours every trip, that's a high percentage. That's at least, it's over 30%. I don't see any further questions. Thank you, Mr. Clampett. Thank you. Okay, next up is Bob Alverson.
Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and council members. Uh, my name for the record is Bob Alverson, representing Fishing Vessel Owners Association out of Seattle. We uh, testified before the advisory panel and are, are pretty comfortable with uh, their major decisions. There are three items though that we would like to, to comment on, uh, on their uh, recommendations to you. One, one is a requirement that we uh, mandatorily have flagpoles in West Yakutat and Southeast. And there is no suggestion whether to have those in the Central Gulf or Western Gulf. Um, this is not going to Im impact the FEOA fleet because we use the uh, flagpoles wherever we go and that's what the AIS system is attached to. And should in the future the uh, technology change um, and it's a buoy versus a flagpole, we just don't see this as a needed regulation on us. Um, and it's the enforceability of it. I just, we just don't see the need to mandate this requirement because the fleet has an incentive for each other to know where their gear is. And we're gonna use some system to, to provide for that, whether it's AIS or some elaborate VMS system that they, they're talking about now. Um, the second issue is uh, the, the retrieval of gear. We asked for a seven day uh, um, program and the advisory panel uh, did that in the central Gulf. They went to five days in, the, in West Yakutat. We can make that work. I know enforcement would like to see it the same everywhere and that's what we'd recommend, but we can make the five days work in Southeast. We'd like to see the five days also there. Um, typically it's about a six to eight hour run in in Southeast, depending on where you're delivering. Uh, you're gonna have a day to deliver and get fuel and bait. And then by the time you get out, you've used better part of two days. If you have a weather blow up or a gear malfunction, uh, engine malfunction, you've trapped yourself into a violation of law if it's only three days. So the five day I think uh, is something that we think should be in both at least uh, West Yakutat and Southeast. And then um, the ability to leave the gear on the grounds. I think Paul um, talked about that well. We have, uh, a number of boats that uh, I've talked to on this subject. And uh, uh, I asked them, I says, if, if the council was looking at a larger number and, uh, and on that larger number, you couldn't, you, you had to take the gear in with you, but there was a slightly lesser number and you could leave the gear on the grounds, what would you do? And to the, to the vessel, they said, we'd take the, the slightly smaller number. So I don't know if that helps you reach a compromise on that issue, but in Southeast, but um, the 200 uh, um, pot limit, our guys right now are running the 120 and almost all the FUA boats also will run uh, a string or two of hook gear because like Paul said, we're only doing 60% of a day. So in order to keep the crew busy, we're also running a, a couple gear, uh, sets of, of hooks along with our pots. You go to 200 pots, I would imagine most of those guys are not gonna run that extra set of, of hooks. They'll just be running the pots. And I think that's true in Southeast as well. Um, those are our comments. I uh, wanna thank the council for uh, completing this process. Uh, um, it was a good uh, uh, education to move into pots. It was, uh, there was a lot of fear on it to begin with, but it's uh, with these slinky pots and the traditional pots, I think we've really reduced uh, well depredation, uh, bird interactions, and uh, overall bycatch with other rockfish is almost nil. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Alverson. Are there any questions? Thanks. Okay, next up is uh, John Johansson. Hold on. Okay. All right, we will circle back. Um, Bernie Burkholder. Thank <laughs> you. 
Hello, my name is Bernie Burkholder, and uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the AP, I, I represent a, a fourth generation commercial salmon fishing uh, family. I also am here with for the Northern Endurance and the Aleutian Endurance, and I am one of the founding uh, members of the Sablefish and Halibut Pot Association, and I also sat on the Board of Trustees for FVOA. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work with a small group of fishermen that really saw the benefit and believed in what pots could do for this fishery. And to be honest, it, it really exceeded all of our expectations. It, it eliminated whale depredation. It is probably the most efficient fishery that I've ever participated in. There is a very, very small uh, a bycatch associated with this fishery. Never have I been in a fishery and I've trawled and I've long lined that I've seen this kind of low bycatch. So I think the fishery has really proven itself. And it's also, it's amazing to me that just in these few short years since it started, uh, last year in, in the Western Gulf and Central Gulf, we had 90% of the fish caught with pot gear. In West Yak, we had 66%. And in Southeast, we had 36%. You know, and there, there's more than just myself that sees the benefit, obviously, of converting to pots. Um, I think by far, and it's really, like I said, you know, over in the AP, it's the elephant in the room is the elimination of the whale problem. You know, even if you look at a tack this year, 34,000 ton, 30 some, maybe it's 33, 34,000 ton, 12% is seven and a half million pounds of sable fish that we're saving by just fishing with pots versus hook and line. Nothing wrong with hook and line. I don't wanna, you know, eliminate anybody's ability to go out there and fish with a hook and line, but that is a significant factor. Uh, I would also like to say that we, I agree with Paul Clampett, the extra fuel, the carbon footprint, if you will, of a boat that has to go out and do the, this type of fishery, load that gear on, take it to the, to the dock, unload part of it on the dock, reload it, take it back out and set it, jog around for a day and a half while it soaks, it's just not efficient. It's not what we should be doing. And I'd like to deal with this now if we could and get some type of minimum soak time on for this gear and stay with the 200 pots if we can see our way clear. I think there needs to be clear markings, but, and I'm finishing up here, there needs to be clear markings on the gear. So if somebody is out there, they can know where that gear is at. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Burkholder. Are there any questions? Ms. Campbell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Bernie, I just had one on your last comment when you said there needs to be clear markings. Are you supporting uh, the AP suggestion that we retain the flagpole requirement in Southeast Outside and West Yak, or are you just uh, suggesting that fishermen should take it upon themselves to mark their gear clearly? Can you give me a little more clarity on what you meant by that last point? Can you, uh, thank you. Through the chair, Ms. Campbell, I, what I meant by that is I, I do support flag poles because everybody has then has a visual, you know, contact of that gear. I think there was a little confusion earlier on between, you know, VMS, VHF and AIS, but I think that technology, whether it's AIS is definitely the best. You can see our gear, I can, I can sit on my computer halfway across the world and see where the gear's at. So it's, and all you have to do is do set one A, set one B, both ends are marked and we're working to get that legalized. It's gonna take some time, but even if we don't, there's other technology out there that can be used so that everybody can see where that gear's at.
I don't see any further questions. Thank you, Mr. Burkle. Thank you. Next up is John Muller. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. Um, for the record, my name is John Moeller. And today I'm speaking on behalf of uh, the ADAC Community Development Corporation, ACDC as it's been referred to. Uh, ACDC today requests the council take final action on the AFQ omnibus to include alternative three, which would suspend the ADAC residency requirement for a period of five years. Why five years, you might ask? Um, it needs to be five years because it takes a couple of years to implement the BSAI CV trawl program uh, recently passed by this body. It's gonna take another two years for the plant to fully reopen and the population at ADAC to start rebuilding. <clears throat> As we've testified in the past, uh, ACDC has left over 90% of its fish in the water the last two years. And we hope to change that in 2022. In the document, more specifically on table 4-15, it clearly illustrates the dra drastic drop in ADAC's population, in part a reflection of the vacation of Amendment 113, which resulted in the plant closure. With the ADAC processing plant currently closed, residents continue to leave the island. Also stated in the uh, EARIR, uh, ADAC has continued to experience a decline in population and in turn, eligible community residents. The table also shows the magnitude of ADAC population loss at more than 50% in the last two years. Under the original waiver, the ADAC CQE program was working as intended. As the document states, uh, during the first five years of the program, when the exemption to the residency requirement was in place, priority was given to applicants who owned operated or crewed on local vessels with fixed gear capacity. So in addition, ACDC is further requesting the council ask the National Marine Fisheries Service to split out alternative three. So we're asking you to include alternative three and move it forward to final action. But in addition, split it out of the larger package and put it in its own rulemaking track. An expedited rulemaking will increase the opportunity for ACDC to harvest this quota in the fall of 2022. As noted in the EA, RIR, uh, NIMS does not have management concerns with alternatives for alternative three. This alternative would also be straightforward to implement by changing the date to five years after the final rule is effective. Uh, as we know here, uh, that the waiver um, is basically a rollover of regulation from previous. It's been expired for a number of years, but um, we believe it's a and, and it's noted in the in the document that it's um, relatively straightforward. So, Mr. Chairman, um, ACD has two requests this afternoon. Um, to reiter reiterate, uh, the first request is ask the council to suspend the residency requirement by moving alternative three to final action. And two, the, the council recommend that National Marine Fisheries Service expedite implementation of alternative three by putting on putting it in, on a separate timeline time from the rest of the omnibus package. Uh, most of you know, Mr. Chairman, as a fisherman, um, a lifetime fisherman and a current fisherman, I understand what maintaining a fleet takes, takes a stable processor. And that's our goal for ADAC. It has been for some time. Uh, some of you may know, uh, Mr. Chairman, that I'm, I, I uh, in a previous life, managed a plant in ADAC, or as the case may be, it managed me. Um, in addition to that, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm the former general manager for APICTA. So I have extensive time in the Aleutians. And I believe I understand what it takes to operate plants and create fleets and develop fleets in the Aleutians. And what we're asking today uh, by these two actions, Mr. Chairman, is that we're asking for a little bit of time. The 
Um, the residency waiver um, is a is needed because of the declining population out there and, and, and qualified residents to access ACDC's uh, quota. And with an expedited implementation of the residency waiver, Mr. Chairman, that will give ACDC a reasonable opportunity to remove fish from the water in 2022. I thank you for your time this afternoon and I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Muller. Are there any questions? Ms. Bush. Thank you. Um, through the chair, have you discussed the idea of um, doing away with the residency requirement altogether, knowing that the priority will always be to have residents on there? Um, I think I understood the question, Mr. Chairman. Um, back in the day when I was actually six foot tall and bulletproof, I was not very kind to my ears and the crab boats I ran, but I think you asked if about a permanent, a permanent uh, waiver. Um, I, I think uh, ACDC, well, ACDC would be supportive of that as long as it didn't knock the overall uh, omnibus off the tracks uh, uh, from an implementation standpoint and or, um, you know, if it was just specific to the, to the, to ADAC, I think it could make some sense. And I don't know that, um, you know, I heard the question earlier by Ms. Kimball. Um, if, if, if that could be, um, if that, if that could happen at this meeting and at this body, um, I think we would support it again, only if it didn't, um, you know, delay the overall omnibus package. Um, but I would add, and thank you for the question. I would add that, you know, hey, the only way this stuff makes any sense to, to ADAC is if we actually have the economics is, is circulating through that community and this stuff and this quota is actually harvested and, and eventually, you know, delivered and processed in ADAC. So that's going to always be the ultimate goal. There will always be a, uh, a local resident preference, um, irregardless of where this waiver is or isn't. Any further questions? Mr. Down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, John. So um, on your, your, your first request on, on element three, that uh, um, uh, I should say alternative three, that uh, um, I, I think that there's, you know, in my mind, it, it, it seems there seems to be some utility for the council considering that. But on the on the second piece to split that out, and, and I'll admittedly tell you, I'm new to that concept of splitting that out and having it go forward on a different track. And that's probably my shortcoming. I haven't uh, considered that and, and nor have I stayed in touch with you and, and asked you about that. But so it's a bit new to me, but the, um, my question to you is, have you talked to somebody at National Marine Fisheries Service in the, that, that, that feels that, because you're, you, you started out your, your comments saying that you hope to do better in 2022. And the way to do better in 2022 is to have this implemented by fall of 2022. You, you could do better. I assume that was your, your testimony. So can we, can we really get there? Can we, can we get a regulation through that would, that would get this implemented? I mean, if you talk to somebody in the agency that's told you, yeah, if the council splits that out, we can get that done. And that, that seems like an awful short amount of time to me. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Downs, uh, great question, and, and appreciate you picking up on my comment about um, we're hoping to, you know, harvest in 2022. The only way that's that is possible is if if this there's an expedited rulemaking of that, you know, of alternative three outside of the package, and more specifically to your question, I, I did talk to um, a couple of agency folks um, and. The answer was that it may it 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 may delay the implementation of the overall omnibus um, before March of next year. Um, I am, um, uh, you know, being the fact that this was a it's it's a rollover regulation for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, you know, I I think maybe we ought to we ought to take. Um, a little bit of opportunity to explore whether that's a possibility or not. Otherwise, the alternative is, is ACDC leaves the fish in the water uh, for one more year. Um, and I say that respectfully of, um, of the agency's time here. Um, you may recall 
when uh, there was folks piling on to the emergency action at the last meeting, uh, ACDC and ADAC uh, opted out of that in the interest of saving uh, agency time. Now, all that being said, um, I'm not here to be disrespectful to the agency time and it's gonna take away from some other priority of the council. I, I understand all that. I just, um, I would just say once again, that this is a rollover regulation of which I believe. And again, I'm not, that's not I don't work for the agency. I don't know exactly all that's entailed with it. But if you got usually a rollover regulation, most of the work has been done already. And, and even the document states that it's, uh, it's a it's simple, um, the implementation is simple with a date change. Um, so I just throw that out there as uh, that would be desirable for ADAC if we got an expedited an expedited review or expedited rulemaking and we're able to fish and, and take some of our fish out of the water in 2022. So thank you for your question, Mr. Downs. Thank you, John. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Down. Any further questions for Mr. Moeller? Thank you. Next up, uh, testifying remotely is Wendy Alderson. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. Hi, hi, Chairman Kinnean, Council members. My name is Wendy Alderson. Um, my husband and I own and operate the Ocean Cape here in Sitka, Alaska. We're a small combo boat. We troll shrimp, fish halibut, and pot fish for sable fish. Uh, we feel the current gear retrieval regulation should be retained in Southeast and that a small increase in pots from 120 to 160 in Southeast West Yakutat is reasonable. 200 pots is pushing it, but we could support that increase as long as the gear retrieval requirement stays in place. I hear some of the bigger boats say that it will benefit everyone if they are allowed to leave their pots in the water indefinitely while they are offload and or switch out permit holders. This whole idea of just let us go first, we'll get in and out and be out of your hair and before you know it seems a little bit suspect. It reminds me a bit of that old Beatrix Potter story, Jemima Puddle Duck, you know, the one where the fox invites the duck to dinner. Now that's an arrangement that certainly only benefits the fox. Here in Southeast with our crowded edge, our proliferation of small boats, ducks if you will, and our often short weather windows, it would be nice to know that occasionally we all have a chance to get out of the gate at the same time. Yes, weather will dictate that the big boats will often arrive first, but at least with gear retrieval regulations in place, they won't have been there for several weeks. It's also awfully important to be able to make radio contact with boats fishing the area in which you plan to set. If boats with pots in the water are out of radio range while offloading, it will certainly lead to gear conflicts. Um, a boat tending the gear is a boat that can be reached by radio. Um, we also support retaining flagpole requirements to mark both ends of a set and allowing jig gear as legal gear for sable fish. Uh, thanks for hearing my thoughts. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Ms. Alderson. Are there any questions? Not seeing any. Thank you for your testimony today. Next up is Steve Fish testifying remotely. I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, we can, good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman Kinnean, Council Members. My name is Steve Fish, I live in Sitka with my family. Uh, we own the Cariel 70 foot steel boat. Um, I'm speaking as a vessel owner as well as for our younger crew, all interested in keeping our own operational efficiency high while supporting regulations that are suited for a diverse fleet. Cariel fishes, uh, we fish slinky pots mostly now. We also fish hooks with an auto baiter and have larger pot gear as well, which we fished a couple of years ago. Though based in Sitka, we fished extensively in West Yak and Central Gulf and historically out to Western Gulf and Bering Sea, as well as the home grounds here in Southeast. Um, I understand how, you know, things should be, you know, the regulations should be different for different areas. and for all the, uh, for the changes we're proposing in Southeast, you know, I don't, I don't think it's healthy to restrict operational efficiency to bring productivity down to the lowest common denominator, favoring smaller operations. But I also don't believe that, I, 
Well, I do believe that minimal and looser effort control will conversely favor the larger, more aggressive vessels, which already have a competitive advantage. And that they've earned you know, through investment and innovation, but they don't need to be further advantaged by regulations. Um, in Southeast and to a lesser extent, West Shack, that areas have less fishable slope, which you've all heard about. Um, you know, there's just less area and more vessels. And it's uh, for us, it would probably advantage us to be able to leave our gear on the grounds. But um, I think for the sake, you know, for season long and fleet wide for everybody and for the whole season, it's we're better off uh, keeping the gear retrieval uh, regulations in place. And I think we could uh, raise the number of pots that we're able to use, definitely no more than 200. On 160 to 180 sounds a little more reasonable, but I uh, definitely would not want to both raise the number of pots allowed and allow uh, pots to be left on the grounds. The edge is just too small with too many boats. Um, There are times, uh, you know, there are times when it, there is less crowding on the grounds, but it's mostly during salmon season, the crowded times of the spring and, and fall when, uh, you know, most of the boats are working around salmon season. There's just too much gear on the grounds. Um, I also support legalizing jig gear, allowing larger than nine inch pot tunnels. And when I'd like to see flagpoles remain in regulation. Uh, for visibility, at least in Southeast and West Yak, uh, where currents are less of an issue and uh, visibility is crucial. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fish, for your testimony. Any questions? Not seeing any. Thanks again. Thank you. Okay, next up is Lauren Mitchell. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here today um, in your presence. And I'm speaking to you, to you today as a fleet manager for Sitka Salmon Shares that represents a fleet of longline vessels out of Southeast Alaska, uh, many of which who are geared up and headed out uh, tomorrow because today is pretty bad weather and are unable to really participate easily in this process at this time. Um, element two, I'm gonna just speak to a couple things specific to the elements. Um, there is wide support, uh, widespread support to simplify the gear markings. And we would definitely like to honor the wishes of those in the central Gulf that they would like to get rid of flagpoles. Um, but in Southeast, we would like to see them retained. The importance of being able to see gear on the grounds is extremely important as it's not as normal for the gear to be marked with AIS buoys in uh, Southeast as much as it is out in central Gulf, West Yak and the Western Gulf. So we would like to see the maintenance of the flagpoles so that people can visually see gear on the grounds. Uh, with element four, we think it's important to include the words unfished halibut IFQ in this element as to not increase any potential to, for incidental catch of halibut. The nine inch tunnel opening was originally intended as a halibut excluder, as you know. And in the landings that I've been doing recently that are mostly all pot landings here um, in Sitka, basically everyone has had halibut on board, sometimes up to 4% of their catch is halibut, and they're not intending to catch it, they're fishing IFQ, sable fish, and it is incidental to the catch. So I think that without the intent to harvest halibut or ab the ability to retain the, count, the catch, it's important that we do include the words IFQ halibut in that element. Um, with element five, we would support an increase in the pot limits for Western Yak and Southeast to 160. A lot of vessels were not interested in seeing the pot limit increased, and so 160 was a compromise um, in our opinion at that time. Element six, I know is the most contentious at this time, and we would like to honor the wishes of Central Gulf in seeing the extension from five days to seven days, but we would like to see West Jack and Southeast stay at status quo. I know you've heard a lot of mixed testimony today, and it is of utmost importance to note the differing socio and geographical differences in these areas. As spoken earlier by the previous two testimonies, so I won't be too repetitive, um, it is common to make a radio call when you're leaving to set gear on the grounds. If you're unable to receive a call back to note that there's gear on the grounds, it's really difficult to know where the gear is. Um, anyone who's been out in the water knows the difficulty in recognizing either a buoy or a flagpole on the horizon. It's hard. 
And again, as I said, it's not very common practice to use the AIS markings um, that are actually illegal by the FCC at this time. So if the FCC were to, to legalize this option or another one of the prototypes that's in um, that's happening right now were to become more accessible to more vessels, I think this is worth revisiting. But at this time in Southeast, to avoid gear entanglement and um, gear issues, I think it's really important to maintain the gear retrieval at this time for Southeast. Um, I will go ahead and stop there as I'm gonna run out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Are there any questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Okay, next up is uh, Linda Benkin, then uh, Eric Velsko, and then we'll circle back to John Johansson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council, Linda Benkin testifying for Alaska Longline Fishermen's Association. As you know, our over 200 members depend on sable fish. I, I personally have fished sable fish since 1982. Um, never missed a season, and though I may not look like the old man of the sea, I sure feel like one on some of the days, at least the old part. Our gear, our group does have all gear types now. We have people using coffin pots, slinky pots, pots, and hook and line, and a whole lot of boats still using hook and line. Our members also fish all areas, um, but the majority of our members are based in Southeast Alaska. Uh, I'm gonna run through the elements. I think some are a lot less controversial than others, um, but with element one, we certainly uh, support clarifications that slinky pots are legal. Slinky pots really have made a huge difference in small boats being able to switch over to pots. Um, it does sound like there would it would be good to get some empirical data on how the biodegradable twine is working. Um, Page 88 shows that there have been over 2,000 pots lost in the Gulf since this gear type was legal, legalized. Um, so it might be good to take a look at that, but we definitely support element one and the changes that are suggested there. With element two, with gear marking, certainly the best way to avoid gear conflicts is to ensure that both ends of a set are adequately marked. Um, our members do support eliminating the requirements to mark the pots with hard balls and with radar reflectors and in Central Gulf, Western Gulf to get rid of the flagpole requirement. Our members did think that given how crowded the grounds are, how many boats there are on the grounds, that retaining the flagpole requirement in Southeast and West Yakutat would help minimize gear loss um, and gear conflicts. In answer to the question about why isn't everybody using AIS on, on gear, it's not legal to use AIS on fishing gear right now. Um, there was a fairly significant, I think, $50,000 fine written to a boat off of Washington that had AIS on gear. So there are people who are using it. They're using it knowing it's not legal. Um, it's a little bit stressful, but it certainly does help with finding gear. And we all have been working hard to try and push the FCC to make it legal. On element three, we're very supportive of legalizing jig gear in this fishery. Um, that does help with some of the small boats as an entry level. I think it will really help with some boats that are right now using jig gear and other fisheries to be able to diversify as um, it says in page 95, they, we don't expect a lot of boats to use this option, but it seems like a really um, positive step as far as entry level to the fishery. On element four, we went round and round on the pot tunnel openings. Everybody thinks it's fine to make it bigger. I think where we landed was that you should have unfished halibut IFQ if you're gonna get rid of that what has been called a halibut excluder, and you are gonna to start to get more halibut into your pot, but recognize that the bycatch is likely to be fairly small. Our membership is fine with either element four as written or element four with the option. Both were fine with our, with our group. Really for our membership, as you've heard, elements five and six are the, are the big issues. And I, I included a fair bit of information in my written testimony to help you understand the difference in, in extent of fishing grounds in Southeast, um, in particular also West Yakutat, as well as the fact that there are 15% more boats, there's 40% less sable fish fishing grounds. The slope is that much smaller in Southeast and only 29% left 
less tack than Central Gulf, which has the second highest number of boats. So for that reason, the grounds do get more crowded. You have more boats and less area. Um, and though people are trying to communicate by VHF, um, that's what you've got to use. If someone is out of VHF range, if they are in town delivering, they're not gonna be able to hear your call. They're out of range and you're not gonna be able to find out where their gear is before you set, which is how people figure out where it's okay to set and where it's not. So for that reason, our membership supports the gear retrieval staying in place in Southeast. Um, that's what passed at the AP 17 to zero. We certainly support keeping that in there. We do support a modest increase up to 160 pots um, for the pot limit for Southeast and West Yakutat. We were fine with the switch to seven day on the gear tending requirement, which is very different from the gear retrieval requirement, but in, in the central Gulf um, and retaining the five day gear tending requirement in West Yakutat. Um, uh, on the issue of carbon footprint, I guess just to say briefly, while I understand how important it is to be thinking about climate change and carbon footprint, the uh, importance of avoiding gear conflicts and gear loss to me are really significant on this issue. And certainly gear replacement uses a whole lot more carbon in terms of manufacturing that gear and shipping it up. Um, then does a boat running in, in and out a time or two off of Southeast Alaska. I would also note that two, we are working, one of the boats is mine, but this year we are converting two boats to hybrid um, from our fleet out of Sitka that will be electric and diesel um, to minimize their carbon footprint with the goal of trying to expand that to more of the fleet. So thank you all in there and happy to answer questions. Thank you, Ms. Benkin. Are there any questions? Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm gonna go even a little bit more off topic here just because I'm starting to think through a thread that I think we might as a council wanna um, apply more generally. Um, and, and that is the carbon footprint issue. And what, what would be your suggestion of how we should, um, and I, I heard your points about calculation and I think they're valid, um, but just stepping back one step, how do you think we as a council should be balancing issues like carbon footprint against, well, Steve Fish, I think in his testimony described pretty well some of the things we should be balancing as well. But I'm wondering what you think we should be balancing as we're looking at carbon footprint, but also looking at protecting small vessel owners and their importance to community. Um, some of the other dynamics, can you just, Give me a minute or two of your thoughts about how we should be prioritizing and balancing these different competing things that are all sort of embodied in this one issue. Um, sure, I through the chair, I'd be ha happy to try. I mean, I think I would point out you don't have information in this document on carbon footprint. So you would certainly be taking a guess that you are lowering the carbon footprint by doing one action over another. Um, without any data in front of you. Uh, you know, certainly your responsibility as council members is to work from the national standards and to provide, do that kind of balancing as specified by those 10 national standards. Um, and I certainly hope that in a future revision to the Magnuson-Stevens Act that we start to think more about climate change and factor that into decision-making. And I'm you know, part of a group that's working to put that forward. And that then you do have that information brought in front of you and how you balance. Um, but I think um, that said, there is a lot you can do now as you do balance what the impacts of your actions are on the resource. Um, and it, one of those balancing is to think about gear loss and what that might mean in terms of the impact to habitat, the impact to the resource, um, and that you, you know, have to balance that against what you do know of having a boat running in and out. I mean, I would also say that um, there's a lot you don't know about whether a big boat that's running generators is burning and has a bigger carbon footprint than the small boats that are running shorter distances, near, fishing near town. That might be where the crowding is, but um, that's all a complicated um, 
equation. And um, I, I guess that's just my point is you don't have that information in front of you. So it would be a bit of a, a guess to say, this is a positive carbon uh, decision or not. Thanks, Ms. Bankman. Um, a couple of times now you've referred to um, um, gear loss and, and I think as a function of, of soak time essentially, or um, at least time between tending. Um, and I'm wondering if you can, at least I was guessing that, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I'm wondering if you can kind of point to me where you're sort of basing the, um, the concept that that uh, gear loss increases measurably um, when you're just changing some of these factors by just a couple of days. So through the chair, thank you so much for uh, that question. I think that really highlights the fact that in this analysis, there's a bit of a confusion at times between gear tending and gear retrieval. So gear tending just means you run the gear. You can pick it up and put it right back down in the exact same place. That's gear tending. And the gear tending requirements are five days or seven days for West Yakutat, Central Gulf, Western Gulf. That just means you get out to your gear and you run it. And you can pick it up and put it back down in the same place. So gear retrieval means you take the gear off the grounds when you go in to unload. So if you are running your gear, no, I don't think there's any chance of more gear loss. But if you are leaving the gear on the grounds as opposed to taking the gear off the grounds when you go in to unload, while you are unloading, you are out of radio range. And if other boats are out on the grounds, the common practice, especially off Southeast, because there's so much crowding, people will call on the VHF and say, does anybody have gear off Bjorka? Will you come back and tell me where your gear is? If you can hear the radio, if you are out on the grounds, you will respond and you will tell people where both ends of your set are. If you are in town unloading, you can't hear a VHF call. So you can't tell someone your gear is. So the, the likelihood of having gear conflicts of having that boat set down gear that's out there that they didn't see before they set are much higher. And again, while the pot gear may not, or as others said, the pot gear may be taking up eight miles at a, at a couple hundred pots, which is not that much more than a typical small boat long line set, which might be, you know, with the three sets in the water taking up six miles. If hook and line gear conflicts with pot gear, the pots are generally using a heavier ground line, closer to a half inch than the hook and line gear. And it's the hook and line gear that's gonna lose. And that's what you're, you won't be able with the hook and line with the hydraulics we have on small boats to get that pot gear to the surface. And you know, I've tangled with pots, I've broken off. So far I've been lucky to be able to retrieve from the other end, but we don't have the strength in our ground line or the hydraulics that can haul up a string of pots when we tangle with it. And anyway, I'll stop there. Sorry, it was a long answer. <laughs> Any further questions for Ms. Bacon? Thank you. Thank you. Eric Belsko. Good afternoon, Chairman Kaneen and members of the council. Uh, my name is Eric Velsko, and I'm representing uh, North Pacific Fishing Fisheries Association, um, based out of Homer. It's a multi-gear group, uh, about 60 fishing families, fish from southeast to the Bering Sea, founded in 1955. Um, halibut and sablefish have been an in integral part of um, this group since the early, early days. Um, We've had members involved in this action directly, um, both on the IFQ committee and at the AP. Um, I'm just going to kind of run through the elements here. Um, MPFA supports element one that clarifies the slinky pots or legal gear type. We've got some members that have switched to this um, this type of pot. Um, MPFA supports element two, uh, which leaves the um, the buoy setup configuration up to the vessel operator and we, after the AP discussion, we, we don't support the flagpole um, 
amendment, I guess, in West Yak and Southeast. We just don't think it, we need to overburden uh, regulations telling guys what they need to put on their ends. Guys are going to put on the, they're going to mark their ends according to getting their gear back. No one wants to lose gear. We don't need to uh, bog that down in regulation because it's basically unenforceable as well. Um, element three is we support the jig gear as a legal gear type for harvest disabled fish. We don't have any members that do that. We do have some guys that, that do their halibut with jig gear. We figured that was uh, fairly non-confrontational. Um, we support element four, which was the option to remove the nine inch tunnel opening. We were hoping that we could, we could have a directed halibut pot fishery because of the, the whale depredation problems that we've seen in the Bering Sea. And it's just, it's only a matter of time before, um, well, it's not a matter of time. It's happening right now in the Gulf. Um, but we're, we're, we're okay with, with the AP motion, um, what they move through. But I think we're going to need to be thinking about this uh, moving forward. Um, so the, the quicker we can uh, align that with the Bering Sea, the better. Um, MPFA supports element five, option one. That was the 300 pots. We heard the AP discussion. We're okay with 200 pots in, in West Yak in Southeast, but I think the gear retrieval part of that is, is pretty important too. If you're gonna increase the pot limit, but then still not allow gear retrieval, you're, that's just exacerbating a, a safety problem. And um, I understand the concern in some of the, the high traffic areas outside of Sitka, basically from Omni up to Cross Sound. That is a, there's a lot of boats that fish that area, but I, I have a boat down in Southeast right now. They haven't seen anyone, I, I think in nine days or 10 days, uh, they're fishing out of Yakutat. He saw some lights on the horizon, he said yesterday, but that was it. So I, I don't know, you know, there's some shoulder areas here where there's not as much effort. So we just feel that we shouldn't be handcuffed um, for no reason, you know, I, 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 as far as the, the heavy crowding in those high traffic areas, I mean, I don't, I don't, personally, I try to get away from the crowd um, when we're fishing. So I don't know, that could be a personal decision on where you fish too, but uh, you know, it's a lot of these, a lot of this fleet moves through early too. So we fish kind of the shoulder season, seasons, which a lot of these other guys that want the increased limit and the gear retrieval requirement um, to go away is because we fish early spring and we fish late fall. Um, you know, early spring being right when it opens, late fall being to the up. I mean, we fished till the day it closed last year in Central Gulf. So we need to think about the other portion of this fleet too. Um, and just streamlining the regulations. Our group just thought, let's just keep keep all the regulations the same, makes it easy to enforce. It's, it's not overburdensome. Um, people confused on which areas have which limits and, and when to bring your gear. A lot of us fish multiple areas for four areas, the whole Gulf, you know, you'll fish and work your way to the, uh, to the, uh, the West, you know, usually start East and work your way West. So, um, we hope to see something with the gear retrieval there. If, if there's a compromise to be had, um, other than that, we don't, we don't have a strong position on uh, alternative three. There was com some concern in our group about where this, CQE is heading, especially if ADAC doesn't have a plant. That's a, just a tough situation that they're in. So we're not going to um, weigh in on that too heavily. But other than that, I think that wraps it up. Um, and I'll take any questions if you have any. Thank you, Mr. Belsko. Any questions? Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Belsko. I just on your last points on element five and six, and I heard your statement about having consistency across areas. But so when I read the letter submitted, I, I was thinking your group supported um, a consistent uh, retrieval requirement of seven days for all Gulf areas. And are, did you just testify that maybe something different from that would be acceptable? I, I might've misheard. No, I think we, that's what we originally thought. I mean, it would be nice if we could just do 300 pots and, and a seven day gear retrieval and, and everyone's on the same page. But um, as far as a, a compromised retrieval, I think any portion of time uh, 
for the gear retrieval is going to be beneficial. It's you've got guys kind of putting themselves in situations. They shouldn't be trying to, trying to stack gear on when they know weather's coming and then say the weather comes up five or six hours earlier and they, and they have to put, they, they have to put their gear on. They're going to do it. You know, they're not going to as much, you know, they could, they could call nymphs and go through the, um, and say they couldn't get it on, but most guys aren't going to do that. They're going to try to get the gear on no matter what, whether it's blowing 40, or uh, or not and it just it's putting guys in situations we don't need to do this in a rationalized fishery this is an ifq fishery it's quota based we all know how much we have to catch guys are going to fish the amount of gear according to to the um amount of quota they have and and the same thing with the gear retrieval it's no one's going to leave gear out for months and months at a time for for no reason you know you're gonna you, you want to tend to that gear it's expensive you're not going to leave it out on the grounds um when you don't need to so um, if there's, uh, you know, our, our, we haven't discussed with the group, if there, if there's a compromise to be had on the, on the gear retrieval, but, um, I guess at this point, anything's better than, than having to bring it in every time. Further questions, Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on the gear retrieval issue. It, Taking your point that you made in testimony that um, crowding isn't do, doesn't follow the area boundaries neatly, and it's not like there's a crowded area, one regulatory area, and an uncrowded in the next. Um, is there some way that absent regulation, the associations can facilitate the kind of communication that's necessary to alleviate? Um, actual gear conflict in the crowded areas um, outside of outside of regulation or is, are there some other solutions or do we need I mean if you can't offer that then there's a fairly powerful argument for providing some level of regulation to protect the to address the crowded areas uh, through the chair yeah that's a that's a good question I I think for the most part, there's a, there's a, a, I wouldn't say a large portion of the fleet, but a portion of the fleet that harvests a, a good majority of the quota that's caught for in the whole Gulf. And, and most of those guys are on the same page. And that's, you know, the fishing vessel owners boats, um, guys like Bernie and Paul, there's a handful of guys out of Seward, Kodiak. It, I guess we kind of track everyone's movements and I don't, you know, I, I guess as far as the real crowded areas outside of Sitka and stuff. I don't know because I, I don't, I don't, we don't fish there because of the crowding. Um, and so that, I guess that is a good point, but, um, we, there is no, uh, real group communication between the groups on who's out on the grounds and who's not. It's all, all up to, you know, radio, radio communication or looking on the AIS applications, you know, to see who's, who's out on the edge fishing. Um, so, if that helps. It addresses status quo, but it doesn't address whether the groups could do more. Yeah, they, I guess we could, you know, we could do a, a group outreach um, type of thing between all the, all the long line groups that um, come up and fish. It's just, it's, yeah, it would be, to coordinate that so half these groups are volunteer groups too so it's it's hard enough just to come up here and uh, testify sometimes so that might be a little more difficult for some of the smaller organizations but um something you know we could definitely try any um further questions thank you mr velsco thanks Okay, last, uh, we'll circle back to uh, John Johansson. No? Okay. All right, well then that uh, concludes public comment. Um, I wanna take a short stand down before we take action. I would like to offer the opportunity to ask any questions of staff before we go on break. Ms. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a question and I think it's for Ms. Miller, but it has to do with something we heard in public comment. Uh, specifically the desire from the ADAC group to potentially have this written up as two 
packages so that it might lead to an expedited rulemaking whereby ADAC might be able to lease some of their quota this fall. Can you speak to the feasibility of achieving that and, and to, um, I guess, what that does to the timing on the overall omnibus package? Thank you for the question, Ms. Campbell, um, and through the chair. Um, so in thinking about regulatory actions, uh, we have to balance staff workload. There's always a trade-off when we prioritize one action over the other. Um, as we talked about in the B2 reports, we have a number of ongoing actions as well as um, additional regulatory work um, that's happening kind of behind the scenes. And so, in considering this, we have to think about what our normal rulemaking process looks like. Um, and that's typically a year from council final action to implementation. That's our standard rulemaking process. In recent years with the request for expedited actions using the halibut vessel use caps as uh, an example, um, the council requested that in uh, last year's uh, rulemaking timeline as an example, requested that in February, um, and that was kind of a drop everything <laughs> and put that first approach. Um, and so that final rule became effective, I believe sometime at the end of June uh, without having papers in front of me, sorry about that. Um, and so uh, this action in particular, because it has thus far been analyzed with the, the whole omnibus package, uh, we would have to split out the analysis and then create two separate rulemaking packages. Each one comes with its own analytical, all of the rulemaking process, all of the layers of review. Um, and in particular for the ADAC residency requirement, revisions to that would include an FMP amendment. Um, and that is something that we just realized recently um, in looking at this. Um, and so that's new information. Haven't put that forward before. The whole omnibus package would likely be an FMP amendment as well. Um, but in thinking about the timeline for a simple rulemaking, um, it can be faster than an FMP amendment that has a Magnuson Act required 60 day comment period. Um, and that's where we save some time in the process is um, with shortening that comment period for expedited actions like we have done for the halibut vessel use cap uh, in, in the past year. I hope that, that, that answers some of your questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Miller, for that, that clarity. And I think knowing that, that it is an FMP amendment with a 60-day required comment period, it's very helpful uh, information in trying to evaluate uh, you know, how this might play out. So I appreciate that. Any further questions before we stand down? Ms. Kimball. Apologies, um, Mr. Chair, but a follow-up to that question is that the current alternative three, as it's, as it's written in our analysis, that is also an FMP amendment? Through the chair, that's correct. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and stand down for about five minutes and we'll come back and see what action the council would like to take. Council, please come back to order. All right, we are ready for action on agenda item C1. Ms. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Over the break, I provided a motion to council staff, um, but the motion would be that the council adopts alternative two, revise the IFQ program regulations to address the following regulatory clarifications. Element one, Clarify that slinky pots are illegal gear for the IFQ fishery and CDQ fisheries and revise regulations to allow the use of biodegradable twine in the door latch or pot tunnel. Element two, remove buoy configuration, radar reflector, and flagpole requirements and regulation, but retain LP marking requirement. Element three, authorize jig gear as a legal gear type for the harvest of sablefish IFQ and CDQ. 
Element four, revise the pot gear configuration requirements to remove the nine inch maximum width of tunnel opening so that it does not apply when a vessel begins a trip with unfished halibut IFQ on board. Element five, pot limits. Option one, change the pot limit for West Jakutat to 200 pots per vessel. Element six, gear retrieval requirements. Option two, modify the gear retrieval requirement to seven days for the central Gulf area. Suboption, five days in Southeast outside. Alternative three, remove ADAC CQE residency requirement for a period of five years. Mr. Chair, that's my motion. Second. Seconded by Mr. Down. And uh, just note for the, the public and those online that the uh, this motion is also posted on our e-agenda. Ms. Campbell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Speaking to uh, the decisions in this motion, under element one, our intention or my intention and the council's, if this motion passes, is to support flexibility and gear innovation and not to write such a restrictive regulation that it has to be a revised again in a year or two. We have a lot of, of rapid gear innovation in this fishery. So given the discussion with staff during our reports, I just wanna be clear that the council's intent is to write this regulation in a flexible way that will allow for continued innovation. Um, under element two, I think we started this fishery with some overly specific regulations about radar reflectors, hard balls, buoy bags, flag poles, and uh, the, in making the, this choice, we're really letting fishermen decide how to best mark their gear so that they can find it and retrieve it. Uh, fishermen will mark their gear in a way that makes it the most visible. They don't wanna lose an expensive string of gear. And our analysis also points out that the current configuration takes up an inordinate amount of deck space on a small boat. Um, element three would make jig gear a legal gear for the sablefish target. Um, we think we anticipate that this might be lightly used, but it has been supported in public comment by some folks that think that they could take advantage of it and uh, certainly don't see a downside in allowing folks to do that. Uh, for element four, uh, removing the nine inch tunnel requirement would allow those who hold halibut IFQ to use a larger tunnel size potentially um, enhancing efficiency and reducing, reducing discards that might occur if people were required to target halibut and sablefish separately. Uh, you'll notice that I did not select the option at this time, uh, which would have allowed this whether or not people had unfished IFQs on board, because I don't want to encourage those who don't have halibut IFQ and can't legally land halibut to use a gear type that could increase the incidental take of halibut. Um, in element five, I did choose uh, the option that would increase the pot limit in West Jack as advised by the AP, but I did not make that selection for the Southeast outside area. Uh, feedback on this issue has been really mixed, but what's been clear is that West Jack has more slope than Southeast outside, more fishable area, but not as much as the more Western areas. And so it seems fair to take the AP's recommendation and set the pot limit at 200. The reason I didn't uh, take up the AP suggestion to increase the pot limit in Southeast is because of my choice under element six to instead address the gear retrieval requirements. Again, feedback has been pretty mixed, but I, uh, as one council member, am convinced that the additional efficiency and safety provided by allowing the boats fishing in Southeast outside with some limited ability to leave gear on the grounds provide the ability to have a town soak. I think that'll be very beneficial to efficiency and safety. Um, and, you know, we've just had mixed feedback from Southeast shareholders, but a fair amount of it, including at the IFQ committee was that they would support a pot increase or a removal of the gear retrieval requirement, but not both. Um, and many who, who I asked about which they would lean towards uh, suggested modifying the gear retrieval requirement instead, given that giving somebody more pots in a situation where they have to stack out every time um, impairs their ability to take advantage of a higher pot limit and could potentially increase the safety issues. Um, in choosing five days as an appropriate requirement for Southeast outside, I am modifying the sub option, but I'm not choosing something that's outside the scope of our analysis. We had analyzed anything between three and seven days to a total removal for Southeast outside. 
Um, and after considering this, three days just seemed too short to allow for the activities that have to take place in town, weather, runtime, it seemed like choosing something that short, we would be setting people up for um, consistently needing to be calling into enforcement and trying to explain their situation. I also think there's a, a benefit to having only two time periods in play, uh, the seven days that applies to West Jack, uh, excuse me, to Central Gulf and Western Gulf and the five days that would apply to West Jack and Southeast outside rather than having more of a patchwork than we need to. Um, in choosing to modify the Central Gulf to, to seven days, I am again following the AP's recommendation, providing some additional flexibility for Central Gulf fishermen who often are dealing with weather conditions and fairly distant fishing grounds and providing alignment of that area with the Western Gulf. Um, it's clear that pots are becoming widely adopted and the preferred gear type of many fishermen. They eliminate the whale predation issues that has plagued this fishery for many years. They reduce bycatch and they're increasing the efficiency and conservation of the fishery. The council took a pretty cautious approach when first allowing pot gear and our program review made it clear that this fishery has been successful and that one additional cautious step towards more flexibility and efficiency could make it even more so. Um, and so that's the rationale behind my choices under alternative two. Under alternative three, uh, that is relevant to the community of ADAC. I think this council has spent a lot of time uh, working on things with the hope of benefiting the community of ADAC. And this is just a simple amendment that would allow them to have some quota that they purchased under the CEQE program be harvested by non-residents as they attempt to continue to rebuild their small boat fleet and return to their priority of resident harvest. I think we can trust this community that if they are able to develop a resident fleet before the five-year time is up, that they will prioritize resident harvest because that's the greatest economic benefit to the community. So, uh, Mr. Chair, with that, I'll pause and see if there are questions. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Are there questions on the motion? Mr. Down. Thank you for your motion. Uh, um, and I, I just had a, a wanted to give you an opportunity to, to address alternative three. Um, uh, in a little more detail, you, you didn't include here the request that this be split out, and I just thought it might be, be good to to speak to the rationale as to as to uh, as to why that that was not included. We heard that request of public testimony, so I thought I'd give you that opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Down. Uh, through the chair, that is you know my query to Ms. Miller, and I think learning that. Uh, this is going to require an FMP amendment. I think that that significantly reduces the likelihood that they can get this done in a time that is going to make a difference for the community and getting their quota leased for the 2022 season. And if that's not plausible, then I think that there is a benefit to keeping the two packages linked um, so that the agency can write one regulation package, go through the rulemaking process one time and try to get all of these in place for the 2023 season. Further questions on the motion? Okay, any amendments on the motion? We can go to comments on the motion. Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Campbell, for I, I think a really um, well-crafted motion um, and I support it. Um, I um, really appreciated your initial remarks um, regarding the amount of um, regulatory flexibility that you hope the agency will be able to continue to employ as they draft this and, and strongly echo the um, the concept that, that I heard you um, encouraging, which is to have sort of minimal, maximal room for the industry to continue to uh, innovate in these areas uh, as they write the regulations. Um, we should not be, uh, as a council, um, 
approaching things in a way that really makes it difficult for industry to respond to new technologies as well as rapidly changing circumstances. And I think your remarks were really appropriate and wanted to re-emphasize those. Uh, and I also just, as I've been sort of thinking about this whole process as, as this IFQ omnibus has worked its way through the council process, it has struck me that a large percentage of the really meaningful work on crafting this has happened at the committee level. And I think that's really uh, a good thing. And I want to encourage the council to continue to think about ways of making use of our committees to do a lot of the heavy lifting where they can really dig into a lot of the details of a package like this. Uh, using the expertise of the committee members uh, using the ability in committee to have a lot more back and forth with um, industry members who are in attendance and others who are in attendance. Um, our, our structure as a council, when it finally comes to us, isn't really well adapted for a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the crafting that a package like this that really requires some pretty intimate knowledge of the different areas, how the fishery works, for the different configurations and different business models. All that happens best at the committee level. And I really um, think we should extend our appreciation to the committee members as well as to the chair, Ms. Campbell, for the, the way they've done this. And I, I, I would, as we think about changes to our process, I think we should be thinking about this kind of a model and how to make more use of it more broadly. Um, but I think this has been a great example of that. And, uh, I think the package that came out of it and the fine tuning in it uh, is really reflective of the value of, of the, the committee this brought to it, as well as the value that industry brought to the committee process. Right. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Further comments on the motion? Mr. Down. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, thank you, Ms. Ms. Campbell. And my uh, um, my my comments. You know, I as I think about this this motion, and I have watched this go forward. I completely agree with Mr. Twight. I think uh, Corey, you've set a very high bar for the IFQ committee chair, and done a great job there. And um, the when I think about this, I think about the, the the trying to recognize the distinct differences that there are in the southeast outside area, um, being smaller boats and having people that are considering the the jig element and people that are doing um, troll salmon and sable fish, you know, and uh, um, the local residency of that that fleet. That there there is uh, something there. I think that it's that that does. Um, in my mind, you know, compel me to, to want to do things that help to preserve the nature of that fishery that it is, is different. Um, at the same time, we've got to not build in these huge inefficiencies in the way that these fisheries are prosecuted and guys have more gear and they've got to store their gear, they're fishing multiple areas and those kinds of things. And um, and they're burning more fuel and they're hauling and their crews got to sit around all these other things, these inefficiencies. So I think what, uh, what Ms. Campbell's done here is, is, is she's, we, we've got a, a really great balance that's been struck here, I think, in this motion in that, yeah, maybe everybody didn't get what they wanted, but between the two groups, and I, I've sat personally with each of the, 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 with many of the representatives from both sides of the group and, and heard their, um, their concerns and I think what we've got here is a, you know it strikes a very fair even balance between those two things that were primary in my mind on this and uh, particularly with element five and the upper uh, limit for pot for West Yakutat and preserving the, the lower limit in southeast outside but then giving some flexibility on gear retrieval. That, that, that's, a, that, that's just kind of representative of what this whole uh, motion represents to me. So I think it's a, a very good motion. It's very well, well balanced. And uh, I thank Ms. Campbell for this. And, and uh, as you can tell by my comments, I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Dale. Further comments? 
Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Campbell, for your motion. I'll be supporting it as well and appreciate the balance you struck with the diversity of uh, stakeholders in this process. Um, I also, you know, just want to put on the record the support for alternative three. I think you could tell from my questions that I was interested in maybe removing that residency requirement. And I think it's appropriate to speak to um, the situation in ADAC being unique um, compared to other communities in the CQE program. I'm, I feel very personally invested in the CQE program being successful. They put their own funding into purchasing quota. They're unable to fish it right now with residents. And the difference in that program really has been that was a program established in 4B, particular to that community, to attract new residents to the community, as opposed to in the Gulf CQE program with those communities trying to maintain opportunities for current residents in the community. I think there's a real difference there. I was unaware that it would require an FMP amendment to make changes to that in that respect. And so I'm not prepared to offer FMP language that would look at changing the purpose or need of the CQE program for area 4B. Um, but I am appreciative that there's a five-year window now in this motion that provides some opportunity. And that's also a five-year window if we need to remedy that with a further trailing amendment to look at whether this kind of a requirement is necessary to fulfill the purpose of this program in 4B in particular, then I'm willing to do that in the future. So apologies in some respects for not being perfectly ready for that, um, but think this five-year window is meeting the needs of the ADAC community and ACDC as they've brought forward. So thank you. Thanks, Ms. Kimball. Ms. Bush. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Ms. Campbell, for your motion. I will also be supporting it. Um, I do understand that, in particular, um, the pot limits and the requirement um, to take all your gear off the ground in Southeast were particularly um, controversial, I guess, or created a lot of public testimony. I think you've struck the right balance here, um, allowing for some gear to stay on the grounds in Southeast, um, you know, takes away that question that skippers might have for safety. You know, if the storms come in, they're full of, um, their holds are full of fish, um, they won't need to uh, put that additional weight on their boat when they go to town. So I, I think that's a good compromise there. Um, since we are at, at final action, um, I think the analysis does a good job of speaking to the national standards, but wanted to highlight in particular national standard five. Um, this action today um, will provide for greater flexibility for the IFQ and CDQ participants, allow the fleets to configure and set their gear in a way that they see um, is most efficient for their operations. Um, likewise, for alternative three, it'll provide more opportunity for the ADAC CQE to more fully harvest its allocation in the future. So um, I think this action here is particularly responsive to national standard five, um, also national standard two as more uh, of the fleet converts to pots. Um, the unknown of whale depredation is lessened in our stock assessments because we are accounting for all the fish that are harvested in a direct way. Um, and that's all I have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bush. Mr. Marks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. And thanks, Ms. Campbell for the motion. I, I, uh, Appreciate all the comments by other council members. You know, I just want to express my support for the range of elements under alternative two and also alternative three. Um, I, I think it's very responsive to a, a lot of uh, interest by, by participants as well as uh, responsive to concerns expressed by folks in Southeast. And uh, so all in all, I think it moves this fishery forward and provides more flexibility. And, and I, I think it's a good, good step in the right direction. So thanks for your work on this and, and I definitely support it. Thanks. Any further comments? Ms. Campbell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to, since we are at final action, um, have some closing comments about national standards. So um, I think there's a really good discussion in our analysis. I think that this action that I'm proposing is consistent with national standards, particularly national standard one, uh, optimum yield. So sablefish IFQs underutilized overall. 
and in selecting alternative two, I think these actions would make the fishery more efficient and achieve our likelihood, uh, increase our likelihood of achieving a Y or getting closer to it to a smaller extent. I hope alternative three will do the same in assuring that the quota owned by ADAC can be harvested. Uh, National Standard 5 requires us to consider efficiency. I think we are achieving that here with some changes that will give uh, the fleet the ability to configure and deploy and retrieve their gear in a more efficient way. National Standard 7 speaks to minimize, minimizing costs. Um, and I think there are some good steps here, um, including removing that gear retrieval requirement and just allowing increased flexibility that will go a long way towards minimizing unnecessary costs. Uh, National Standard 8, certainly the sustained participation of fisheries communities is addressed by Alternative 3 uh, by taking a small step um, to assist the community of ADAC. Um, I really wanted to mention National Standard 9, minimize bycatch, because there is some very good information in our analysis about the bycatch uh, in pots versus hook and line, and to the extent that we can make this fishery more efficient and more desirable, I think we can uh, take some small steps towards minimizing bycatch, and certainly National Standard 10, improving the safety of life at sea by eliminating stack out requirements and the need for vessels to run back and forth to the grounds fully loaded in Southeast Outside was certainly on my mind. Um, I also wanted to thank the members of the IFQ committee who did a lot of the heavy lifting in informing uh, this analysis. They were wonderful and respectful and came to the table with really good feedback and appreciate our staff for putting that all together into this package. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Any final comments or amendments? Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I do think after, um, before we make the final vote, we have to, as a council, uh, determine which um, approach we wanna use for review of the regulations. And I'll make a motion to that effect. Uh, the council deems proposed regulations that clearly and directly flow from the provisions of this motion to be necessary and appropriate in accordance with section 303C. The council authorizes the executive director and the chair to review the draft proposed regulations when provided by NIMS to ensure that the proposed regulations to be submitted to the secretary under section 303C are consistent with these instructions. With a second, I can speak to my amendment. Seconded by Ms. Vanderhoven. Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, since this is final action and since um, much of this does result in FMP amendments, it's not just Halibut Act. Uh, the council needs to describe for the record uh, how we'd like to review any proposed regulations that are developed um, to implement this action. We have two options. One is the council can request that the draft regulations come back to the full council for review, or the other is that we can delegate that responsibility to yourself and the executive director uh, acting on our behalf. Um, we generally choose the latter option, particularly when we're quite sure we understand the nature of the regulations that are likely to be developed to implement this. And um, I'm suggesting that we continue to use that tool for this action. All right, thank you, Mr. Twight. Any questions, uh, amendments to the amendment or comments? Is there any opposition to the amendment? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Twight. All right, unless there's any final comments, we can go to the roll call, Mr. Witherall. Thanks. Calling the roll for final action to choose alternative two and alternative three with specific elements and options as identified in the motion. Ms. Bush. Yes. Ms. Campbell. Yes. Mr. Down. Yes. Mr. Jensen. Yes. Ms. Kimball. Yes. Mr. Curlin. Yes. Mr. Marks. Yes. Mr. Mesereau. Yes. Mr. Twight? Yes. Ms. Vanderhoven? Yes. Mr. Kaneen? Yes. Motion passes 11-0. Thank you, Mr. Witherell.
Anything further on C1? All right, great. Thanks, Ms. Campbell. Um, thanks to the committee. Thanks to staff on this. And of course, all the, the public comment we received. Um, great job. Let's go ahead and adjourn for the day. Uh, we will uh, come back at eight o'clock tomorrow. And just a, a note for council members, uh, we haven't done an updated photo for quite a while. So we're looking at doing that tomorrow morning uh, during the, the break at uh, top of the world. So we'll have a little bit of a longer break to, to accomplish that. So we'll see you in the morning, eight o'clock.